Thank you so much. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Jeff, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I want to thank everybody on the uh, production team for this great event. Uh, all the volunteers uh, couldn't have done it without you guys. Uh, made it go so smooth this morning with setup. And um, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out. It's uh, great to see you all. So thank you for being here. And as Jeff said, this one has been in the making for many years. I've been talking about and planning this presentation to try to expose the origins of these very twisted religious cults. And that's really what they are. Uh, and I'm going to finally, once and for all, expose them as being masks on the same face of dark occultism and Satanism here today. And I think that you'll come away with a very profound understanding of that uh, by the end of the day today. So let's jump in. My presentation, of course, is entitled, Two Masks, Same Face, The Dark Occult Origins of Nazism and Communism. Before we begin, I always have some caveats and, and warnings to just go over. Uh, you know, that's probably not really necessary for the live audience, but for people that are going to watch this later on the internet, I always like to do this. There is nothing new that is really going to be presented here. This information is already with us. It, it is just not widely recognized. So. A lot of people will complain and say, well, he's not talking about anything brand new here today, and I fully admit that. You'll not, you're, you're not really going to be seeing or hearing anything new here today. As the old saying, that ancient saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. And that means that the truth is objective and eternal. It's, it has always been with us. It has always been here. It always will be. All I can do is present my findings in a personalized framework with my own style and my own aesthetics applied to the presentation. Uh, this presentation is not a political presentation. It is apolitical. I am not a member of the Republican Party, the Democrat Party, the Libertarian Party, or any other political party. I do not ideologically align with any political party. I don't ideologically align with politics, period. I'm not an advocate of left-wing or right-wing politics. I am an advocate of moral spirituality. I completely and totally reject the belief in the idea of human authority, period, and all forms of government. Because such ideologies are based entirely in coercion and violence. I advocate for the abolition of these forms of human slavery. They are covert forms of human slavery, but rapidly moving to overt forms of slavery. Uh, I embrace and teach the principles of objective morality and natural law, which is the moral laws of the universe. The problem of, of our world, the problems of our world, are not a matter of left versus right. They are a matter of right versus wrong. And that's what I have been trying to expose for many, many years. This presentation is not geared for what I would just simply refer to as psychological children. This is for psychologically mature adults who are ready and able to hear factual information and truth. It is not for those who appear to be adults bodily but still have the psychological mentation of a child, those who attempt to, quote, think and, quote, reason with their emotions. The emotions have to be left out of this as much as is humanly possible for us to do so. We have to try to judge the veracity of the information, not how it makes us feel. Because quite frankly today, a lot of this information is not going to make you feel good. Okay, So we have to try to leave our emotions aside and look at the truth of the information being presented. If you are not willing to learn, no one can help you. But if you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. That should be a life motto of people. That should be a, uh, you know, a, a guiding principle of most people. My present style, presentation style is often extremely intense, at times even combative. 
I don't sugarcoat my words or my delivery. Some people who watch this presentation may very likely become upset or angered by what I have to say during it. So be it. Feel those emotions, go through them, and that's fine. That will never make what I'm about to say here today untrue. Truth, by its very nature, is belligerent because it wages war against all forms of deception and mind control. Telling the truth and making someone cry is better than telling a lie and making someone smile. Why do I do this type of work? Why do I do this public speaking? Well, I don't present this information to be liked because, quite frankly, it's not going to get you uh, a lot of popularity. Uh, to be popular, to make money, or to make friends. Those are not the reasons I do this. I speak publicly because I recognize that in the crisis of overwhelming ignorance and deception in which we currently live, I have a moral obligation to communicate what I know to be taking place in our world in order to help others to understand it so they can then take action and do something about it. We have to strive to do the right thing simply because it is the right thing to do and for no other ulterior motives. What is right stays that which is right, even if everyone is against it. And what is wrong remains wrong even if everyone is for it, you know, as happened in these totalitarian regimes of the past and the present. This presentation is a tapestry of information, and it's informationally dense. So be prepared for that, and just put yourself in a receptive mind state, uh, because it's a lot to take in. And it's a tapestry. It is meant to be taken in as a whole in its entirety. So I highly recommend you stay and watch the entire presentation in all of its three parts that I'm going to deliver here today. If you don't do that, you're, you're most likely not going to recognize the patterns that are inherent to the tapestry. And more likely than not, you will not come away with an accurate understanding of the topics I'm going to present today. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is this is just a drop in the ocean compared to where this research leads. Uh, I could probably have done you know, a week-long presentation or a month-long. One day couldn't possibly cover the entirety of the scope of these topics. It's enormous. Uh, you couldn't fit it all in a week, a month, or even a year. Such topics require ongoing, eclectic research and investigation and could potentially constitute a lifetime study. This presentation is intended merely to whet the appetite of potential students so that they may pursue their own autodidactic investigations, and that means self-directed learning process. So keep in mind, you can't possibly cover this all in a day. I have to give you a general overview. So let's start in with the section called Nazism and Communism as Political Ideologies, because yes, there is a, an aspect to them that are political ideologies. And we have to define terms, okay? Definitions are very important. So what is Nazism? Nazism is a totalitarian political ideology directly associated with Adolf Hitler and the National Social Socialist German Workers' Party of World War II era Germany. Nazism is a form of fascism which incorporates the ideologies of strict authoritarianism, one of its underlying ideologies, political dictatorship, devout nationalism, racism, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, social Darwinism, which we're going to talk about, and eugenics into its system of beliefs and practices. What is fascism? So as a definition, fascism is an authoritarian, ultra-nationalist political ideology and movement characterized by a dictatorial leader, centralized autocracy, militarism, forcible suppression of opposition, belief in a natural social hierarchy, subordination of individual rights for the perceived quote-unquote good of the nation and race, and strong regimentation of society and the economy. It has been historically symbolized by the symbol of the fascies, seen there in the middle, an ax surrounded by a bundle of rods, and that symbol represents the strong centralization of political authority and power by the rods being bound around the central axe. What is communism? Communism 
is a socio-political and economic ideology within the socialist movement, whose goal is the creation of a socio-economic order centered around common ownership, quote unquote, there really is no such thing, but that is what the claim is, of the means of production, distribution, and exchange that allocates products to everyone in the society based on, quote, need, again, a claim. It has been historically symbolized by the emblem of the hammer and sickle, representing the combined strength of both workers and food producers. Again, the hammer representing workers and industry and the sickle representing food production. What is socialism? Socialism is a system of society or group living in which there is no private property and this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the presentation, and in which the means of production and distribution of goods and services are owned and controlled by the state, or in other words, the government. That is the basic definition of socialism, and as we will be discussing, both of these totalitarian ideologies are rooted in socialism. So let's clear up one common misperception in the human population. Nazism and communism are not diametric opposites. You hear this from people that buy into the political ideology. They buy into left versus right politics, the political spectrum as it's called. These are not opposites. They are almost identical in every way that they are carried out in the respective societies that they were implemented in, and I'm going to show and prove that. It's all socialism. Nazism is national socialism. Communism is international socialism. They are both forms of socialism. They only differ in the method by which they are going to get to a world dictatorship. Nazism is national socialism. It spreads its form of totalitarian control by growing to cult-like proportions within a single nation state, then through military conquest over surrounding nations, eventually becoming a world empire through conquest. Communism, on the other hand, is international socialism. It just varies in its approach, and it spreads its form of totalitarian control through the conquest of worldview and social institutions first, eventually becoming a world empire through regional centralization of power and policy making in its satellite nations. So it's just a difference in approach, but they are both forms of socialism, where ultimately it's neo-feudalism and private property is going away. And if private property goes away, rights go away, because all rights are based in property rights, as we'll talk about later. People have to get out of the mind control methodology that is waged against them of the political spectrum being a breakdown of left versus right wing politics. This is the traditional view of the political spectrum, where you have on the left side uh, communism and on the right side fascism. And then you have center politics in the middle. Okay? Um, this is, um, there is no place on this chart for actual freedom or abolition of government. There is no place on this chart where the actual coercion and violence exercised over human beings to keep them under government control is absent. So it's all a form of slavery. It's all control over people, whether it's left-wing control or right-wing control. Okay? I have introduced what I call the true political spectrum to try to steer people away from falling into this mind control trap, because that's what it is. It's social engineering the existing publicly uh, recognized political spectrum. Here's a far more accurate what I call the true political spectrum, and I put even politics in quotes, in double quotes, because it's really not a spectrum of politics. This is a spectrum of human consciousness, by which there is only one razor's edge, a needle point, 
where there's true freedom in the middle at the top of the chart. And I know it may be a little bit small to read here in the audience. People can study it later in the slides. But basically, this axis at the bottom represents control of, of human beings. And the axis on the left-hand side represents consciousness of human beings. So as consciousness is low, control goes to total. And as consciousness is raised higher and higher, control is less and less and less. The only place where control is absent is in the middle at that zero point, right at the very top of the mountain peak or that needle point at the top. Okay, A very difficult place to go to and maintain that position. Most people slide down those slippery slopes very quickly. Okay, So you could see on the left, all the way to the far left, total control or slavery of human beings. You have communism or international socialism. Just to the right of that is democratic incremental socialism. That's where this country is right now. We're sliding down the slope toward total control. But we're at that point where we are trying to institute democratic incremental socialism. We're going to talk about that as an ideology later. Then you have a republic based on classical liberalism. Then you have libertarianism, slightly left-leaning perhaps. Then on the other side, you have maybe slight, slight right-leaning libertarianism and then a republic based on classical conservatism, then corporate incremental socialism, which is what Nazism basically was, and the fascism under Mussolini in Italy. And then you have outright fascism, uh, national socialism being implemented as a slavery system. Okay, So uh, again, this is a function of consciousness. The left-hand side gauges the amount of consciousness, alignment with objective morality and natural law, and respect for self-ownership that is present in human society. All right, So that's what I think people should understand as the real political spectrum or the real way consciousness and control of human beings are related to each other. And again, we'll talk about that later when we talk about natural law and the law of freedom. People have to stop falling in line with what's called polarization dialectics. Polarization dialectics, also referred to as the Hegelian dialectic, after the German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, refers to the structured psychological manipulation of two polarized worldviews to bring them toward an identical sociological end. Dialectics are specifically used in the political realm to steer polarized political factions toward a totalitarian system of government. The relevant question for us to ask is, who created that dialectic in the first place to steer the seemingly opposing sides to the same outcome? And that's what I'm going to talk about and reveal, that these are social engineers and they are occultists, what I call dark occultists. See, it doesn't matter whether you join the donkey cult, the elephant cult, the camp of international socialism or national socialism. They're all taking you to the same place, and this is the world that they want to create. They want to build a prison society. They want to put the world into bondage and slavery. Uh, it, it's like giving uh, a, a farm animal the choice to go uh, down one road to the slaughterhouse or down the other road to the slaughterhouse. It doesn't matter which road they choose. They're going to end up at the same place. And that's all politics is. It's just a polarizing dialectic to get people into slavery. Let's look at the political commonalities just as political systems alone of Nazism and Communism. You know, if we get into the underlying ideologies, they're almost completely identical. But just let's look at how they are very, very similar in their political methodologies. They both have underlying totalitarian political ideology. A complete, the complete control of people and resources is ultimately their objectives as political systems. They share in common the use of propaganda and indoctrination to influence the minds of the public, especially the young. Okay, so this is social engineering. They use pseudo-religious symbolism and trappings to foment cult-like religiosity in their political followers. They both share that in common. They both exercise complete control of their media systems within their nations, 
within their regimes and ex exercise total censorship of conflicting information so that people really can't get conflicting information to even think differently than the totalitarian regime of Nazism and communism wants them to think. They engage in shaming and dehumanization of all political opponents of the regime. They use the brutal utilization of military and secret police forces via order followers people who will unquestioningly obey their orders, no matter how immoral they are. And we'll talk about order followers later as well. They share in common the deployment of internment or work camps or concentration camps to punish or kill political opponents and undesirables in their regimes. And about the only real way, even in the political aspect that they differ, is in the 20th century alone how many human beings they respectively killed. Nazism was uh, confined within uh, Europe and the Nazis were stopped in World War II and before they were stopped they, ex they exercised the extermination of approximately 20 million people. And those numbers are, you know, it's probably a conservative estimate if you take into account all the people that were the result, uh, that died as a result of what Nazism did. And communism uh, is responsible for the estimated deaths of 94 million people in the 20th century. So uh, absolutely horrific numbers uh, of people who lost their lives to these ideological regimes. But we have to look past the politics. You know, this is where most people stop. They look at just the political ideologies. They don't understand that these things are not just political mentalities. They are religions. And I want to say that unequivocally. Nazism and communism are religions. And this is very much not known by the general public. They don't see it that way, they don't view it that way, because they've been conditioned not to see it that way. But make no mistake, behind these political ideologies lies religion. And what I want to get to is what the religion that they share in common actually is, because they have a common root religion, and that's the thesis of this whole presentation. Nazism and communism are political masks which are presented to the public as diametric opposites but at their ideological core lies a common root religion which created and controls them both as systems of human slavery. That's the whole takeaway of this entire body of research. You have to understand that there is a common puppeteer hand that ultimately controls both of these political masks. And that is a religious system. It is a covert religious system, but is a, it is a religious system nonetheless. So in this body of work, I am defining religion in a particular context. It's not what people generally think of as religion. And for people who have studied my work, you know this definition. The word religion is etymologically derived from the Latin verb religare, meaning to bind, to hold back by tying, to thwart from forward progress. That's what the verb in Latin religare means. Religion, as I am defining it throughout the whole presentation and really throughout all of my work, is a mental, spiritual, and sociological control system based in unchallenged, erroneous, meaning false, and dogmatic beliefs, belief which is specifically designed to hold back the progress of human consciousness by preventing it from recognizing and accepting reality and truth. Any form of religion is just a system of mental control that prevents someone from accurately perceiving reality. Keep that definition in mind. It is mind control. There is no better synonym for religion and religiosity and religious belief systems and thought than mind control. That is the entire purpose of all forms of religion, whether they are overt 
or whether they are covert. So let's look at the, def the difference between overt religions, meaning ones that we could readily see in society that are operating as religious belief systems, versus covert religion, which it's much more difficult for the public to recognize as a religious belief system some ideologies and thought processes. Overt religion is obvious and readily seen by the average person as a religious belief system, whereas covert religion is difficult or impossible for the average person to recognize as a religious belief system. That's why it's covert. It's hidden. It's largely unseen or recognized as a religion. Overt religion openly displays aesthetics and conducts rituals of traditional religious beliefs, those that would be recognized as religion. Covert religion displays aesthetics and conducts rituals which are religious. They contain religiosity and religious notions and ideologies, but the public does not recognize them as such. Okay, That is what makes those ideologies covert religions. They're still holding people back from the truth, but people are told, oh, that's not a religion. That's just politics. That's not a religion. That's just believing in things that have to exist in, in our reality. Okay? It's all a mind control game that's being waged against people. Overt religion, uh, some examples include what we would historically and culturally recognize as religious beliefs, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., on and on. Uh, for covert religion, some examples would include the very idea of authority of some human beings over other human beings. That's a religion. That's a religious belief. It has no bearing in truth, but people believe in it fervently with a, a religious fervor. Government, same thing. That's a religion. That's religious thought. Okay, They've just replaced the old religions with a new religion called government. Politics, part of government, supporting government policies and people within government positions. Money is a form of religion. Believing in exchange mediums that really are completely illusionary ultimately is a form of religious thought. You're inventing something that doesn't exist in nature and then imbuing it with power. Scientism, which is trusting science as the only arbiter of truth. Uh, when in fact it's often funded by large sums of grant money coming in from government to support the conclusions government wants it to, to find. Okay, So even what we call science can become a religion. And of course, occultism, hidden religious belief systems that are not widely known to the general body of humanity constitute religion. So what is the common core root religion of these two seemingly political ideologies, but really they're just sects of the same religious cult. They are both sects of Satanism, and what I call in a general overarching term, the dark occult. Dark occultism is the common core root religion of both Nazism and Communism. Always has been, since their inception. Now, I'm going to talk about how these ideologies came into the power that they came into and all the occultists and all the occult groups that led to these sick, twisted cults, which is what they are, um, murdering over 100 million people in the 20th century. So let's review what the occult is briefly because, of course, I can't go over my entire Demystifying the Occult series, but... I want to let people know if you want a firm foundation, a foundational understanding of the occult and the knowledge that it contains, you can watch my two presentations, uh, Demystifying the Occult, Parts 1 and 2. Part 1, I talk about a lot of different occult traditions throughout time uh, in a positive sense because there, all of this knowledge is a dual-edged sword. It can be used for good or evil. Okay, So in Part 1, I largely talk about the occult traditions uh, that are designed and have a tradition of trying to uplift human consciousness. And then in part two, uh, called Satanism and the Dark Occult, I talk about how occultism can be twisted and perverted and turned into a mechanism of control 
and used against people that don't have the knowledge of the occult. So this is knowledge that can create a power differential, as we're going to talk about. But for more information, please visit my website, whatonearthishappening.com, and check out those two presentations on occultism. What is the occult? Let's define it. The word occult is etymologically derived from the Latin adjective occultus, meaning hidden. And that's all the word occult means. It means hidden. Hidden from sight, difficult to see. You know, it requires deeper investigation. It's not easily or readily seen by the average person. Occultism is the study of the hidden laws of nature specifically those laws which are at work in the invisible, mental, or spiritual domain, far more than those that are at work in the visible or physical world. Therefore, occultism involves the acceptance of a much wider worldview than that which is ordinarily taken by the everyday person. Occultists, then, may be defined as those who study all the laws of nature, both those that are readily seen and those which are much more difficult to see with the physical eyes or with measuring instruments alone. Those laws still definitively exist. It's just harder to recognize them in the physical domain, largely because they operate through our behavioral choices and because they are deeply embedded in the fabric of nature and over time. It requires a long view of human behavior in order to see how those laws operate. And that's why humanity has not yet recognized the existence of natural law and understood its critical importance when it regards human freedom, in regard to human freedom. So what knowledge does the world of occultism hide? If this is hidden knowledge, what does it contain? Occultism is a body of science, not widely known to the general population, consisting of hidden knowledge about the workings of the human psyche and the workings of the laws of nature. So if we break down occultism into two categories or camps, we have the microcosmic world, the world of the self, the world of the individual, okay? And it's a study of the consciousness of the individual and how the psyche of the individual works and how it operates and what its motivations are, what its fears are, how it may be manipulated in a state of ignorance, etc. Okay? Uh, so this is what is known in the occult as the minor arcana. It's called the lesser knowledge because it's the knowledge of the small. It doesn't mean it's less important. It just means it's the knowledge of the microcosm of consciousness, the individual, knowledge of the self, knowledge of the human psyche and how it operates. Whereas the other aspect of occultism studies the laws of nature, both physical laws and unseen laws, laws that govern behavior, behavioral consequence, etc. So that's the major arcana. The, the, the overarching laws of the universe, okay, what, what we would call the macrocosmic knowledge, okay, the knowledge of natural law, the universal laws of morality and how they work to bring us the consequences of our behaviors that we choose to enact. And it's also, it also contains the knowledge of the general physical sciences, which can be occulted and held by a few so that they can maintain a power differential over the ignorant. So that's what occultism contains and quote unquote hides. And I say quote unquote because this knowledge is really not in hiding anymore. It has been revealed to the public and the public just refuses to study it, accept it, take it in, understand how it works and then base their behavior upon it accordingly because of overwhelming ignorance and because of what unfortunately religious systems have told us uh, how we should be wary of this knowledge and instead of being wary of it we should take it in so we can steel ourselves against its use against us as a weapon so what is the difference between light occultism and dark occultism as I define them in my work again occult knowledge is a double-edged sword it cuts both ways 
the knowledge contained within the occult sciences can be used for good, the uplift of human consciousness, or evil, manipulation, control, slavery. To clearly distinguish between the different uses of this knowledge, I refer to occult knowledge that is employed toward the expansion of human consciousness and morality as light occultism, and that which is used for manipulation, control, and the suppression of human consciousness as dark occultism. And again, that's why I'm defining Nazism and Communism as root uh, the, their shared common root religion, they are sects of dark occultism, that which is trying to manipulate and suppress human consciousness and keep us under a system of tight totalitarian control. Practitioners of light occultism could be referred to as light occultists, magicians, light workers, or as I talk about, as I refer to myself, a de-occultist. I'm trying to take the knowledge of the occult out of hiding and just explode it onto the world for everybody to see and understand. So I call myself a deocultist because they reveal and disseminate the hidden knowledge which must be known in order for human freedom to be manifested. Practitioners of dark occultism could be referred to as dark occultists, sorcerers, or dark workers. Whichever term you prefer, it's all basically talking about the same usage of that knowledge. So light occultists over the centuries have hidden occult knowledge in order to prevent its complete eradication during exceedingly draconian times. And at other times they've hidden it, I'm sorry, let me step back. At other times they've hidden it to prevent it from falling into the hands of would-be dark occultists or those who knew of the empowerment that could be gained from such knowledge but wanted to use it for their own immoral purposes of deception and control. So these are two reasons that even you know some good people have taken the knowledge of occultism and put it into hiding deliberately. Okay, now I don't necessarily agree with that tactic. I think the best way you give people psychic self-defense is by sharing the knowledge of the occult widely and freely. Okay, and then you have to put it in humanity's hands how they're going to use it. Okay, it's just like a weapon, right? If, if only a few people have it, they could do a lot of damage to people who don't. But if everybody has it, it be, creates a stalemate. Okay, and people are much more you know, careful to try to use a weapon against somebody who also has the same weapon. That's why the occult knowledge has to be shared and made common sense. So dark occultists over the centuries have hidden occult knowledge in order to create and maintain a power differential between those who hold such knowledge and those who are ignorant of it. Dark occultists work through fear and manipulation to bring about compliance with their own selfish will. Their work is always done in secrecy, constantly contravening the freedom and prosperity of all but themselves. Now, there is no better term for them than sorcerers of consciousness. And that's what the occultists that formulated the ideologies of Nazism and communism were. And that's what the occult organizations that drove those ideologies and basically brought them, ushered them into the public consciousness of the nations where they flourished. Um, that's what they were. They were sorcerers of consciousness. And we're going to talk about all those individuals and groups today. A concept to really get clear on regarding the occult is the difference between exoteric knowledge versus esoteric knowledge. The word exoteric is derived from the Greek adjective exoterikos. It means external or outside of. So exoteric knowledge is intended for or likely to be understood by the general public. So the average common knowledge of the public you would call exoteric. It contains information which is current or popular among the general public. Contrary to exoteric, the word esoteric is derived from the Greek adjective esoterikos. And that means within or inside. Esoteric knowledge is intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with specialized knowledge or interest. It is information which is hidden, 
mysterious, or simply beyond the range of ordinary knowledge, experience, or perception. This information, meaning esoteric information, is generally communicated only to the initiated, meaning people who are on the inside, perhaps of a secret society, or a group of people who are, have that kind of specialized knowledge already and keep it to themselves. And again, we're going to talk about all of those esoteric groups and secret societies. The occult structure of our world needs to be generally understood. Dark occultists of our world throughout the centuries have completely infiltrated and permeated all institutional walks of life on this planet. And when I mean all, I mean all of them. Not some are just exempt or safe or, or squeaky clean. All of them, okay? Th this goes from religion to finance to government to uh, education to the military. You, you, you name the human institution. Satanists and dark occultists not, are not only in it, they run them, okay? They, uh, they maintain their control over the human population through their manipulation of world institutions. This is not only possible, but it is relatively easy for them to accomplish since the structure, the, the created structure of all of those world institutional bodies is based upon a system of hierarchy and compartmentalization. That means a structure of command and obedience going up the chain of command and down to the bottom levels where you have obedient workers and obedient order followers, and compartmentalization, which means the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. It's a need-to-know basis, okay? So, you know, the bank teller doesn't know what the chairman of the board or the board of directors of the bank is, what their agenda is, okay? The military grunt does not know what the high-level brass knows uh, and or why they're even commanding them to do what they're doing, all right? That's hierarchy and compartmentalization. And that's what allows this uh, control of humanity to just go on and on unchallenged. It's very easy when you structure the world like that. So if you want to look at a basic, simple building block structure of the occult world, it works like this. At the very bottom of this pyramid of hierarchy and compartmentalization are human slaves, the general population that are basically held in a form of covert slavery. Above them, you have governments of the world, instituted and people believing that they have some moral right to issue all the commands that they call laws and control people the way that they do. And that is just a very low level of the control system. For, pe for people that believe that that's all it is, they have a lot to learn. They have a, a f way further to explore and to go down the rabbit hole to know what really lies behind the ostensible power that lies within government. Because above government, still operating, if people think it has, uh, you know, uh, well, above government, you obviously have the financial world. Banks and corporations are really intertwined in government and ultimately calling the shots. And most people who even study the conspiratorial aspect of our reality on this planet, stop there. They believe that's it, that it's the bankers that are the top of the food chain in this system of control. And again, nothing could be further from the truth because still entrenched even behind financial power is religion. And I'm talking about not the covert religions, not the dark occult yet, right? But even above that level of control are religious institutions. I've talked about this in my work ad infinitum. People think the world is controlled through New York, New York City, London, Washington, D.C., Tokyo, Japan, Beijing, China, etc. These are not the actual centers of power of the world. The centers of power, if you want to go to the centers of power of this planet, you need to go to three cities. Rome, Jerusalem, and Mecca. And then you will find the occultists that are ultimately in power. Religion has not lost its sway or its hold or its thrall over humanity. It just changed the nature of the control system. And it instituted it instead of directly through religion and kingship, it instituted it through finance and government. 
to control the people because they stopped believing in all the religious nonsense that they used to control the population in the old world. That's all that happened. You know, they just euphemized that control system, called it government, right? And they're still ruling in, in, in enthroned behind the scenes of power. And then above them, you have the really super secretive priest class. You know, you, ha you have a subset of the secret societies, a subset of the world religions, a subset of all of the intelligence agencies that are really running the show. And you get up to that very top level, and that's where you find occultists. You find covert religion at the very top of this pyramid of power. And these are the dark occultists of our world. They are the ones who are exerting this top-down chain of command and obedience over all these other structures in the power structure. And this is what people have to realize, that a, a small covert religious priest class ultimately directs things. And it's, it's very difficult. It's, very, it's one of the most difficult things I have tried to convey to people because most people will never enter that world in their lives. And I was fortunate enough to at least get a glimpse into that world. I did not make it very high up in that hierarchy because, quite frankly, what I saw at a low level of that hierarchy scared me so badly. And I realized uh, absolutely definitively that these people were trying to institute a system of human slavery worldwide. That led to a crisis of conscience in which I finally got out of uh, the, dark, the world of the dark occult and have been blowing the whistle on it ever since. So what is Satanism? So I talk about in Demystifying the Occult Part 2, Satanism and the Dark Occult. Satanism is an ancient occult religion. It has been here for millennia in, under different names. Okay, It is an ancient occult religion comprised of diverse interconnected networks of worldwide adherents. They have an, a worldwide network of followers and acolytes. But at its ideological core, the religion of Satanism postulates that knowledge of how the human psyche works and knowledge of how the laws of nature work should be occulted or hidden and held only by a few human beings to create a power differential for them over the masses of the ignorant. Instead of looking at these people as a very twisted priest class, which they are, right? Don't get me wrong, that's, that's accurate. They're psychopaths, they're evil psychopaths. But instead of even looking at them in this Hollywoodized manner, or as like people that are gonna go out into, into the woods and sacrifice a bunch of animals in black robes, take that image out of your mind. It is way more accurate far more accurate to simply perceive occultists, Satanists, dark occultists in general, as people who have very ancient psychological knowledge. Look at them as the master psychologists of the planet who can manipulate people's minds at will because of how much they know about how the mind really works. That's how you have to see occultism in general. That's how you have to see dark occultism the people who are using that for their own selfish purposes, who hold and wield this hidden information in ways which exploit those who still remain ignorant of the occult. Okay? They're social engineers. I apologize, I stepped forward too quickly. Through the power that these social engineers, these ancient psychologists, gain by way of manipulating those who remain in ignorance of occult knowledge, this small minority, this, this ultra-secretive priest class of social engineers who are in the know wish to permanently rule the masses of humanity and effectively become God on earth. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through. It's important to understand that contrary to popular belief, the overwhelmingly vast majority of modern of, of Satanists in general, do not worship an externalized deity known as Satan in the Christian tradition. They simply take the name. And again, many of them don't even call themselves Satanists. They have no name for who they really are, most of them. 
Some do say we are Satanists because they're taking the image of the, the chief rebel angel of the Christian tradition in, modern, in the modern day and they're wearing it as a badge of honor, okay? Uh, because they want to destroy natural law. They want to destroy the laws of the creator of the universe, okay? So uh, instead, we should see Satanism as an ideological way of being in the world. It's a, it's a worldview and it's a way of behaving toward other people. Okay, and they view the ego-driven self as God. That's what you have to keep in mind. That's the God of their religion, is the ego. The ego is put on a pedestal. The ego is elevated to apotheosis, or godhood. Okay, that's what they ultimately, quote-unquote, worship. They don't worship demons and conjure demons and worship Satan. This is, this is religious nonsense. Okay? And I was a priest within this religion. That's how far I made it into the religion of Satanism when I was involved in it in my youth. I was appointed a priest in the organization called the Church of Satan by Anton LaVey, who was the high priest of that organization at the time, back in the, the mid and late 90s. Okay, so I'm telling you this from a perspective of direct experience within this religion. You know, I don't have this knowledge by studying this religion. I have this knowledge because I was a pr in the priest class of this religion when I was younger. Okay, so this is firsthand knowledge, not book knowledge about Satanism. Let's go over the main tenets of Satanism, or what I call the pillars of Satanism. You can look at them as the four pillars, the four table legs of the Satanic religion, of the Satanic ideology. The first is pure egotism. Again, ego elevated to apotheosis or godhood. Egotism is the first tenet of Satanism expressed through the dictum, self-preservation is the highest law. Or in other words, the survival and comfort of the physical self is always more important, a more important goal than doing what is morally right. Now just gauge that definition based on the average member of humanity. Really think about this tenet. The comfort of the physical self is always a more important goal than doing what is morally right. How many people think that way in the world? Almost everyone. That's because they have been inculcated into Satanism as the world religion. That's how successful these people are in actually training human beings' minds to believe in the worldview they want them to believe. Going on with what a Satanist would basically, you know, how they would view egotism, live for yourself only and only care about you and yours. Again, most people think that way in the world. If you must step on others to get what you want, then so be it, for this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Once again, this is the prevailing ideology of most human beings because the Satanists have propagated their religion worldwide. The mindset that clearly defines the overarching worldview of Satanism, above all else, is perpetual me, me, me thinking. That's what the Satanist always wants, is always concerned with from the minute they get up till the minute they go to sleep at night. All they're thinking about is what can I do for me? What can I get? How can I exploit? How can I dominate? Etc. Egotism run rampant. The second tenet of Satanism is moral relativism. And we're going to see these throughout the entire day in Nazism and Communism. Okay? Just note these ideologies, note these tenets, because these are the religious tenets of both of those so-called political uh, organizations, those, those masks on the face of Satanism, Communism and Nazism. Moral relativism, the second tenet of Satanism, is the ideology that there is no objective difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. So human beings may arbitrarily create or decide what right and wrong are for themselves. They're just social constructs. Right and wrong don't exist in nature. We just we get to make them up as we see fit. That's moral relativism. And that's how most people think. Again, because they've been inculcated into this religion. 
And, you know, we can make them up for ourselves based upon our own whims and preferences. Or in other words, that which human beings consider, quote unquote, right for themselves is what is morally right. And that which human beings consider wrong for themselves is that which is morally wrong. We're the arbiters of truth and morality. That's the second tenet of Satanism. And you just go and look at these political regimes, these so-called political regimes of Nazism and communism, they're just absolutely brimming with this ideology of moral relativism, that they could just make up whatever the hell they want and set it into law, and that becomes what's right and good. And if they want to ban other people from even saying anything or movement, they can do that too because that's what's good for them. It's absolute garbage. It's absolute nonsense. And no society can ever be free if they engage in the ideology of moral relativism. It is impossible according to natural law. The third tenet of the satanic religion is social Darwinism. And again, these political regimes set up a system of hierarchy and compartmentalization, a pecking order of human beings. They love to do that because they're absolutely obsessed with control. They have the control disease. It's a spiritual illness. And social Darwinism is a gigantic part of it. So what is social Darwinism? It is the extension of the theory of Darwinism, uh, Darwinian macrobiological evolution, into the human social domain. The proponents of Darwinian macrobiological evolution postulate the notion of the survival of the fittest animals, meaning that the animals who are the most dominant and vicious will eventually come to rule their social strata and their environment. When you apply the Darwinian survival of the fittest modality or theory to the human social domain, this theory then uh, called social Darwinism puts forward that the the notion that it is the quote unquote natural order and even desirable for human society to be ruled by the most dominating and vicious human beings. And that such human beings' genetics are the reason that they acquired and maintain their positions of social power. So you're extruding Darwinism into the human into human society. And you're saying, look at how those animals behave. The most ruthless and vicious are the ones that survive because they exert domination over those that they can just instinctually with pure instinctive behavior. So human beings should act in that animalistic instinctive way. Imagine thinking that humans should just act like beasts of the field. And that's what many, many, many people in the world today think. Again, because they've been inculcated into this sick, twisted religious belief system. And finally, taken to the end conclusion, as did the Nazis and as did the communists, eugenics is then exercised. Okay, Meaning, we're going to decide who lives and who dies, ultimately. The word eugenics is derived from the Greek adjective eugenes, meaning well-born. From the Greek adjective eu, meaning good, and the Greek noun genos, meaning race or stock. Eugenics is a social ideology that promotes higher rates of sexual reproduction for people with traits and characteristics desired by its proponents and reduced rates of sexual reproduction or sterilization for those with undesired traits and characteristics. This tenet describes the ideology of Satanism taken to its ultimate conclusion and it sounds something like this. Since mankind is God and Mankind gets to make up what right and wrong are. And since it's simply the natural order for the most ruthless human beings, whose genes are the fittest to rule the rest of the human herd, then that elite class of human beings has every right to decide who is allowed to live and procreate and who must die. And once again, you may not think eugenics is still all that you know, popular and distributed as an ideology throughout society. But every time control comes into a society, it ultimately leads to genocide. And in the modern day, the biggest non-natural cause of death is democide. 
That means genocide carried out by government. People dying by direct or indirect actions of their own governments. Okay? 260 million people in the last 100 years have been killed by government action. If that's not eugenics, then I don't know what is. And that's Satanism. That's exactly the religious belief that it, this ideology is embedded within. So let's clear it up once and for all that Nazism and communism, they're not just political ideologies. They're not just religions. They are cults. That's the strongest word that you could really use to describe them. They're satanic cults. So what is a cult? Let's again define the term. A cult is an extremist religious belief system that is violent and dangerous to the lives, rights, and freedom of those who are not its members. This is, what, and actually, to some who are its members. Okay? So this is what defines a cult versus just a normal religion. You can believe in all kinds of nonsense. Call it a religion if you want, right? As long as it's not hurting anybody else, you can believe that pink elephants are floating all throughout this room right now and call that your religion. As long as it's not hurting other people, could knock yourself out. Be as stupid as you want and believe whatever nonsense you want to believe in, right? Once a religion crosses the line of just saying, we think this, and it says, either you must think this way or we're going to kill you, or we're just going to take over society and do what we want. If you stand in our way, we're going to kill you because we have these beliefs and we're going to act on them. That's a cult. It's no longer just a religion. Religion stands in the way of your understanding of truth, but a cult actually violates your rights when you stand in its way in any, in any perceivable way to them, okay? So cults throughout human history have traditionally used the same basic techniques. I, I laugh hilariously when people say, I'm trying to form a cult with what on earth is happening. Oh yeah, I'm teaching everybody all the damn techniques that cults have used throughout time. I have a whole section in my podcast where all I do is teach cult techniques that cults have used against people to say, hey, you got to be aware of how this works so you don't fall into a cult like I did when I was young, right? I'm teaching the techniques that cults use to get their membership, to make people do crazy stuff, right? But, but yeah, I'm trying to start a cult, you know? It's the cult, it's the anti-cult cult, I guess, you know? They've traditionally used the same exact techniques to establish and maintain the loyalty of their fanatic followers. These include, but are not limited to, social isolation, conformity of thought and appearance, censorship of conflicting information, indoctrination via repetition of ideological dogma, and mental and physical trauma against their, their very adherents. Think about these in relation to Nazism and Communism. They're everywhere in their methodologies. The, the techniques of cults are the exact methodologies that those political regimes, those totalitarian regimes have used. I mean, and, I mean, you look at the religious fervor of cults, political cults today, and these are ultimately religions. You know, they have millions of devoted acolytes. That's what politics has become. It is the new worldwide religion. And the people who follow it are cult members. Let's look at some of the ideologies that underlay both Nazism and Communism and really define cult behavior. They define cult ideology and behavior. The first and most widespread and important to understand is collectivism. Collectivism is a social worldview that emphasizes the needs and goals of the group or collective over the rights and freedom of individual human beings. Collectivism exists in diametric opposition to individualism, the social worldview that stresses the power, paramount importance of individual rights, freedom, and property. Collectivism is the basis of ideologies such as groupthink, social conformity, corporatism, religion, politics, totalitarianism, and of course, religious cults. 
Collectivism is always the, the very top ideology that, that these people are bowing down to. It's always, I'm a member of the group. The group's needs come before the individual's need or rights. Always. They have to get you into group think first before they give you the sick ideologies and perverted practices of any cult. The second ideology then it naturally is the belief in authority, authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is a false religious belief system based upon the idea that some human beings have somehow been magically gifted with the right to control and command other human beings. The belief in authority is the basis for the belief in the moral legitimacy of all forms of government. Every form of government, it's based in collectivism and authoritarianism. You can't have government without the belief in authority. If there's no authority, there's no government. Okay, this is a hallmark religious belief of everybody who believes in government and politics. Those who believe in human authority operate under a religiously induced delusion. Now, let me be very, very emphatic about that. Anybody who believes that human authority is true and is somehow morally legitimate and should be continue to be conducted is delusional. They're mentally ill and they're operating under religious indoctrination and inculcation. This is a religion. Authoritarianism is a religion. Okay? The belief in authority is an illusion which can only exist within a human psyche that has become diseased. Again, it's a mental illness through indoctrination and mind control. Authority is and always has been based entirely in violence. Direct initiation of harm upon others if they don't comply in some form or fashion. And built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief that some people are masters who have the quote moral right to issue commands to other people while others are their slaves who have the quote moral obligation to obey the laws set down by the masters. That's all religion, that's all authority ever has been, is now, and ever will be. That's all all forms of government ever have been, are now, and ever will be. And you can call it whatever term you want to call it, but I call it what it really is, slavery. That's all it is. It's never been anything else. And to condone these beliefs is to condone slavery. The belief in the moral legitimacy of authority is the belief in the moral legitimacy of human slavery. Get as offended about the statement as you want, it's still true. I need you to find the difference between these photos because there isn't one. They're all order followers. They're all believers in collectivism they're all believers in authority and government. It doesn't matter what military it is. That could be the military of any nation on earth, and they could all get equally offended by the statement. It's still true. They're cut from the same cloth, whether they believe it or not, because ultimately they're willing to follow the orders of a leader. I don't care whether you're in the military, you're in the police, you're in the government, doesn't make a difference. Or even people, order followers in other institutions like education and medicine, etc. Order following is the problem and the belief in authority and taking your place in the authoritarian structure is the moral problem. And that's what needs to go away if we're going to move forward as a species and truly evolve. The next cult mentality that foments cults that makes them actually have their power is materialism or secularism as it has been also called. With a worldview driven heavily by the theories of Darwinism, which obviously promulgates materialism, and extruding Darwinism into the human social domain as social Darwinism, both Nazism and Communism completely embrace secularism and materialism. 
placing significant de-emphasis on philosophy and spirituality and placing a very strong emphasis on secular institutions and material needs only. They're not worried about people's spirituality or morality or the understanding of the difference between right and wrong. They're only worried about physical worldly power and gathering whatever needs they feel that they want to meet physically. That's all it is. It's all materialism. Okay? As an overarching aspect of their secular worldview, adherents of both Nazism and communism erroneously believe that political and or economic, quote, solutions to human problems even exist. And that such policies that they envision as solutions should be implemented by coercion and violence if they think that's necessary. Both of these cult ideologies have continuously failed to recognize and acknowledge that the only true solutions to human problems stem from an accurate and balanced spiritual worldview, one which encourages human beings to live in harmony with objective morality and natural law. That is the only way that we can solve problems. We have to align our behavior to the objective standard, standards of morality that exist in the universe and are set down by creation's laws itself. Okay. Another ideology that underlies cults, especially in the modern day, is called postmodernism. Postmodernism is generally defined by an attitude of skepticism and rejection of ideas associated with modernism, often criticizing enlightenment rationality and focusing on the role of ideology in maintaining political or economic power. Again, it's the de-emphasis on philosophy and spirituality, and it's just telling people, formulate an ideology and stick with it, whether it's right, wrong, moral, immoral, it doesn't matter. You have to just be a believer Right? And you, you just believe those things because there really is no such thing as truth. You have to just pursue what you perceive as truth, okay? Which, as we'll talk about br briefly here, is solipsism and moral relativism, all right? So, <clears throat> postmodern thinkers frequently describe that knowledge and values, knowledge itself and values themselves, are contingent or they are socially conditioned factors, framing them as products of political, historical, or cultural power hierarchies. Postmodernists go, far, go so far as to say the idea that knowledge even exists is a product of capitalism. I, I've literally heard them say this. Truth does not exist. That's a product of a capitalist worldview, or that's a product of you know, the dominant, uh, you know, the, ma the male dominator hierarchy's worldview. That, I've literally heard them say that. Common targets of postmodern criticism include, but are not limited to, objective reality. And there's no objective reality. We can just make up whatever we want as being real. We see this all the time in postmodern thought. Objective morality. Again, they're moral relativists. A big hallmark of satanic thought. Truth. There's no such thing as truth. It's what we are, whatever we make it up to be. Even reason. There's, there's no way of actually arriving at, at truth. That's epistemology, as we'll see. That's also relative to the postmodernist. Science. You know, they don't even believe there's any objective method of scientific inquiry. And there is. Language, even they see that as a socially engineered construct, and social progress. Accordingly, postmodern thought is broadly categorized by tendencies toward pluralism, that things could be two contradictory things simultaneously. Irreverence, meaning that there's nothing that is sacred or holy or you know, of, of uh, value that even transcends the human being. Uh, solipsism, the idea that there's no objective truth or objective reality. Epistemological relativism, that means there's no known way of developing a methodology to understand what is true and real. That's the investigation of reality as epistemology. And of course, moral relativism, the idea that there's no such thing as objective right or wrong. This is a mental illness and a an cult belief system. And it's rife throughout especially 
uh, communism, but was probably also very present in Nazi society. And then finally, that the last ideology that constitutes cult belief is uh, millenarianism. Not a commonly known term, but this is the belief by a religious, social, or political group or movement in a coming fundamental transformation of society after which all things will be changed. Millennialism is, exists in various cultures and religions worldwide with various interpretations of what actually constitutes a so-called societal transformation. Many of the occultists and occult organizations that we'll be talking about distinctly held a uh, millenarianist worldview. And we'll talk about that later. So now let's explore the first major section here, uh, the dark occult origins of Nazism. To really understand where Nazism developed from and really was perverted out of uh, older systems of religion and belief, you really have to go back to ancient Germanic paganism because that's what a lot of the occultists based a lot of their folklore upon. Okay, And it is not to say that this is all evil. Please do not make that mistake into me thinking everything I show you here today means that it's evil. Okay, You have to have a much more evolved viewpoint of this and understand there's a lot of distortion and perversion that went into taking some of these older ancient beliefs and twisting them to suit the aims that the occultists wanted to use them for. Okay. So Germanic paganism could be best described as the pre-Christian polytheistic religious beliefs, traditions, and practices of German-speaking peoples in the regions of Scandinavia, Germany of course, the British Isles, and other parts of Europe. While these beliefs and practices did vary greatly in different geographical regions of Europe and the, throughout the world, many commonalities of these beliefs can be identified and we'll look at some of their commonalities. So again, um, if you're really going to do a long cultural study and a historical fr framing of where Nazism came from, you have to go back and look at the ancient Germanic religions of Germanic paganism. The commonalities shared by these different regional variations include myths regarding the creation and destruction of the world, a general belief in an afterlife, and a wide pantheon of gods, goddesses, and supernatural beings. Themes of astrotheology, which I talk a lot about in my work on the occult, also figured heavily into these religious traditions, evidenced specifically by the names of some of its most important deities. So you could see astrotheological themes coming through in ancient Germanic paganism. Uh, in this graphic here, depicting some of their gods um, in Germanic paganism, you have the deities Sunna, Mona, Tiu, uh, Woden, Thonor, Freya, and Saiter, uh, representing the bodies of our solar system, you know, the sun, the moon, um, uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, uh, and the seven days of the week seen, very readily seen in their names, you know, Sunna, Sun, Mona, Moon, Tew, Tuesday, Woden, Wednesday, or Mona, M Monday, you know, Sunna, Sunday, Wo Woden, Wednesday, Thunor, Thursday, or Thor, uh, Freya, um, Friday, and of course, Satyr, Saturday. Very blatantly obvious in the names of the week. So this is all astrotheology. It's very much covered in my podcast series. It's very much covered in my Demystifying the Occult presentation. Uh, Obviously, that's another presentation unto itself to study astrotheology, but it's very interesting how all of those associations take place within these ancient religious uh, views in Germanic paganism. There was a Germanic occult revival in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that really paved the way for the, the, the coming on of the ideologies that led to the Third Reich. The late 19th and earliest, early 20th centuries saw a general occult revival on the European continent, specifically the regions including Germany and Austria. Among the occult traditions that influenced this occult revival were astrology, ruins or runology, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, 
theosophy and anthroposophy. So I want to talk briefly about the last two here because we'll get into ruins a little bit, we'll get into Freemasonry a bit when we talk about some of the other secret societies later. But um, theosophy and anthroposophy, we really have to understand them in a framework that of distortion by the dark occultists. These are, all of these ideologies are not evil systems. People have to understand they just contained occult knowledge and these dark occultists or sorcerers come along and they twist them and pervert them and use them for their own ends. So once again, it's very important to understand some of the people that led to this occult revival, right, which did pave the way for some of these dark occultists to come along and twist and pervert those ideologies. They themselves were teaching a pure form of some of these uh, occult traditions and should not be blamed for the rise of Nazism. Okay, so the first and foremost of these is theosophy. And I, I could tell you from personal experience, this is a very rich occult tradition with phenomenal values, ideas, and exploration. Uh, I've attended theosophical lodges myself, engaged in discussions with them. Uh, you, you have to see this tradition from the pure perspective that is an, it is intended to be seen from and not fall into the ideology that, oh, theosophy paved the way for Nazism. It was twisted and distorted by dark occultists. That's all they ever do. They just take the pure form, they twist and pervert it, they give it to people, and then it's off to the races. Okay? So, theosophy, from the Greek nouns theos, meaning God or divinity, and sophos, meaning wisdom, thus literally it means divine wisdom or the wisdom of the divine. Uh, theosophy is a system of esoteric philosophy, again, intended for initiates, not intended for people on the outside who don't have a lot of knowledge on these topics. It's taught to an initiated group. Uh, esoteric philosophy, which investigates and seeks direct knowledge of the mysteries of being and nature, or in other words, natural law, or the occult. Although it is an ancient philosophy, theosophy was popularized by a 19th century occultist named Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society and wrote many famous works of occult teaching. The Theosophical Society's mantra is, there is no religion higher than truth. If you're going to devote your life to the understanding of something, you should try to pursue truth, the truth about the nature of reality, the truth about the nature of, of human beings. And there's nothing higher than that path. You don't, you don't strive to just arrive at dogma and, and belief and just accept. You pursue the truth through true investigative processes until you arrive at it. And it is knowable. It's discoverable. It's knowable. The, the creator of the universe didn't make the universe to tantalize us with its unknowability. You know, I, I, I can't believe how many people think we can't arrive at a basic understanding of things, about how things really work. Of course we can. It's just hard work to do that. So most people just give up and say, oh, I'll never understand that. Then they want to try to tell other people, you can never understand it. No, truth is knowable. It's not some impossible to reach objective. You know, the way things work in our reality can be discovered and known. It's just hard work to arrive at that. And that's what they're basically telling people, that you have to really put in the work. The main tenets of theosophy as taught by Blavatsky are the same tenets found in many other occult traditions. Chief among these is the belief of the presence of what Blavatsky called a divine spark within every person, which with the proper discipline and training can lead to spiritual illumination or enlightenment. Theosophy's adherents consider themselves searchers after truth, who are dissatisfied with the world and are dissenters of the creeds of organized religion. They just believe that as religious dogma taught to people to try to control their minds. Theosophists admit the existence of a god, but not necessarily of a personal god not of a, a humanistic God, right? To most theosophists, God is nature and spiritual law itself. 
It is the laws of creation that are operating all around us. That's God to the theosophist. It's, it's the law of nature. Blavatsky also taught that humanity has had many past incarnations or variations on Earth, which she called root races. This is a key concept here because Nazis really perverted this and, and distorted it. Root races were never meant to be understood as genetic races in theosophical teaching, but rather as different types of civilizations that attained different levels of consciousness. Blavatsky called the root race, which she claimed was destined to transcend materialist darkness and ascend into the light of knowledge and become enlightened as the Aryan race. So she used the term Aryan to describe the race that would eventually transcend materialism and truly become an enlightened species. I'm sorry, I have to step back there. The root word of the word, the root of the word Aryan is the word Ari in many different ancient languages. Ari, A-R-I, the basic uh, transliteration, regardless of what language we're talking about, means in various ancient languages, it translates to best, superior, godlike, sunlike, light, or enlightened. So Aryan did not mean those with blonde hair and blue eyes. Okay, In the context that Blavatsky was teaching in Theosophy, Aryan referred to an enlightened people, people who had gained an understanding about the human psyche and the laws of nature, the, the knowledge of the occult, and became enlightened, not those with light skin, hair, and eyes. A common misperception. Okay, The Nazis and their predecessors, who we're going to talk about, distorted this original meaning of Aryan taught in Theosophy into their idea of a genetically superior race of people. Okay, It has to be clearly kept in mind and understood <coughs> that the Nazis were distorting teachings of Theosophy. Blavatsky was not a racist. Blavatsky was teaching people about root races that <coughs> attained levels of consciousness. <coughs> the concept of root races was meant to be understood in alignment with what is known as the hermetic principle of rhythm, which explains that there is a cyclical quality or wave-like progression to time, which imparts lessons and influences consciousness to produce certain outcomes. Blavatsky taught, <coughs> pardon me, that if humanity is unable to raise their aggregate consciousness to a high enough level of awareness during the recurrence of such wave cycles of time, that humanity may then experience setbacks in their evolutionary progression as a species in the form of semi-extinction level events or cataclysms which necessitate a so-called reset of humanity from a subsequent root race. And again, that's what a lot of the dark occultists want to do right now, and they're calling it the Great Reset. But they want to initiate the reset of humanity. They don't want nature or the Creator to initiate the reset. They want to be the initiators of it. And that's why many of them are calling what they want to institute, that, uh, that their agenda, the Great Reset of humanity. So now we have to look at anthroposophy and the teachings of Rudolf Steiner who was one of the greatest occultists uh, of the 20th century. Uh, so again, a lot of people believe Steiner influenced the Nazi ideology, and I don't see it that way at all. I see it also as they perverted Steiner's teachings, especially his teachings of Rosicrucianism and Anthroposophy. Anthroposophy comes from the Greek nouns anthropos, meaning human, and sophos, meaning wisdom. So again, whereas Blavatsky taught the wisdom of the divine, uh, Steiner looked at it in a more human term and said, this is the uh, ancient teachings of human wisdom throughout the centuries. Okay, So it means wisdom of humanity, anthroposophy. It is a body of spiritual teaching developed in the early 20th century by Austrian occultist Rudolf Steiner. And I'll tell you what, if you're not familiar with Steiner's writings, you should become familiar with them because he is one of the greatest occultists of all time. 
uh, especially in the realm of Rosic Rosicrucianism. He really defined the, the hallmarks of Rosicrucian philosophy. Anthroposophy postulates the existence of an objective and intellectually comprehensible spiritual reality which is accessible to the human experience. Okay, think about that for a minute. It's exactly what I was just saying. The universe did not create everything to say, the creator didn't put all the laws of the universe into effect to say, you can never know what's going on here. It's, it'll be an eternal mystery forever and ever the end. We're not in some kind of a torture chamber uh, where uh, everything is unknowable. It's just, it's hard work to know how it really works and you gotta, you gotta really strive for that. You gotta make it your, your objective in life, right? That's what the occult trains you and teaches you to do. If it's done right and if it's in the, the, the correct um, motivation and drive of the teachers of it, that's ultimately what all occult schools and mystery traditions have attempted to do. So, <clears throat> He postulates the existence of an objective and intellectually comprehensible reality, okay, which is accessible to human experience. Through anthroposophy, an individual grows spiritually by applying their abilities to develop clear thinking and truthful perception of the world. So the idea of this tradition of occultism is we must work to align our perception to reality. Perception is not the objective reality, but it is the human being's work to try to discipline their mind and their thoughts to the extent that they can align their own perceptions to the objective reality. Brilliant. And uh, again, you just have to read Steiner to understand his, his thinking. Through anthroposophy, an individual grows, oh, I read that line, here we go. It is seen by its adherents, anthroposophy, as a path to higher moral conduct. Again, the goal of it is to understand natural law and objective morality, eventually leading to higher insight into the workings of the spiritual realm. During his life, Rudolf Steiner fiercely advocated for universal education and self-improvement as a pathway to positive social change. He did not want to see it done through violence and force and coercion. He wanted to see it done through educational outreach. He was one of the most influential teachers of the occult tradition of Rosicrucianism. And uh, one of Steiner's core teachings was that social improvement and the individual Inner development and individual inner development must go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Okay? If you want to see society improve in the external sense, the individuals that comprise the society have to improve individually internally. And that's absolutely true. He initiated educational, social, and artistic movements that still flourish around the world today, including Waldorf education biodynamic agriculture, and anthroposophical medicine and architecture. And again, the Nazis twisted a lot of Steiner's uh, writings and philosophy to suit their means and their ends. One of the things that did mostly directly lead to the creation of Nazi ideology was what is known as the Volkisch movement. The Volkisch movement was a German ethno-nationalist movement active from the late 19th century all the way through to the Nazi era. And this is something a lot of people probably don't know about or haven't studied much except people who really have delved into the, the origins of Nazism. Erected upon the ideas of blood and soil or genetics and land and uh, Volkskörper the ethnic body of a people. The Volkisch movement was characterized by racism, romantic nationalism, and anti-Semitism from the early 1900s onward. Throughout its entire history, the Volkisch movement contained many dark occultists who twisted the philosophies of theosophy and anthroposophy into their own distorted ideologies of control conquest, racism, and genocide. From its very inception, members of the Volkisch movement 
generally considered Jews to be a quote unquote alien people who belong to a different race from Germans. Okay, so this is one of the places that this fomented in the popular culture of the day. Okay, and then the Nazis seized upon this. The common belief of all Volkish movement adherents is the idea of a national rebirth inspired by the traditions of the ancient Germans. So again, they, they predicated their beliefs upon ancient Germanic paganism and thought that German society in general, uh, pan-Germanism throughout the whole region of Europe, was uh, in a state of degradation and they wanted to see it rise and come up and have a national rebirth as a culture. So um, the Volkisch movement had been reconstructed on a romantic basis by the guiding occultists of this movement. The adjective Volkisch is derived from the German word Volk, Volk meaning nation, race, or tribe. While Volkisch has no direct English equivalent, it could be loosely translated as ethno-nationalist, or closer to its original meaning as biomystical racialist. Okay, so biomystical racism is what the Volkisch movement was about. It's incorporating occult and mystical beliefs into racist ideology. Emphasizing, uh, again, uh, the, the closest translation is biomystical racialist as an adjective. And that emphasizes the words occult foundations. According to the historian Nicholas Goodrick Clark, who I absolutely have to give credit to much of this research, if you want to look at one person that I think really expounded on these topics better than any other historian, it's Nicholas Goodrick Clark. So definitely check out his work, it's brilliant, okay? According to Goodrich Clark, the Volkish movement was not a unified movement, but rather, quote, a cauldron of beliefs, fears, and hopes that found expression in various movements and were often articulated in an emotional tone. So this was not led by reason and logic. This was led by a people whose who did not have a firm foundation in their own spirituality and took a very emotional approach to uh, reviving their culture, which is what the long-term goal of it was, but they just went about it in a completely distorted and twisted way. The Volkisch movement was inspired as early as 1853 by French aristocrat and racialist author Arthur de Gobineau who had written an essay on the inequality of races in which he had made claims for the superiority of the Nordic Aryan race and warned of its eventual submergence by non-Aryans. This notion, along with the ideas about the biological struggle of social Darwinism, again, a foundational tenet of Satanism, was taken up at the turn of the 20th century by Volkish propagandists who claimed that Germans could defend their race and culture only by remaining, quote, racially pure. So again, this is one of the uh, ideologues, occultists, if you will, who most people have never heard about, drove the very beginnings of the Nazi ideology. Volkisch nationalists and pan-Germanists found further inspiration of the work of Ernst Haeckel, who founded the Monist League in 1906 to spread his racist interpretation of social Darwinism. So you're going to see the same ideologies over and over and over. Okay? In 1900, Heichel's colleague, uh, Wilhelm Bolsch, had written a book entitled From the Bacillus to the Ape Man, in which he described the, quote, naked struggle for dominance between man and the lowest forms of organic life. This, quote, struggle for dominance, again, social Darwinistic theory, was to have a profound effect upon the development of German anti-Semitism in the early years of the 20th century. Again, we're seeing the very foundations laid as a product of the Volkisch movement. One of the main concepts within Volkisch theory was blood and soil. Again, this was taken up by the Nazis themselves. 
in German, Blut und Boden. And I'll do my best with the German pronunciations. I do not speak a second language other than English, but I will attempt to do my best with accurate pronunciations. I don't know how close I will get, but I, I will make the effort. Uh, so Blood on Soil was a concept and slogan which expressed the Volkish movement's idea of a racially defined national body, blood, united with a geographic settlement area, land for living space, soil. Through the concept of Blood and Soil, many Volkish proponents idealized rural and farm life as being preferable to urban living. The German expression Blood and Soil was originally coined in the late 19th century in Volkish writings espousing racialism and romantic nationalism. It produced much regionalist literature whose romantic attachment was widespread prior to the rise of the Nazis. I'm sorry. Blood and Soil later became a key slogan of Nazi ideology. The next concept to understand that widely influenced Nazi ideology was Lebensraum. Tied tightly to the idea of blood and soil was the German concept of Lebensraum or living space. The belief that the German people were destined to expand into Eastern Europe and beyond. The geopolitical use of the term Lebensraum is credited to Karl Haushofer, on which we'll look at more later. We'll definitely look at Haushofer later, who viewed it as a means to avenge Germany's military defeat in World War I and reverse the dictates of the Versailles Treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, which reduced Germany geographically, economically, and militarily after World War I. So Lebensraum was the idea that there would be pan-Germanism throughout Eastern Europe, you know, all the way through toward uh, the territory that was the Russian Empire at the time. During Hitler's rise to political power, he claimed that the inevitable expansion of Lebensraum realm would reverse overpopulation, provide natural resources for Germany, and uphold German national honor. Nazi usage of the term Lebensraum was explicitly racial, used to justify the mystical right of the Aryan race to fulfill their cultural destiny at the expense of those they viewed as, quote, racially inferior, such as the Slavs of Poland, Russia, Ukraine, and the other non-Germanic peoples of the East. One of the early ideologues that really paved the way for Nazi ideology and thought was Houston Stuart Chamberlain. He was a British German author who promoted German ethno nationalism, anti Semitism, and quote, scientific racism. His best known work, a two volume book called The Foundations of the 19th Century, was published in 1899 and became highly influential in the pan Germanic Volkish movements of the early 20th century. Chamberlain's work would later influence the anti Semitism and racial policies of the Nazi Third Reich. Chamberlain has been referred to as Hitler's John the Baptist. Okay, so if Hitler is the Nazi Jesus, Chamberlain was his John the Baptist. He paved the way for his coming, okay, with his racial theories. Again, these are the ideologues, these are the occultists, these are the people who really gave the underlying ideology a discrete, concrete form for the Nazis that came after them. Chamberlain was one of the forefathers of Aryanism, the ideology of racial supremacy, which views the, quote, Aryan race as a distinct and superior racial group, which is entitled to rule the rest of humanity. Okay? The ideology of Nazism was based upon the conception of the ancient, Aryan race being a superior race or Gottmenschen, Godmen. They, and again, go back to Satanism. Ego is first. We come first. You'll see this theme over and over and over and over again. We are the gods. And then they will begin acting like it. Okay? So if you put the ego in the position of apotheosis, only terror, horror, and destruction is going to follow in its wake. Okay? 
The ideology of uh, Nazism was driven by this concept of uh, an Aryan superior race, Gottmenschen, Godmen, holding the highest position in the human racial hierarchy. The idea of Gottmenschen was the precursor to Adolf Hitler's notion of the Herrenvolk, the master race that we hear so much about when it comes to Nazism. Uh, it, uh, in direct uh, correspondence with uh, Chamberlain's view of Gottmenschen was the Untermenschen, or subhumans. This was the term within the ideology of Arianism for non-Aryan people who were deemed as racially and genetically inferior. The Untermenschen were often referred to as the masses from the East, including Jews, Romani, uh, Slavs, Poles, Ukrainians, Serbs, Russians, and those of African descent. During the Nazi regime, these people were scheduled either to become slaves of the Nazis, and I have some direct quotes by prominent Nazis to that effect, or to be exterminated altogether. According to the Generalplan Ost, the master plan for the East developed by the Nazis, the Slavic population of Central and Eastern Europe was to be reduced through mass murder, with a majority of them expelled to Asia and used as slave labor for the Third Reich. Let's get into one of the most very deeply embedded and deeply responsible occultists that really paved the underlying ideology of Nazism, and that was Guido von Liszt. Absolutely one of the dark occultists. And again, most of these names nobody will ever have heard of. Some may know von Liszt, he was more popular than some others, but almost entirely, I can almost guarantee, most people will not have heard of any of the names and groups that I'm gonna talk about with the exception of one which we all know probably what that is, which I'll get into later. But um, uh, most of these names are going to be obscure. Okay? Guido von Liszt was an Austrian occultist who founded a Germanic pagan religious movement known as Wotanism, named after the Germanic pagan god Woden, the Norse god Odin. It's the same god, just different naming convention in different traditions throughout Europe. Liszt abandoned his family's Roman Catholic faith in childhood and devoted himself to the pre-Christian god Wotan. Liszt claimed that Wotanism was the revival of the religion of the ancient Germanic Aryan root race. Wotanism, the exoteric form of Liszt's religion, included a set of esoteric teachings of Ariosophy, which Liszt termed Armanism. Okay, so again, you have this outer shell that's going to be taught to the average person as a religion. Then you have the inner core esoteric traditions that are going to be taught to the priest class of the religion. Always separating into the two classes to keep some people ignorant and some people in the know. Okay, so Liszt's exoteric version was Wotanism and his esoteric version was Armanism. In 1877, Liszt began a career as a journalist, writing articles for national newspapers and magazines in which he significantly influenced the early Volkisch movement. During the 1890s, his works began taking on an extremely anti-Semitic aspect, and he involved himself in Austria's pan-German nationalist movement, which sought the integration of Austria into the German Empire. In the early 1900s, Liszt became increasingly interested in occultism, specifically theosophy, which he distorted into an expansion of his belief system, Wotanism. In 1902, he invented a new variation of the Nordic ruins, which he called the Armanen ruins, or what has now been become known as the Armanen Futark. Okay, and I'm using the ancient spelling here of the Futark runic system. Some people disagree with this spelling, but this is the, this is the true way that the Futark is supposed to be spelled. The popularity of Liszt's work among the German Volkisch movement resulted in the establishment of the Guido von Liszt Society. So this is one of the secret societies 
dedicated to the racist and volkish teachings of von Liszt as an occultist. Okay, uh, the the word Geschalschaft or Gesellschaft means society or secret society in German. So the von Liszt Geschalschaft uh, was created in 1908, which published Liszt's writings and included an Ariosophist inner occult society. So once again, he's splitting the, vo the Wotanic or Wotanic religion into esoteric and exoteric. The inner core is the esoteric order. And this Ariosophist inner occult society he called the High Armanen Orden. Uh, sorry, the High Armanen Order, which List founded in 1911 and presided over as Grand Master. Many influential German and Austrian occultists became members of the Guido von List Society in the early 20th century. He was one of the leading and guiding dark occultists that paved the way to the, the Nazi Third Reich. List promoted the millenarian worldview that modern society was degenerate, but that it would be cleansed through the establishment of the new pan-German empire. Liszt's New World Order that would embrace Wotanism. He influenced later Volkish groups such as the Reichshammerbund and the Germanen Orden, again, secret societies that most people have never heard of. And through those organizations, Liszt exerted a significant influence on bur both the burgeoning Nazi party and the SS, the Schutzstaffel, uh, and again, more on them later. List viewed his religion, Wotanism, as the exoteric outer form of the pre-Christian Germanic religion, while Armanism was the term he applied to what he believed were the esoteric secret teachings of this ancient belief system. List believed that while Wotanism expounded polytheism for the wider population, in other words, the worship of multiple gods, those who were members of the Armanist priest class, the esoteric order, were fully aware of the reality of monotheism, the idea that there is one creator of the universe. List's Armonism would later be classified as a form of Ariosophy, the wisdom of the Arians, a term which was coined by Jörg Lance von Lebenfels in 1915. List believed that ancient German society had been led by a hierarchical system of initiates called the Armanenschaft, an ancient brotherhood with a hierarchy of three degrees, similar to the Blue Lodge degrees of Freemasonry. And again, we're, we're going to constantly see the theme where it takes an occult tradition and it bastardizes it, it uh, twists and distorts and perverts it, and uses the same basic uh, trappings and, and, and ways of, of working through the population and d distorting it into their own for their own purposes. And again, von List did this and, and many other uh, pre-Nazi dark occultists did this with the system of Freemasonry as well. Von List believed that the Armanenschaft had societal control over the ancient German people acting as teachers, priests, and judges. This generally saw the world in which he was living as one of degeneration. Adopting a millenarianist perspective, he believed in the imminent defeat of this enemy and the establishment of a better future for the Ario-Germanic race. For List, this better future would be intricately connected to the ancient past, reflecting his belief in the cyclical nature of time. Again something taught in theosophy, but he's distorting it for his purposes. Something which he had adopted from both his reading of Norse mythology and from theosophy. Reflecting his beliefs that monarchy, kingship, was the preferred form of government by which humanity should be ruled, List envisioned a future worldwide monarchical state governed by the House of Habsburg. And again, if you really want to try to understand, in, in my research of all of this, I couldn't believe how many sick, 
twisted, distorted ideologies were coming out of Germany, especially all of these ideologies came out of Germany. When we get to, to socialism and, and Marxism and communism, it all came out of Germany, all of it, okay? This is because the House of Habsburg was one of the biggest royal dynasties coming out of the ancient Holy Roman Empire and then going way back into the ancient past into dynastic kingship long before even the Holy Roman Empire. And if you really want to trace all of this sick, distorted ide ideology, you have to look into the House of Habsburg and other ancient royal dynasties because this is all, th th these people are their, their progeny, okay? They came after them and they even refined their uh, psychopathology. So List believed, believes that there was going to be a resurgence of the House of Habsburg with a revived system of feudalism. Now keep that in mind because both of the, the Nazi and communist ideologies are forms of what I call neo-feudalism. We're going to talk about that later and what it is. But he wanted a new system of feudalism from the ancient uh, you know, dynasties of kingship to be reintroduced into German society, you know? I mean, talk about authoritarianism and collectivism. In List's opinion, this new empire would be extremely hierarchical, with non-Aryans being subjugated under the Aryan population, a system of masters and slaves, and opportunities for education and jobs in public service being restricted to those deemed racially pure. List envisioned this empire following the Wotanic religion, which he promoted. Prominent members of the Guido von List society including, included many influential German occultists of the day, including Frederick Waniak, Philip Stauff, Eberhard von Brockusen, Karl Helwig, George Hauerstein, and Bernard Kerner some of whom were also founding members of the Reichshammerbund and Germanenorden occult societies. More on those later. Through the Germanenorden's Munich offshift, uh, offshoot, the Tool Society, a lineage can be drawn directly between the List Society and the early Nazi party as it was established after World War I. Some historical scholars contend that List's vision of a future German empire constituted a direct blueprint for the coming Nazi regime. This is how influential this one man was. And this is how influential dark occultists ultimately are in human society throughout time. The next big dark occultist that paved the way for Nazism and its rise to power was Jörg Lanz von Lebenfels. And again, I'm not even going to ask for a, a raising of hands, how many people know about any of these people. It's almost certain most people have never heard of these people. Jörg Lanz von Lebenfels was an Austrian occultist, a political theorist, and a pioneer of occult, the occult ideologies of Ariosophy and theozoology. Again, most people have probably never heard of those ideologies. He was a former monk of the Catholic Cistercian Order and the founder of the magazine Ostara, in which he published anti-Semitic and Volkish theories. On Christmas of the year 1900, von Lebenfels founded the occult secret society called Ordo Novi Templi, which means the order of the new Templars. So this is about the, the ancient uh, knight society of the Templar knights, but Lebenfels felt that he was bringing about a resurrection of the Templars, and thus he called it the new Templar society. Uh, an occult order that was dedicated to bringing fascist extremists together and mobilizing them in favor of national socialism in Germany. In 1905, Lebenfels published a book called Theozoology, in which he advocated sterilization and forced labor of the lower races and glorified the Aryan race as Gottmenschen or Godmen. Through his ideology or religion called Theozoology, Lebenfels distorted occult, spiritual, and even biblical teachings to justify his esoteric racial ideology. 
He taught that the biblical Eve had procreated with demons to give birth to what he described as lower races. In 1905, Labenfels founded the magazine Ostara, a magazine through which he promoted Ariosophy and Theozoology. Labenfels claimed that Ostara had over 100,000 subscribers, including Adolf Hitler himself. Labenfels claimed that he was visited by Hitler in 1909 and supplied Hitler with two missing copies of Ostara that Hitler did not have in his collection. In 1915, Labenfels began using the term Ariosophy to describe his esoteric doctrines, again, distorting theosophy and anthroposophy. Uh, theosophy meaning the divine wisdom, anthroposophy meaning human wisdom. Now, this is the wisdom of the Arians. Okay? The word Ariosophy translates to wisdom of the Arians. Ariosophy is generally used to describe the Arian esoteric theories, which constituted a subset of the Volkish movement. While both Labenfels and Guido von Liszt consider themselves Ariosophists, Liszt called his esoteric doctrine Armonism, while Labenfels used the terms Theozoology and Ario-Christianity, since he was formerly a Christian monk, prior to World War I. Labenfels' Occult Secret Society, which he established on Christmas 1900, was called Ordo Novi Templi, the Order of the New Templars. Ordo Novi Templi used esotericism to justify violence, such as the castration of those they deemed racially inferior to establish a fascist state. It was modeled, Ordo Novi Templi, was modeled after the Catholic military order of the Knights Templar, and similar in its hierarchical structure to the order of Cistercians, of which Labenfels himself had been a former member. That's, that was one of its, uh, they were one of the earliest groups to use the swastika, by the way, along with the uh, Reich Hammerbund. Okay, so that's one of their insignias there. Influenced by Labenfels Ariosophy, the Austrian industrialist Johann Waltari Wolfel founded an occult society called Lumen Club. Some of these organizations are so secretive, they had no insignias or logos. Okay, so again, Wolfel and Lumen Club, you're, you're not going to find their insignias. They were just completely underground secretive orders. He founded Lumen Club in Vienna, Austria on November 11th, 1932. Lumen Club overlapped in membership with Ordo Novi Templi. Its ideological sympathy toward Nazism was beyond question, and it acted as a growth center for the Nazi party, again in the 1930s, which had already been previously banned in the country of Austria. Lumen Club and Ordo Novi Templi were both later suppressed by the Gestapo under the Nazi regime, a fate which they shared with many other esoteric groups. Now here I want to pause and explain something. The dark occult has a tradition of using people as tools to further their agendas. And when the people who they've already used as tools are finished fulfilling their job, they take them and they throw them under the bus. They throw them out like a rusty or dull tool when it's done being used for whatever purpose it's being used for. Uh, a gentleman whose work you should all become familiar with, if you're not already, is Jay Parker, a friend of mine who was also in uh, the, the world of the dark occult and much higher in it than myself because he was born into it. Okay, I just got a peek behind the curtain. He lived at his most of his childhood. Okay, his whole childhood, really. And he will tell you, all the dark occultists do, at the highest levels, is they'll take their rank and file members, they'll use them for whatever they can get out of them, and then they'll use them as scapegoats and throw them under the bus. And you're going to see that over and over and over again today as we go through this, okay? So keep that in mind. 
After Hitler's rise to prominence in the 1920s, Lebenfels tried to be recognized as one of his ideological precursors, and he absolutely was. It is, well, it is known historically that Hitler read Ostara and collected it. Okay, So he definitely took ideas from Lebenfels and von Liszt. Okay? In the preface of issue number one of the third series of Ostara magazine, Lebenfels wrote, one shall remember that the swastika and fascist movements are basically offsprings of Ostara as a movement and as a propaganda tool. After Austria was annexed by Germany in 1938, Lebenfels hoped for Hitler's patronage, but Hitler banned him from publishing his writings, and copies of Ostara were then removed from circulation. After the war, Lebenfels accused Hitler of having not only stolen, but corrupted his ideas, and also he accused him of being quote, inferior racial stock, because Lebenfels probably learned that Hitler had Jewish blood and was of Jewish descent, namely from the House of Rothschild. Hitler never mentioned Lebenfels in any recorded conversation, speech, or document, even though he was clearly one of his ideological precursors. The next occultist to uh, look into is Theodor Fritsch, who uh, was very instrumental in the founding of the Reich Hammerbund and Germanen Orden secret societies. Theodor Fritsch was a German publisher and journalist. His anti-Semitic writings heavily influenced popular German opinion against Jews in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Fritsch was a believer in the absolute superiority of the Aryan race. His opinion was radicalized by the changes brought on by rapid industrialization and urbanization of the Second Industrial Revolution. Fritsch called for a return to the traditional values and customs of the past, which he believe, believed exemplified the, exist, the essence of the German people. In 1893, Fritsch published one of his most famous works, The Handbook of the Jewish Question which leveled a number of conspiratorial charges at European Jews and called, upon, and called upon Germans to refrain from intermingling with them. The book was read by millions of Volkish movement sympathizers. The ideas espoused by Fritsch's work greatly influenced Adolf Hitler and the Nazis during their rise to power after World War I. In 1902, Fritsch founded an anti-Semitic journal called The Hammer, which became the basis of the Reichshammerbund Society in 1912. The Reichshammerbund, meaning the Reichshammer League, was founded by Theodor Fritsch in 1912 as an anti-Semitic collective movement. The founding document for the Reichshammerbund had been Willibald Henschel's 1901 book called Varuna, which preached racial purity and anti-Semitism. The aim of the group was to coordinate the activities of the many small anti-Semitic organizations active at the time and to bring as many of these groups as possible under the banner of the Reichshammerbund. The battle sign of the Reichshammerbund was the swastika, making it one of the first organized Volkish movements to use the symbol of the swastika. In 1912, Fritsch also established the secret society known as the Germanen Orden, or the German Order. The Germanen Orden was a clandestine or occult group for leading members of society who wished to work in secret rather than the Reichshammerbund, which operated more in the open. See, this is for the people who considered themselves more of the, uh, you know, the, the higher uh, echelon of society that didn't want themselves to be seen as operating in such uh, overt racist or volkish circles, and they wanted to keep it as an occult society, hidden from the, the general public. So the Germanen Orden was the esoteric or occult, and the Reichshammerbund was the exoteric or operating out in the open. 
members of both the Reichshammerbund and the Germanenorden formed the Tool Society in 1918, which eventually sponsored the creation of the Nazi Party. So these are two basically secret societies, and they were obviously influenced by earlier ones of von List and, and von Lebenfels, and then members of them came together and formed the Tool Society, and there you have the actual creation of the Nazi Party through the Tool Society, which we'll, we'll get to. So the next dark occultist and group you have to look at is Rudolf von Sabatendorf and the Tool Society. Sabatendorf was a German occultist, writer, intelligence agent, and political activist. He was the founding member of the Tool Society, a post-World War I German occult organization in which he played a key role and influenced many members of the Nazi party. Sabatendorf was also a Freemason of the clandestine rites of Memphis and Mizraim, so not traditional organized Freemasonry, but what, what one would call clandestine rites of Freemasonry or occult rites. And he was also a Sufi, uh, which is basically mystical Islamic beliefs and practices of the Bektashi order. In 1916, Sabatendorf came into contact with the Germanen Orden, Fritsch's society, and was subsequently appointed the Ordensmeister, the group leader, for its Bavarian Schism faction, the Germanen Orden Valvater of the Holy Grail. Settling in Munich, Sabatendorf established an occult order known as the Tool Society in 1918 with fellow occultist Walter Nauhaus. The Tool Society quickly became an increasingly influential behind the scenes force of German politics. The Tool Society was the rallying organization, the rallying occult society for the Nazi Party, or, and the predecessor of the Nazi Party, the German Workers' Party. In classical literature and cartography, the word Tool represented the northernmost regions of Earth. So literally what Tool Society means is the Society of the North, the northern regions. The term Ultima Tool acquired the mystical notion of any distant place located, quote, beyond the borders of the known world. So we're talking about Arctic regions. And again, you see the use of the swastika in the Tool Society's logo slash insignia. The occultist Anton Drexler, who had developed links between the Tool Society and various extremist workers' organizations in Munich, Germany, together with the Tool Society's Karl Hauer, went on to establish the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, DAP, or in English, the German Workers' Party, on January 5, 1919. This party was joined in September 1919 by Adolf Hitler, who transformed it into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the NSDAP, or the Nazi Party. So the Nazi Party came directly out of the German Workers' Party, which itself came directly out of the Occult Tool Society. Direct lineage. Sabatendorf was also the owner of the Volkischer Beobachter, the Volkisch Observer newspaper, which the Nazi Party purchased in December of 1920. In 1921, Adolf Hitler acquired all the shares of the company, making him the sole owner of the publication. This newspaper was to become Hitler's most important propaganda tool in his rise to power, and subsequently. In January 1933, Sabatendorf published, Before Hitler Came, documents from the early days of the National Socialist Movement, a collection of writings dealing with the Tool Society and the early days of the German Workers' Party. In other words, the lineage of how it all got started, how, how, how he got the ball rolling in National Socialism. Hitler disliked this book. Again, he wanted all the credit. 
He didn't want people even knowing that these descended from occult orders and secret societies. You know, that's why they banned all other occultists. They wanted to be the only occult game in town. Sabatendorf was arrested by the Nazis, but somehow was able to escape Germany and flee to Turkey, presumably due to a friendship from his days in Munich and with the Tool Society. It is believed by some researchers that Sabatendorf committed suicide by jumping into the Bosphorus Strait near Istanbul, Turkey on May 8, 1945. And again, this is another thing you're going to see over and over again. Suicide is a common theme. Once they get thrown under the bus, they either get killed or they off themselves. This is the ruthlessness of the dark occult. And again, directly shown by the ideologies of egotism, moral relativism, and social Darwinism. The next occult society that paved the way for the coming of the Nazis was the Edda Society. Again, largely unknown, certainly more uh, occult-oriented and uh, esoteric. Guido von List and his followers believed that the Icelandic Eddas were chronicles of the ancient Aryans. List's occult system was elaborated by Rudolf John Gerlsleben. After World War I, Gerlsleben traveled to Munich, where he became involved in the Tool Society and German politics. Through his periodical Aryan Freedom, Gerlsleben uh, disseminated his occult raci racist ideas, which centered upon the concept of racial purity and the reactivation of the occult powers that every Aryan possessed, which had become, but which had become atrophied. With these magical powers once more at their fullest, the Aryans would hold complete sway over the processes of nature and would thus be in a position to dominate and rule the world. Again, th this is sick, distorted religion. And this is all politics is. It's just, it's, politics is just the child of religion like this, of occult ideas like this. That's all it is. With regard to the Eddas, Gerlsleben believed that the Scandinavian ruins contained an inherent magical power that provided those who understood their significance with a spiritual conduit through which could flow the force that drives the universe itself. And again, many Germanic occultists referred to this as Vril. In November 1925, Gerlsleben founded the Edda Society in Bavaria, Germany. The treasurer of the society was Frederick Schaefer, a close associate of Karl Maria Villegut, who we're going to talk about a lot more later because he was one of the driving occultists of the Third Reich, an occultist who would come to exert great influence upon Heinrich Himmler, the future head of the Nazi SS, or Schutzstaffel, the protection squadron of Hitler. When Gerlsleben died in 1930, the Edda Society was taken over by Verno von, Werner von Bülow, who had designed what he called the World Ruin Clock, which illustrated the correspondences between the ruins, the zodiac, numbers, and gods. Although the primary intention of the Edda Society was to conduct research into the ancient Aryan religion through interpretation of the ruins, it declared its allegiance to Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in 1933, stating that, quote, the rise of Nazism was occurring in accordance with universal laws. Okay, talk about dark occultism. And uh, they would not have obviously used the term Nazism, they would have used the term National Socialism. So that's, a, that's a, an approximation of the, of the quote. And there's a, a a um, depiction of the ruin clock that uh, uh, Werner Bülow created in the Edda Society. So let's take a look at the German Workers' Party, which, as we've already seen, came out of the Tool Society. In 1918, uh, Rudolf von Sabatendorf wished to extend the influence of the Tool Society to the working classes of Germany. He asked journalist Karl Harrer to form a workers' ring, as they called it. Harrer and fellow, fellow Tool Society member 
Anton Drexler, formed the Political Workers Circle. The group met every week throughout the winter of 1918 for discussions about nationalism and anti-Semitism. At the instigation of Anton Drexler, this workers' ring became the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the German Workers' Party, or DAP, on January 5, 1919. There's Anton Drexler, uh, one of the uh, founding members of the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. These were the four most influential founders of what eventually became the Nazi Party. And it looked innocuous at the time. This was its logo. Uh, the Do Deutsche Arbeiterpartei simply means German Workers' Party. Okay, And Drexler, Harrer, Dietrich Eckhart, and Gottfried Feder were the, the founders of it. Uh, let's talk about now Dietrich Eckhart. Dietrich Eckhart was a German Volkish journalist and political activist who was one of the founding members of the German Workers' Party. Eckhart was a key influence on Adolf Hitler in the early years of the Nazi Party. He was a participant in the failed Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, the first time Hitler tried to take over Germany, and died on December 26th of that year, shortly after his release from Landsberg Prison, which Hitler also went to after the failed coup d'etat. Eckhart was elevated to the status of a major thinker in the Nazi Third Reich upon the establishment of Nazi Germany in 1933 and was acknowledged by Hitler to be, quote, the spiritual co-founder of Nazism, or again, he would have said National Socialism, and a guiding light of the early National Socialist movement. So again, these are the ideologues, these are the occultists, these are the, the, the thinkers that actually paved the way for what the Nazis did. They're, they're the ones who formulated the ideology. In July of, now, now we're going to see Hitler come onto the scene and make his rise to power and how that was done. In July of 1919, Adolf Hitler was sent as an intelligence agent of the German army to infiltrate the newly formed Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, DAP, German Workers' Party, and monitor its activities. So Hitler was originally a spy that was spying on for the German military what became the Nazi party. And then he eventually joined it. He eventually realized, hey, I could take this over with, with the help of some of the occultists, and I could become, I could run this whole thing. I could run the whole country. You know, forget being a spy for the military, I'll eventually seize military power. Hitler quickly made an impression on the other DAP members, and again, definitely its leadership who were the occultists with his oratory abilities. And um, if you really study that dynamic, Hitler didn't have very formulated oratory abilities. He was known as a flat speaker when he first began public speaking. He was trained by occultists in neuro-linguistic programming techniques, more on that later, to become an effective public speaker. The DAP's chairman, Anton Drexler, was impressed with Hitler and encouraged him to join the DAP. On the orders of his army superiors, Hitler applied to join the party because they wanted him to further infiltrate it. He was accepted into the DAP in September of 1919. Hitler initially wanted to form his own political party, but was convinced to join the DAP because it was small and he thought he could eventually become its leader. He consequently encouraged the DAP to become less of a debating society, which it had been previously, and more of an active political party. The small number of party members were quickly won over to Hitler's political beliefs. With the support of Anton Drexler, Hitler became the chief of propaganda for the German Workers' Party in, the, in early 1920. In February of 1920, Hitler, along with Anton Drexler and Gottfried Feder, drafted a 25-point manifesto which summed up the German Workers' Party's political views, including an expansionist foreign policy, again, Lebensraum, 
the nullification of the Treaty of Versailles, which they saw as keeping Germany in an inferior position, uh, you know, politically and militarily in Europe, uh, and uh, oh, the creation of a greater Germany. Again, that's pan-Germanism, and exclusion of Jews from German citizenship. Okay, so more of the racial ideology of the Volkisch movement taken into the political realm. On February 24th, 1920, Hitler revealed that the DAP's new manifesto, revealed the DAP's new manifesto in a speech at a DAP rally in Munich to over 2,000 people. On the same day, the DAP was officially renamed the National Socialist German Workers' Party. I'll do my best to pronounce it. Uh, National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or NSDAP, I think I did that pretty well, in an attempt to make the party more broadly appealing to larger segments of the population. The name was intended to draw upon both left-wing and right-wing ideals, with socialist and workers appealing to the left, and national and German appealing to the right. See, playing the polarization dialectics, incorporating them both, taking both so-called wings of politics to the same place. It's an ancient strategy and people still haven't figured it out. <laughs> this brings us to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or NSDAP. Shortly after its official formation on February 24, 1920, the National Socialist German Workers' Party announced that only persons of pure Aryan descent could become party members. Members of the NSDAP could not be related either directly or indirectly to a so-called non-Aryan. So now they're really, uh, you know, uh, strong-arming the whole racial aspect of this. Party members found guilty of racial defilement were persecuted heavily and some even sentenced to death when the party eventually took over Germany. That's, that was just for race mixing. Okay? Adolf Hitler quickly became the NSDAP's most active orator, which, with huge crowds flocking to hear him speak. Again, the occultists had already whipped them up into a fury with their former ideologies and organizations. And now the, the whole Volkisch movement was, was dominant in Germany. And they were, they were praying for a, quote, Germanic savior like Hitler to come along. Hitler soon became the party's most dominant political figure. The NSDAP continued to attract new members, gathering over 2,000 members in its first year. On May 20th, 1920, the symbol of the swastika, which was originally a symbol used by various ancient cultures throughout the world to represent good fortune and spirituality. Again, distorted. That's all the occultists know how to do. They never really create anything new. They just twist and distort what already exists to their own ends. So the swastika was formally adopted as the party emblem. In Volkish circles, the swastika was considered the symbol of the Aryan race. It's two Sigruns together. It represented the replacement of the symbol of the Christian cross with allegiance to the National Socialist State. In December 1920, the Nazi party had acquired a newspaper, the Volkische, the Volkische Observer, of which its leading ideologist, Alfred Rosenberg, became the editor. Others to join the Nazi party around this time were Heinrich Himmler and World War I flying ace Hermann Goering. On July 29, 1921, Adolf Hitler officially replaced Anton Drexler as party chairman and was granted absolute power in the Nazi party as its sole leader. Hitler soon acquired the title Führer, or leader, and it was accepted that the Nazi party would be governed by the Führer principle, meaning the leader principle. Again, hierarchy, chain of command, okay? The same principles of the occult structure of occult societies, organizations, and how they want our world ultimately organized. Under this principle, the party was a highly centralized entity. That's what all totalitarian regimes want, centralization of power. 
that utilized a strict top-down hierarchy with Hitler at the apex. In September 1921, the Sturmabteilung, the SA, also known as the Storm Battalion or Storm Detachment, the Stormtroopers, again, that's what really actually influenced the Stormtroopers of Star Wars, you know, also called the Brown Shirts. These were the Nazi Party's paramilitary. It was the Sturmabteilung was founded as a paramilitary wing of the Nazi Party and began violent attacks on other German political parties. They wanted to be the only game in town. In 1922, the NSDAP formed its official youth organization for children of party members called Jugendbund der NSDAP, the Youth League of the Nazi Party, which was a predecessor to the Hitler Jugend, uh, the Hitler Youth. Again, that was the SA's insignia, and here's a depiction of SA members marching through the streets uh, carrying the uh, swastika banners. On October 31st, 1922, the National Fascist Party came into power in Italy under the dictator Benito Mussolini. Hitler was inspired by Mussolini and the Italian fascists, and he began to adopt elements of their form of fascism for the Nazi party. Hitler borrowed their use of the straight-armed salute as the Nazi salute. When the fascists took control of Italy through their coup d'etat called the March on Rome, Hitler began planning his own coup d'etat less than a month later. By November 1923, Hitler had decided that the time was right for an attempt to overthrow the Weimar Republic and seize power in Munich. On the night of November 8, 1923, the Nazis used a patriotic rally in a Munich beer hall to launch an attempted putsch or coup d'etat. This so-called beer hall putsch failed within one day when German military commanders refused to support it. Hitler and a number of his supporters were arrested and tried for treason in March 1924. Hitler and some of his close associates were convicted, but given very lenient prison sentences. While he was in Landsberg prison, Hitler wrote his political manifesto called Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. The Nazi party was officially banned in Germany on November 9, 1923. However, it continued to operate under the name the German Party, or Deutsche Partei, or DP. And again, there's a, a, the cover of uh, a modern printing of Mein Kampf. Hitler was released from Landsberg Prison on December 20th, 1924. On February 16th, 1925, Hitler convinced German authorities to lift the ban on the Nazi party, and it was formally refounded on February 26th, 1925, with Hitler as its undisputed leader. It was at this time that Hitler began referring to himself as Der Führer, the leader. Nuremberg, Germany had remained a Nazi party stronghold during this time, so Hitler decided to hold the first Nuremberg rally there in 1927. The Nuremberg rallies soon became massive displays of Nazi paramilitary power and attracted many recruits to the party. By 1929, the NSDAP had 130,000 members, and I mean they gathered bigger than any modern football game in force, especially the members of the SA or Sturmabteilung. The Blutfahn or blood flag was the flag that was carried, and here we're going to start seeing some of the occult uh, inspired rituals, the religious uh, rituals and regalia of the Third Reich. The blood flag was the flag that was carried during the failed November Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, during which it became soaked in the blood of a fallen member of the Sturmabteilung. When the Munich police fired on the Nazis, the flag bearer Heinrich Traumbauer, Traumbauer was hit and dropped the banner. He dropped the flag. Andreas Bauer-Eidel, 
a member of the SA who was marching alongside the flag was killed and fell onto the flag, staining it with his blood. The bl hence it became known as the blood flag. The blood flag subsequently became one of the most revered objects. It was a revered religious relic of the Nazi party and an object of pseudo-religious ritual. All new Nazi flags needed to be, quote, consecrated in a ritualized manner by it being physically touched to the original blood flag. So here you see that ceremony being performed and then Hitler touching the, the new banner that had been created for the SA to the original blood flag. They incorporated all kinds of pseudo-religious rituals into all of their proceedings. And then it got really intense with the coming of the SS. Then it really became an occult order. And the whole, the whole Nazi uh, regime was really led by an inner occult order, as we're going to get to. During the Great Depression in the early 1930s, the German economy was beset with mass unemployment and widespread business failures. The Nazis blamed the crisis on Jewish financiers and the Bolsheviks, a position which resonated with wide sections of the German electorate. In the 1930 elections, the Nazis won 18% of the votes and became the second largest party in the Reichstag, or German parliament. By 1932, the Sturmabteilung had grown to 400,000 members. That's bigger than almost every country's army. And its street battles with other political paramilitaries reduced some German cities to combat zones. So before they even seized like, you know, actual political power through seizing the, the German government, their strong arm paramilitary was already killing people in the streets of Germany in a warfare-like fashion. And you know, this is where the United States is going to be headed uh, with the political polarization that exists here. Part of Hitler's appeal to a frightened and demoralized middle class was a promise to restore law and order. How many times do politicians promise that? And again, because of what his own people were doing. He created the problem, and then he tells people, you've got to give me power so I can restore law and order. It's one of the most ancient games in the book, you know? In the July 1932 Reichstag election, the Nazis won 37% of the vote and became the largest party in the German parliament by a wide margin. So you're seeing them become more and more and more popular with the German people. The German people voted for Hitler primarily because of his promises to revive the economy, restore German greatness, and save Germany from communism. Hitler was, again, two masks of the same face, playing off against each other just for complete control. They'll, they'll continue to do this for as long as the tactic works. They don't need to change the tactic because it works until the public wakes up to it that it's all nonsense and stops supporting either side this tactic will continue to work flawlessly. Hitler was appointed as Chancellor of Germany on January 30th, 1933. On February 27th, a fire broke out in the German parliamentary building, the Reichstag. Widely recognized as a false flag operation, this fire gave Hitler a pretext for suppressing his political opponents. And again, this is the same tactic. You create the problem, you blame it on your political opponents, and then you have the justification to go and seize more power, implement more control, hurt more people, etc. False flags have also constantly worked throughout the ages because the public is not psychologically sophisticated enough in mass to understand how this tactic works. So clearly the Nazis started this fire and said, oh, our political opponents did it. We got to go and hunt them all down and kill them. The Reichstag fire decree was issued the following day, which suspended most civil liberties within Germany because of this threat. Sound familiar after 9-11, you know? The NSDAP won the parliamentary election of March 5th with 44% of the votes. You see, they're going up and up and up in popularity. On March 23rd, the German parliament passed the Enabling Act, which gave the cabinet 
the right to enact laws without the consent of the parliament. In effect, the Enabling Act gave Hitler dictatorial powers because he was the head of the Nazi party. Now possessing virtually absolute power, the Nazis abolished all labor unions, banned all other political parties, and began imprisoning their political opponents, first at improvised camps, like at Dachau, then in full concentration camps. The law against the formation of political parties of July 14, 1933, legally established the Nazi party's political monopoly in Germany. Yes, legally. Everything the Nazis did was done through legal decree. It was all legal according to them. When asked in an interview in 1934 whether the Nazis were a right-wing party, as alleged by their political opponents, listen to Hitler's response. Hitler responded that Nazism was not exclusively for any class and indicated that it favored neither the left nor the right, but quote-unquote preserved pure elements from both camps. And he stated, quote, from the camp of Bourgeois tradition, meaning the our, uh, you know, aristocratic class or the, the, the moneyed class, it takes national resolve. And from the materialism of Marxist dogma, it takes living, creative socialism. So he is telling people out in the open it is a blending of these ideologies into his form of fascist political ideology. Very, very out in the open, blatant, and in people's face about it. And people would still say they're polarized opposites. From, Ju from June 30th to July 2nd, 1934, Hitler disempowered the SA, the Stormabteilung, through secretly coordinated assassinations of the SA's leadership. Here we have the example of the people who helped him attain his rise to power are getting thrown under the bus because that's what the dark occultists do. As soon as you're, they're done using you as a tool, ah, we're done with this tool. Out it goes into the garbage dump of history. We're going to assassinate them. We're going to implement some new people who don't have any of the historic hindsight of how this all happened. And they bring young idiots in to keep doing what the old idiots did. They don't need the old idiots anymore. Now they got young dupes in their place. Okay? So <clears throat> this operation was known as the Night of the Long Knives. Hitler accused the leader of the SA, Ernst Röhm, of conspiring to stage a coup d'etat. But this was simply a pretense to justify the suppression of any intra-party opposition. He didn't want people that already had some physical paramilitaristic power engaging a coup later on. So that's what the Night of the Long Knives was all about. The executions under the Night of the Long Knives were carried out by the Schutzstaffel, the SS, Hitler's personal protection squadron, led by the Reichsfuhrer SS, or Reich's leader of the SS, Heinrich Himmler and assisted by the Nazis' Gestapo secret police force and members of the Reichswehr, the German armed forces. After the Night of the Long Knives, the SA continued to exist, but lost much of its importance, while the role of the SS grew significantly. Formerly only a suborganization of the SA, the Schutzstaffel was made into a separate organization of the National Socialist German Workers' Party in July of 1934. On August 2nd, 1934, Hitler merged the offices of party leader, head of state, and chief of government into one position, taking the title of Führer und Reichskanzler, Reichskanzler leader and Reich chancellor blurring the distinction between structures of party and state even further. Under Hitler's direct authority, the Schutzstaffel increasingly exerted police functions and the Seischer Heitsdienst, or SD, became the de facto intelligence agency of Nazi Germany. This would have been the equivalent of the CIA today. 
On September 1, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, beginning the conflict of World War II. Officially, Nazi Germany lasted only 12 years, finally coming to an end when the instrument of surrender was signed by a representative of the German High Command on May 8, 1945, which officially ended the war in Europe. And I'm going to show that instrument of surrender later on today. The formal, formal abolition of the Nazi party took place on October 10, 1945, which was followed by the trials of major war criminals before the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. Since its inception, the Nazi party was ultimately responsible for the deaths of approximately 20 million human beings. So the next occultist I want to explore is Eric John Hanyasen, or Eric Jan Hanyasen. This is the person who trained Hitler in his speaking techniques. Again, most people will have never heard of him, okay? Hitler was a flat speaker. In almost every documented piece of writing about how Hitler spoke before he was trained by Jan Hanyasen, uh, people said he didn't have good inflection in his voice and he did not have good control of the crowd. He, did not, he didn't, wasn't a commanding presence while speaking. Hanyasen changed all of that. Eric Jan Hanyasen was an Austrian hypnotist, mentalist, occultist, and astrologer who instructed Adolf Hitler on how to achieve dramatic effect and elicit emotional responses during his speaking performances. Hanyasen taught Hitler a set of occult speaking techniques that later became known as neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, which uses word choice, tone, cadence, and body language to subtly influence thought at the subconscious level. Hitler took regular lessons in speaking and in mass psychology from Hanyasen. Hanyasen met with Hitler shortly before the elections of November of 1932, during which Hanyasen taught Hitler his crowd control techniques of using hand gestures and dramatic pauses. Now, here's what becomes very interesting because Hanyasen got thrown under the bus, but for a different reason, not because they just wanted to attack him for his occult knowledge, as they did other occultists, but because he was what he claimed to be a prognosticator or a predictor of the future. And one of the things that Hanyasen predicted was the Reichstag fire. You see? He knew of the false flag operation and wanted to get credit for predicting it, so he blabbed about it. In his most famous feat of alleged clairvoyance, Hanyasen quote-unquote predicted the Reichstag fire, the event that allowed Hitler to seize absolute power in 1933. This was mo most likely a very miscalculated use of inside information. Some researchers have claimed that Hanyasen may have been directly involved in the Reichstag fire by hypnotizing the convicted arsonist Marinus van der Lubbe to commit the act of arson. Hanyasen was subsequently assassinated by members of the Sturmabteilung on March 25, 1933, and his body was found over a month later buried in a field on the outskirts of Berlin. These people don't play, though, right? They're, they don't play games. If you, if, you, the, if you are really on the inside, they take, it, they take the oaths of loyalty to them very seriously, and they, and they take people out who go against their oaths of loyalty. Fortunately, I never took those oaths of loyalty. I was still at least enough in the, in the exoteric realm, on the outside of it all, that I never actually swore allegiance to these people. Because if you do, then you're done. They don't let you out of those oaths. I did not take those oaths to the occult orders that I was involved in. I worked with them. I observed. You know, They wanted to groom me and take me up into higher levels, but that never materialized, thank God. So Rudolf Hess 
was a leading member of the Nazi party. He was an ardent student of astrology and other occult sciences. The, the Nazi regime was just littered with occultists, filled with dark occultists. Oh, and these are, this, this guy was a low-ranking man. He, yeah, he was like Hitler's next in line to, to take over as chancellor, but he didn't have any real political power, you know? The, the real occultists were all behind the scenes, and we'll get to those people. But, uh, you know, Hess was just a, a poster child of the Nazis. He, he wasn't... I'm sorry, folks, I knocked my recording mic down. Just give me a moment. Okay. Uh, he was a prominent member of the Nazi party, but as far as real power being wielded, it was not Hess, okay? Um, he was appointed as the deputy Fuhrer to Adolf Hitler on April 21st, 1933. Hess held that position until 1941 when he flew solo to Scotland in an attempt to negotiate the UK's exit from World War II. His plane was shot down and he was taken prisoner and convicted of war crimes. He was serving a life sentence when he committed suicide in 1987. Again, you'll see the theme of suicide of these people and occultists all over the place. In 1919, Hess enrolled in the University of Munich where he studied geopolitics under occultist Karl Haushofer, a prominent uh, proponent of the concept of Lebensraum or living space, which became one of the pillars of Nazi ideology. Hess joined the Nazi party on July 1st, 1920, and was at Hitler's side for the failed Beer Hall Putsch on November 8th, 1923. While serving his prison sentence for the attempted coup, Hess assisted Hitler with Mein Kampf. This is one of his big claim to fame, claims to fame. And of course, Mein, mein Kampf became a foundation, that foundation of the political platform of the Nazi party. Now, Hess was a longtime associate of Karl Haushofer, and this is one of the people that really informed both Hitler and Hess's uh, ideologies. And he did that through what he called geopolitik, or what we now call geopolitics, and Lebensraum. Karl Haushofer was a German general and professor whose concept of geopolitik greatly influenced the ideological development of Adolf Hitler. Haushofer also coined the political use of the term Lebensraum, a concept Hitler used to justify genocide. Under the Nuremberg laws regarding race, Haushofer's half-Jewish wife and their children were categorized as Mischling, Mischlinge, uh, race mixers. So again, even their own people came down under uh, levels of persecution if they didn't fully conform to what the good Nazi was in their, in their structure of control. After retiring from the German army with the rank of Major General in 1919, Haushofer forged a close friendship with Rudolf Hess, who became his personal assistant. He became a teacher of politics and philosophy, and I would say probably occult ideology, to both Hess and Hitler while they were in Landsberg prison following the failed Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. Every Wednesday between June 24th and December 12th, 1924, Haushofer traveled from Munich to Landsberg and offered hours of intense personal mentoring to both Hess and Hitler whom Haushofer called his young eagles. Historian Joachim Fest stated that bringing Haushofer and Hitler together was the most important personal contribution that Rudolf Hess made to the creation of National Socialism. And again, most people never, never uh, would, would ever hear Haushofer's name. One of the most influential ideologues of the Third Reich prior to the rise of the Third Reich. After the establishment of the Nazi government, Rudolf, Rudolf Hess protected Haushofer's wife from the Nuremberg Laws. Under Hitler's regime, Haushofer became rich and influential, but his influence shrank abruptly after Hess was captured in the United Kingdom. So you see, this is how they, they, they you know, 
take care of each other in a certain way. Hess was protecting his political and ideological mentor. But once Hess went out of the picture, then they came after Haushofer and his wife before being prosecuted at the Nuremberg Tribunals for complicity in Nazi war crimes, Haushofer committed suicide together with his wife near their home in Bavaria, Germany. So he, he committed suicide with his wife to avoid being brought up on war crimes charges at Nuremberg. And folks, uh, I'm, I'm not going to have any particular place I'm going to leave it. I'm just going to continue until 1 and then we'll take our break and wherever I'm at, I'm at and pick up on the other side of the break. The next section is about the Nazis' secret police force, the Gestapo. The Gestapo, or Geheime Staatspolizei, the secret state police, was the official secret state police force of Nazi Germany. The Gestapo was created by Hermann Goering in 1933 by combining the various political police agencies of Prussia into one organization. On April 20th, 1934, oversight of the Gestapo passed to the head of the Schutzstaffel, Heinrich Himmler, who was also appointed Chief of German Police by Adolf Hitler in 1936. So here you're seeing the further consolidation of power. The SA, the SA became less influential, and while the Gestapo continued its po secret police activities, they were absorbed under Heinrich Himmler's SS. The SS ultimately ran everything within the Nazi party. And we're going to see there was a secret order within the SS that almost certainly called all of the important shots. The Gestapo had the authority to investigate cases of treason, espionage, sabotage, and attacks on the Nazi party. Laws passed by the Nazi government in 1936 gave the Gestapo carte blanche to operate without judicial review, in effect putting the organization of the Gestapo above the law. As early as 1935, a Prussian administrative court had ruled that the Gestapo's actions were not subject to judicial review. Most Nazis considered that as long as the Gestapo was carrying out the will of the Fuhrer, it was acting, quote unquote, legally. And this is what believers of all authoritarianism think. If the authority says that it is right, then it is right. If the authority says that it is wrong, then it is wrong. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is moral relativism, the, one of the defining hallmark ideologies of Satanism. And I think that's a pretty good place to leave section one. We'll pick up with section two at 2.30 p.m. Please be back and ready to go promptly at 2.30, an hour and a half break. 2.30, we resolve, we resume promptly. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope everybody had a good lunch and is feeling refreshed for the second of our three speaking sessions. So we left off talking about the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police force, and how uh, anything that was considered the will of the Fuhrer, uh, then that was perfectly legal according to uh, most Nazis. The Gestapo committed widespread atrocities during its entire existence. The power of the Gestapo was used to focus upon political uh, opponents, ideological dissenters, and above all, Jews. Those arrested by the Gestapo were held without judicial process, and most political prisoners simply disappeared while in Gestapo custody, never to be seen from again. The Gestapo proved extremely effective in Nazi Germany, largely due to the willingness of ordinary German citizens to report on their fellow citizens. You know, without their support, the Gestapo would not have been as an, uh, an effective secret police force. Joseph Goebbels was the chief propagandist for the Nazi party and Reich Minister of Propaganda from 1933 to 1945. He was one of Adolf Hitler's closest and most devoted followers. 
Goebbels was known for his skill in public speaking and his deep, virulent anti-Semitic beliefs, which were overtly evident in his, in his publicly voiced views. He advocated progressively harsher discrimination, including the extermination of Jews throughout the Third Reich. After the Nazis came to power in 1933, the Nazi propaganda ministry, headed by Goebbels, quickly became quickly gained and exerted complete control and censorship over the news media, arts, and information throughout Nazi Germany. A common theme in all totalitarian regimes uh, is censorship, which we're experiencing a ton of these days right here in the United States. Goebbels was particularly adept at using the relatively new media of radio and film for propaganda purposes. In 1943, Goebbels began to pressure Hitler to introduce measures that will produce total war, including closing businesses that were deemed non-essential to the Nazi war effort, conscripting women into the war labor force, and enlisting men in previously exempt occupations into the Wehrmacht, or the Nazi armed forces. Goebbels converted the May 1st holiday from a workers' rights holiday into a day celebrating the Nazi party. May 1st is Beltane, also called Walpurgisnacht, the highest Sabbath or holy day of the occult calendar year. He also organized and spoke at many book burning ceremonies where huge crowds of Nazis gathered to burn books which were viewed as being subversive or representing ideologies that were opposed to Nazism. This proved an effective information control technique within Nazi Germany. If they could never read opposing views, most Germans could never come out of the mindset programmed into them by Nazi propagandists. This is a well-known occult technique. Here you see the occult year broken down into the seasons, uh, each house of the zodiac representing a month of the year, and Beltane in the upper left quadrant being the highest holiday or Sabbath of the occult year. Uh, this is the day that most ritual sacrifices take place during the occult year, and um, it is uh, the, the period from the spring equinox called Ostara, again the magazine of Lance Labenfels called Ostara the spring equinox, to the midpoint of spring at Beltane is known in the occult year as the season of sacrifice, which I've talked a lot about in my work. Here you see uh, the Nazi May 1st holiday ritual. Massive, massive uh, gatherings of, of people, of uh, uh, members of the Nazi party uh, with uh, full regalia. Uh, and this is what May Day was turned into. Again, the occult or satanic year, the highest holiday is May 1st. The Nazis' highest holiday was May 1st. The communists' highest holiday is May 1st. They all share the same holiday, uh, high holiday of the year. These are some May 1st holiday posters uh, representing, you know, Hitler as the savior of Germany, etc. And there you see uh, Nazis gathering books uh, to be burned that were subversive to their ideology. And there's an actual Nazi book burning ceremony taking place. The destruction of information was one of the most utilized techniques. Censorship widely utilized in both Nazism and Communism. As the war drew to a close and Nazi Germany faced defeat, Goebbels and his family joined Hitler in his war bunker in Berlin. Hitler committed suicide on April 30th, 1945. That is the eve of Walpurgisnacht, the eve of May Day. In accordance with Hitler's will, Goebbels succeeded him as chancellor and served only one day in this post. The following day, May 1st, 1945, Walpurgisnacht, Goebbels and his wife committed suicide after killing their six children with a cyanide compound. Once again, over and over, you see the same theme with the occultists and totalitarians. Another leading Nazi was Alfred Rosenberg. Uh, a Nazi theorist and ideologue, and head of the Nazi Office of Foreign Affairs during the Third Reich. 
He also headed the Rosenberg Bureau, an official Nazi body for cultural policy and surveillance between 1934 and 1945. During World War II, Rosenberg was the head of the Reich Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories. He is considered one of the main authors and key Nazi ideological creeds main authors of key Nazi ideological creeds, including its racial theory, Lebensraum, and the persecution of Jews. Rosenberg was an associate of the Tool Society, the occult organization that was directly responsible for the formation of the German, German Workers' Party, which later became the Nazi Party. In 1930, Rosenberg published his seminal work of Nazi ideology called The Myth of the 20th Century. Rosenberg introduced Adolf Hitler to the document called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, on which much has been written and talked about in the early 1920s. Hitler referred to the protocols in some of his early political speeches, and the document played an important part in the Nazis' propaganda campaign against Jews. Again, uh, this is uh, pur purportedly a document that lays out a Jewish agenda for world domination and human slavery. And I would suggest that the agenda laid out in it is real, but it is the occult agenda that is, tr is attempting to be uh, carried out and communicated through this document. And the occultists always want to have, a, the dark occultists always want to have a scapegoat in mind. And they use the Jews as a scapegoat for their agenda. They wanted people to perceive it as coming from high ranking rabbis and Jews of, uh, you know, J the Jewish religion, when in fact this is really an occult document. Some schools in Nazi Germany used the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion as a tool to indoctrinate students into anti-Semitism. Rosenberg was also known for his rejection and hatred for traditional Christianity and played an important role in the development of the distorted Nazi version of Christianity, which we're going to talk about. After World War II, Rosenberg was convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity at the Nuremberg trials in 1946. He was sentenced to death by hanging and executed on October 16, 1946. One of the things that he really pushed for was the distortion of Christianity within the Third Reich. Specifically, uh, he and other top-ranking Nazis tried to completely distort uh, the Christmas holiday into uh, their religious tradition, into their occult religion. So uh, there was a Nazi version of Christmas during the Third Reich. Uh, during the Third Reich, the Nazis distorted the Christian religious holiday of Christmas into a celebration of Nazi ideology. The Jewish origins of Jesus and the commemoration of his birth as the Jewish Messiah was troubling for some members of the Nazi party and their racist beliefs. The Nazi regime wanted to transform the consciousness of the German people into a cohesive national romanticism. The Nazis intended to destroy Christianity in Germany and insert in its place a combination of the belief in the old German pagan gods and the new, quote, gods who ruled the Nazi party. Again, it's all about becoming God. After taking power in 1933, Nazi ideologues sought to reject Germany's long-held Christmas traditions by renaming Christmas to Yule Fest or the Yule Festival, again, a, a Sabbath on the occult calendar. Uh, and also propagating its Germanic origins as the celebration of the winter solstice and turning it into a quote-unquote festival of light. As you see here, the Nazi, uh, the, the light, lighted up Christmas tree would often be, uh, have a, a swastika or a sig rune on top of it. Nazi ideologists claimed that the Christian elements of the holiday had been superimposed upon ancient Germanic traditions. They argued that Christmas originally had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus, but instead celebrated the winter solstice and the, quote, rebirth of the sun. They claimed that the swastika was an ancient symbol of the Big Dipper in its four positions during the equinoxes and solstices, again occult sabbats or holidays and that the figure of Santa Claus was a Christian reinvention of the Germanic god Wotan, the Norse god Odin. 
Nazi Yule Festival posters were made to depict Odin as the, quote, solstice man, riding a white horse, sporting a thick gray beard, wearing a slouch hat, and carrying a sack full of gifts. Here you see some uh, Nazi propaganda with the swastika uh, in the middle and different animals that were celebrated as part of Yule Fest. Uh, here you see their depiction of Santa Claus, which was Wotan or Odin. And uh, they had more traditions that they celebrated for the Nazi Christmas. The traditional nativity scene was replaced by a garden containing wooden toy deer and rabbits with the biblical figures of Mary and Jesus depicted as a blonde haired, depicted as blonde haired, blue eyed Aryans. The traditional name for a Christmas tree, Christbaum, was renamed as a Yule tree or a light tree, with the traditional star on the top of the tree replaced with a swastika, a sun wheel, or a sieg ruin, and the tree decorated with swastika ornaments depicted there in the lower right. During the height of the Nazi regime, an attempt was actually made to remove Christmas to remove from Christmas the association of the coming of Jesus and replace it with the coming of Hitler, who would be referred to as the Savior Fuhrer. One of the uh, most destructive forces within the Third Reich was, of course, Heinrich Himmler, and he was one of the leading dark occultists of the Reich. Heinrich Himmler was the Reichsfuhrer of the Schutzstaffel. The Reichsfuhrer means Reich leader, and he was uh, the leader of the Schutzstaffel, or SS, Hitler's Protection Squadron. Himmler was one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany and became primarily known for being one of the main architects of the Jewish Holocaust. Himmler joined the Nazi party in 1923 and joined the SS in 1925. He was appointed Reichsfuhrer SS by Adolf Hitler in 1929. Over the next 16 years, Himmler developed from developed the SS from a 290-man battalion into a paramilitary group with over a million members. As an occultist, Himmler viewed the SS as a mystical inner order of the Nazi party. And I want you to keep that phrase in mind because we're going to talk about there was an actual inner order within that inner order later on. Okay, and uh, he viewed the SS as uh, you know a mystical inner order order along the lines of the Teutonic Knights of ancient Germany. From 1943 onward, he oversaw all internal and external Nazi police and security forces, including the Gestapo. He also commanded the Waffen-SS, the military branch of the SS. In 1935, Himmler and leading blood and soil ideologist Richard Walter Dare founded an archaeological research and expedition society called the Ananerba, which was dedicated to proving the genetic superiority and ancient origins of the Germanic race. Himmler regarded the Ananerba as an elite think tank, which would sweep away previous scholarship on the development of humanity and reveal that Hitler's ideas on the subject were true. Himmler also believed that the Ananerba's investigations might reveal ancient secret, secrets about agriculture, medicine, and warfare, which would benefit Nazi Germany. It employed scholars from a wide range of academic fields, including archaeology, anthropology, ethnology, history, biology, zoology, botany, astronomy, medicine, and more. The Ananerba formed the basis for the depiction in the Indiana Jones franchise of Nazis searching for religious artifacts. So that is a, a partly true depiction. Uh, and there is the Ananerba's insignia. As the Reichsfuhrer of the Schutzstaffel, Himmler would become the principal overseer of Nazi Germany's genocidal programs, forming the Einsatzgruppen, mobile killing units, and it administering the extermination camps. Himmler commissioned the drafting of Generalplan Ost, the master plan for the East, which was approved by Hitler in May 1942. The total number of civilians eventually killed by the Nazi regime, largely under Himmler's orders, is estimated to be between 11 to 14 million people, most of whom were Polish and Soviet citizens. 
This is a depiction of the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing squads that first used uh, mass shooting and then moved to gassing techniques. Himmler's interest in the occult heavily influenced the development of the racial policy of Nazi Germany, and he incorporated esoteric symbolism and rituals into every aspect of the SS. He was one of their main chief occultists. Chosen in 1932, the dual lightning bolt logo of the SS is a pair of Sieg ruins from the Armanen ruins created by Guido von List in 1906. The ancient Soilo rune originally symbolized the sun, just like the swastika did, but was renamed Sieg, or victory, in List's ruins. The Totenkopf, the death's head symbol, had been chosen for the SS to mean solidarity to the cause and a commitment unto death. It was the main symbol for the SS Totenkopfverband, the SS Death's Head Units, which was the SS organization responsible for administering the Nazi concentration and extermination camps. Late in the Second World War, upon realizing that the war was lost, Himmler attempted to open peace talks with the Western Allies without Hitler's knowledge. Hearing of this, Hitler dismissed him from all of his posts in April of 1945 and ordered his arrest. Himmler attempted to go into hiding but was detained and then arrested by British forces once his identity became known. While in British custody, he died by suicide on May 23, 1945 by biting down on a, a poison pill and killing himself. Another leading occultist that many people have never heard of is Karl Maria Villegut. Karl Maria Karl Maria, Karl Maria Villegut was a prominent Nazi occultist from Austria and the leading figure of the religion of Ermanism, not to be confused with Armanism of Guido von List. Villegut identified Ermanism as the true Germanic ancestral religion, claiming that Guido von List's Wotanism and Armanen ruins were parts of a schismatic false religion. He claimed to worship the ancient Germanic god Christ, whom Villegut claimed Christianity later appropriated as their own savior, Christ. Villegut also claimed to be the descendant of an ancient line of god kings, the Armanenschaft, dating back to 228,000 BC, and that he was able to see into the past lives of his ancestors. Very key here to keep in mind for a little bit later, Villegut believed that a burnt out star or black sun, which he called Santur, was once the center of our solar system and was still visible in human antiquity. He believed that Santur was, uh, was the source of power for the ancient Hyperboreans, the far north Aryans. So keep that in mind moving forward. Villegut's wife blamed his occult interests for their destitution and, published and pushed for his committal to a mental hospital. On November 29, 1924, police arrested Villegut and took him to a local mental institution in Austria. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and megalomania and sent to Salzburg Asylum, where he was confined until 1927. After his release from Salzburg in 1932, he abandoned his wife and family and emigrated from Austria to Germany, residing in Munich. He made a name for himself in occult circles throughout Germany and is known to have corresponded with many occultists and admirers, uh, many occultist admirers and disciples, including Ernest Rudiger of the Edda Society and members of Rudolf von Sebattendorf's Ordo Novi Templi Occult Society. Villegut's knowledge of occultism eventually garnered him the attention and head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. Shortly after being introduced to Himmler in September of 1933, Villegut was inducted into the SS. In the spring of 1935, Villegut was transferred to Berlin to serve on Himmler's personal staff. In September of 36, Villegut was promoted to the rank of SS Brigadefuhrer. 
Villegut acted as Heinrich Himmler's personal counselor on magical and religious subjects and eventually became known as Hitler's Rasputin. So he was the mentor in the occult ideologies of Heinrich Himmler. And most people have never heard of him. In Berlin, while working in the office of Karl Wolf, the chief adjutant of the SS, Villegut developed his plans for the rebuilding of the Wevelsberg Castle in Bavaria into an allegorical center of the world. Villegut, uh, I'm sorry, it's not in Bavaria, it's in uh, Westphalia. Uh, Villegut contributed significantly uh, as an allegorical center of the world. Villegut contributed significantly to the development of Wevelsberg as the, quote, order castle a ceremonial center of SS occult practice. Villegut also designed the Totenkampf ring, the death's head ring, which Himmler personally awarded to prestigious SS officers. During the Third Reich, at the instigation of Villegut, the Nazi regime, regime instituted an occult purge, a policy of persecution of other occultists, systematically closing down all esoteric organizations which were seen as a direct threat to the Nazi regime due to the knowledge that such groups possessed. So you see it's just they have to run only their game and no other com competition is allowed. So they even shut down all of the other occult and esoteric orders within Nazi Germany. In November 1938, Chief Adjutant Karl Wolf, uh, Chief SS Adjutant Karl Wolf, visited Villegut's wife and learned of Villegut's earlier involuntary, involuntary commitment to a mental institution, which proved embarrassing to Heimlich Himmler. Villegut's staff was notified that his, quote, application for retirement on the grounds of age and poor health had been granted in February 1939. So they basically forced his retirement because mental feebleness was not allowed in the Nazi regime. After World War II, Villegut moved to a refugee camp in uh, St. Johann near Velden, Austria, where he had a stroke. He died in Arlson, Austria on January 3, 1946. Indoctrination of the youth was one of the chief campaigns of the Nazi regime, obviously also a very chief campaign of communist regimes everywhere. The Hitler Jugend, the Hitler Youth, or HJ, was the youth organization of the Nazi party. From 1936 to 1945, the Hitler Youth was the sole official boys' youth organization in Nazi Germany. Its origins date back to 1922, when the Munich-based Nazi party established its official youth organization called Jugendbund der NSD, NSDAP, the Youth League of the Nazi Party. In, uh, its inaugural meeting took place on May 13, 1922. Another youth group, the Jungstrom Adolf Hitler, the Youth League of Adolf Hitler, was established the same year. Based in Munich, Bavaria, it served to train and recruit future members of the Sturmabteilung, the main paramilitary wing of the Nazi party at that time. Once Hitler came onto the revolutionary scene, the transition from seemingly innocuous youth movements to political entities focused on Hitler was swift. In April 1924, the Youth League of the NSDAP was renamed the Greater German Youth Movement, which became the Nazi Party's official youth organization. In July 1926, it was renamed to the Hitler Youth and officially became an integral part of the SA. Girls from 18, sorry, girls from 10 to 18 years of age were also given their own parallel youth organization called the League of German Maidens. In December 1936, the Hitler Youth Law was passed by the Nazis, making membership in the Hitler Youth mandatory for Aryan boys. In March 1939, the Youth Service Duty Law conscripted all German youths into the Hitler Youth, even if the parents objected. Parents who refused to allow their children to join were subject to investigation by Nazi authorities. By 1940, the Hitler Youth had grown to 8 million members. Members of the Hitler Youth were viewed as ensuring the future of Nazi Germany, and they were indoctrinated into Nazi ideology, including racism. 
The boys were indoctrinated with the myths of Aryan racial superiority and to view Jews and Slavs as subhumans. Members were taught to associate state-identified enemies such as Jews with Germany's previous defeat in World War I and its societal decline. The Hitler Youth were used to break up church youth groups, spy on religious classes and Bible studies, and interfere with church attendance. Education and training programs for the Hitler Youth were designed to undermine the values of traditional structures of German society. Again, this is what we see happening today in modern education. Their training also aimed to remove social and intellectual distinctions between classes to be replaced and dominated by the political goals of Hitler's totalitarian dictatorship. Sacrifice for the Nazi cause was instilled into their training. The notion that, quote, Germany must live even if members of the Hitler Youth have to die was hammered into them from an early age. The Hitler Youth maintained training academies comparable to preparatory schools which were designed to nurture future Nazi party leaders. It, so it was a grooming ground. It appropriated many of the activities of the Boy Scouts movement, including camping and hiking. Over time, it changed in content and intention, and many activities began to closely resemble military training, with weapons familiarization, assault courses, and fighting tactics becoming part of its curriculum. The aim was to turn the Hitler Youth into motivated soldiers. The ultimate goal of all the Nazi youth organizations was to instill into their youth the ideologies of blind obedience and unwavering loyalty to the Nazi cause. Hitler once remarked about his vision for the future of young Germans by saying, quote, we seek a youth that has closed their hearts to pity. Even before membership in the Hitler Youth was made mandatory in 1939, German boys faced strong pressure to join. They were made the subject of frequent taunts from teachers and fellow students, and could even be refused their di diploma, which made it impossible to be admitted to colleges and universities. Many employers also refused to offer work to anyone who was not a member of the Hitler Youth, making it difficult for non-members to find jobs. Mandatory vaccinations, anyone? <laughs> In 1938, Hitler referred to the Nazi regime's ability to completely indoctrinate German youth, stating, quote, these boys and girls enter our youth organizations at 10 years of age. After four years of the young folk, they go on to the Hitler youth, where we have them for another four years. If they are still not complete national socialists, they go to labor service and are smoothed out there for another six or seven months. Whatever class consciousness or social status might still be left, the Vermacht will take care of that. One of the underlying ideologies of Nazism was eugenics. And once again, this is tenet or pillar number four of Satanism and the Satanic ideology. At the center of Nazi ideology was their view of eugenics, which sought the biological improvement of the German people through the policy of selective breeding of Nordic or Aryan genetic traits. These policies were used to justify the involuntary sterilization and mass murder of those deemed, quote, undesirable. In Germany, the concepts of eugenics was mostly known under the term of Rassenhygiene or race hygiene. Racial competition, a significant concept of social Darwinism, one of the tenets of Satanism, was one of the foundational ideologies that inspired the rise of Nazi eugenics. Eugenics research in Nazi Germany before and during the Nazi period was similar to that in the United States, particularly in the state of California. The eugenics movement was already well established in the United States since the early 1900s after it was spread to Germany by California eugenicists who began producing literature promoting eugenics and sending it overseas to German scientists and medical professionals. 
By 1933, California had subjected more people to involuntary sterilization than any other U.S. states combined, than all other U.S. states combined. The forced sterilization program engineered by the Nazis was heavily inspired by California's eugenics programs. And it spread to all over the United States, not just California. There were eugenics programs in just about every state. Uh, this is a depiction of an actual eugenics building advocating for eugenics in Topeka, Kansas in 1929. And closer to home on the next slide, we'll see one that was in Philadelphia or a, an exhibition that took place in Philadelphia. Upon returning from a trip to Germany in the 1930s, California eugenics leader C.M. Goethe bragged to a colleague, quote, you will be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epoch-making program. Everywhere I sense that their opinions have been tremendously stimulated by American thought. You have really jolted into action a great government of 60 million people. That is a, an American eugenicist saying that about one of his colleagues about how their eugenics program here in America influenced the Nazis. And here you see a Nazi, I'm sorry, uh, a eugenics poster. Uh, saying some people are born to be a burden on the rest from the Philadelphia sesquicentennial or 150, uh, 150th uh, celebration uh, in 1926, you know, 150th uh, an anniversary of the you know, creation of America. Those initially targeted for murder under the Nazi eugenics policies were largely people living in private and state-operated institutions. So they automatically went after the feeble-minded first, okay? And they identified them as what they called life unworthy of life. They included prisoners, degenerates, dissidents, and people with congenital, cognitive, and physical disabilities. People who were considered to be, quote, feeble-minded. That's, that's where the eugenics program started in Nazi Germany before it completely snowballed into other areas and, and ethnic groups. By 1934, more than 5,000 people per, per month were being forcibly sterilized in Germany. By the end of the Nazi regime, over 200 hereditary health courts were created in Germany. And under their ruling, rulings, over 400,000 people were sterilized against their will, and over 300,000 were murdered in the Action T4 or Action T4 euthanasia program. Here you see a sign uh, talking about Acteon T4, and they used um, stationary gas chambers where they put people in a shower, a collective shower room, and then pumped engine exhaust, sealed it off, and pumped in uh, truck engine exhaust was the main method of murder. Moving on to eugenics uh, under the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Named after the last German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Heredity, and Eugenics was founded in 1927 in Berlin. Significantly influenced by American eugenics ideology and programs for two decades, the founding and building of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute was partially funded by the Rockefeller Foundation right here in the United States. Throughout the Nazi era, uh, again, we're talking about occult organizations funneling and channeling money and resources into uh, such occult groups like the Nazis. Throughout the Nazi era, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute was strongly associated with the theories of Nazi eugenics and racial hygiene advocated by its leading theorists, Eugen Fischer, Fritz Lenz, and Otmar von Verschwer. Members of the Ka Kaiser Wilhelm Institute member of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, Eugen Fischer, was influential with the Nazis early in their rise to power in Germany. In 1921, he and Fritz Lenz published a two-volume book called Principles of Human Heredity and Race Hygiene, which Adolf Hitler read while incarcerated in 1923 and used its ideas in Mein Kampf. Fischer's work heavily influenced German colonial legislation and provided quote-unquote scientific support for the Nazis' racial Nuremberg laws. 
1937 and 38, Fischer and his colleagues analyzed 600 children in Nazi Germany who were descendants of French, um, French African soldiers. These children, which the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute called the Rhineland Bastards, were classified as hereditarily unfit and subsequently subjected to sterilization. During World War II, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute regularly received human body parts from Joseph Mengele, the angel of death of the Auschwitz concentration camp, to use in studies intended to prove Nazi racial theories and justify race-related policies. After World War II, most of the thousands of files and lab materials of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute were moved to an unknown, unknown location or destroyed and never obtained by the Allies to use as evidence in war crimes trials and to prove that Nazi racial ideology had motivated mass genocide in Europe. Most of the staff of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute were able to escape trial, most notably Mengele, who escaped to Brazil and died there in 1979. The Lebensborn program, another example of Nazi um, selective breeding, was established by Heinrich Himmler on December 12, 1935. It was an SS-initiated, state-supported, registered association in Nazi Germany with the stated goal of increasing the number of children born who met the Nazi standards of, quote, racially pure Aryans based on Nazi eugenics. The, the Lebensborn program provided welfare to its mostly unmarried mothers, encouraged anonymous births by unmarried women at maternity homes, and mediated adoption of children by likewise, quote, racially pure parents, particularly SS members and their families. This was a broodmare program. That is what it was. They were just trying to get as many women to have as many Aryan babies as possible. Again, that's what eugenics is. Higher procreation for people that have the genetic traits you want to see and extermination or sterilization for undesirables. About 8,000 children were born in Lebensborn homes in Germany between, and between 8,000 and 12,000 children in Norway. Access to Lebensborn was restricted in accordance with the Nordicist eugenics, eugenic and racial policies of Nazism which could be referred to as supervised selective breeding. The cross of honor of the German mother was given to the women who bore the most Aryan children. Abortion was legalized and endorsed by the Nazis for disabled and non-Germanic children, but strictly punished otherwise. Lebensborn Lebensborn expanded into several occupied European countries with Germanic populations during World War II. It included the selection of racially worthy orphans for adoption and care for children born from Aryan women who had been in relations, relationships with SS members. During the war, many children were kidnapped from their parents and judged by Aryan criteria for their suitability to be raised in Lebensborn homes and fostered by German families. So they were kidnapping uh, the children of people throughout Europe and putting those children into the Lebensborn program. At the Nuremberg trials, much direct evidence was found of the kidnapping of children by Nazi Germany across Ukraine and Poland during the period of 1939 to 1945. So let's hear, you know, I hear this all the time. The Nazis are made out to be way worse than what they really were. I mean, I actually hear this from people. I hear this from morons out there. Okay, let's hear from their own words what they really wanted to do. In their own writings, this is not third hand, this is not a historical account, this is them and published letters and writings that they themselves wrote. So the, this is a section on the Nazis themselves talking about how they were going to become God. I call this a new order of masters and slaves because that's what the Nazi regime was. It was their version of a new world order, okay? What they called the Thousand Year Reich. Martin Bormann, the chief of the Nazi Party Chancellery, said this The Poles are especially born for low labor. There can be no question of improvement for them. 
It is necessary to keep the standard of life low in Poland, and it must not be permitted to rise. Poland should be used by us merely as a source of unskilled labor. Poland, uh, I'm sorry, every year the laborers needed by the Reich could be procured from there. As for the Polish priests, they will preach what we want them to preach. If any priest acts differently, we shall make short work of him. The task of the priest is to keep the Poles quiet, stupid, and dull-witted. And I would say that's the task of all religion, ladies and gentlemen. You know, and the occultists use that to their tactical advantage. It is indispensable to bear in mind that the Polish gentry, the middle class, must cease to exist. And the eradication of the middle class is a very, very, very prominent goal in the modern day. However cruel this may sound, they must be exterminated wherever they are. There should be only, there should be one master only for the Poles, the German. Two masters side by side, side cannot and must not exist. Therefore, all representat representatives of the Polish intelligentsia are to be exterminated. That means if you were an educated person in Poland, you had to be taken out. This sounds cruel, but such is the law of life, Martin Bormann. From his own words, his own writings, he continued saying, the Slavs are to work for us. Insofar as we don't need them, they may die. The fertility of the Slavs is undesirable. They may use contraceptives or practice abortion, the more the better. Education is dangerous. It is enough if they can count up to 100. Every educated person is a future enemy. Religion, we leave to them as a means of diversion. As for food, they won't get any more than is absolutely necessary. We are the masters. We come first. There's the first tenet of Satanism right there. Eric Koch, the Reich Commissioner for the Ukraine, said, We are the master race and must govern hard but just. I will draw the very last out of this country. I did not come to spread bliss. The population must work, work, and work again. We definitely did not come here to give out manna. We have come here to create the basis for victory. We are a master race, which must remember that the lowliest German worker is racially and biologically a thousand times more valuable than the population here, meaning in the Ukraine. By the decree of Hans Frank, the governor general of Poland during the Third Reich, all property in Poland belonging to Jews and Poles was subjected to confiscation without comp compensation. Hundreds of thousands of Polish-owned farms were seized and handed over to the Nazi conquerors. By June 1943, over 700,000 Polish estates comprising 21.5 million acres of land were confiscated by the Nazi regime. And here is Hans Frank's own words regarding what he called the colony of Poland. He said, I shall endeavor to squeeze out of this province, Poland, everything that is still possible to squeeze out. If the new food scheme is carried out in 1943, a half million people in Warsaw and its suburbs alone will be deprived of food. He's not saying that like it's a problem. He's bragging. Poland can only be administered by utilizing the country through means of ruthless exploitation. Deportation of all supplies, raw materials, machines, factory installations, etc., which are important for the German war economy. Availability of all workers for work within Germany. Reduction of the entire Polish economy to absolute minimum necessary for bare existence of the population. And I would say that's the Great Reset that's happening now and closing of all educational institutions within Poland, especially technical schools and colleges, in order to prevent the growth of the new Polish intelligentsia. Poland shall be treated as a colony. The Poles shall be the slaves of the greater German Reich. Right there out in the open, proud about it, bragging about it. 
So the, all the people out there, <coughs> pardon me. To all the people out there saying the Nazis weren't really the bad guys, you clearly haven't even read their own writings. <coughs> they were proud of turning people into slaves. <coughs> and this, of course, led to the final solution, as the Nazis called it. What I call it is what it really was, <clears throat> mass human occult ritual sacrifice, if we're being honest. Between 1941 and 1945, Nazi Germany and its collaborators systematically murdered two-thirds of Europe's Jewish population. The murders were carried out primarily through mass shootings and poison gas in extermination camps, chiefly located in Poland, at Auschwitz, Treblinka, Belchek, Sobibor, and Kel Kelmno, and within Germany at Dachau, which was originally a detainment camp for German nationals detained for political reasons. On November 9th and 10th, 1938, the Nazi regime orchestrated a nationwide pogrom called Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass against Jews, also known as the November Pogrom, or November Pogrom. It was carried out by the Nazis' paramilitary forces, the Sturmabteilung SA and the Schutzstaffel SS. The name Kristallnacht comes from the shards of broken glass that littered the streets after the windows of Jewish-owned stores, buildings, and synagogues were smashed. Jewish homes, hospitals, and schools were ransacked as attackers demolished buildings with sledgehammers. At least 90 Jews were murdered, over 7,000 Jewish businesses were damaged or destroyed, and 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and incarcerated in concentration camps with over 10,000 interned at Dachau. This is the uh, imagery of the shattered glass littered throughout the streets. And this is Dachau concentration camp uh, where you see the phrase on the gate, Arbeit macht frei, which means work creates freedom. Or in other words, work will set you free. <clears throat> After Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, occupation authorities began to establish urban ghettos like the Warsaw Ghetto and to segregate Jews. Following the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany via Operation Barbarossa in, in uh, June 1941, the systematic murder of Jews by the Nazis began in full force, with around 1.5 million Jews shot by German forces and local co collaborators. This was the, the very beginning of the Holocaust. These executions often took place a few kilometers from a town. Victims were rounded up, marched to the execution site, and shot, with their bodies falling into previously dug mass grave sites. Executions were public spectacles, and the victim's property was looted by both Nazi occupiers and local inhabitants. As the Nazis occupied other European nations, citizens from across Europe were sent to concentration camps, which interned prisoners from every nation occupied by the forces of the Third Reich. Some Nazis found the method of execution by shooting both psychologically distressing and logistically inconvenient, which influenced the Nazis' decision to switch to other killing methods. The Schutzstaffel's Einsatzgruppen, or mobile killing units, were, the first, deployed in, were first deployed in 1941 and were initially organized to facilitate mass shootings. They soon employed the technique of mass murder by poisonous gas. Their victims were forced into specially designed vans or trucks and killed with the vehicle's engine exhaust before being transported and dumped into mass graves. In early 1942, the highest levels of the Nazi government decided to murder all Jews throughout Europe, what they called the final solution. Nazi extermination camps were usually located along rail lines to make it easier to transport victims to their deaths, but in places that were remote enough to avoid notice by local populations who claimed that they knew nothing of what was happening. 
Victims were deported by trains to extermination camps where most were killed via poison gas. Victims were typically deported to the camps in overcrowded cattle cars, seen here on the upper right, uh, <clears throat> where most were killed with poison gas. Victims were typically deported uh, in over overcrowded cattle cars with as many as 150 people forced into a single boxcar on a train. Upon arrival, the victims were stripped of their remaining possessions, forced to undress, undress had their hair cut off, and were forced into gas chambers, mostly um, gas chambers that, again, were improvised with engine exhaust. Death from the poisonous gas was agonizing and could take as long as 30 minutes. During, uh, toward the end of the Nazi regime, Zyklon B gas eventually became the preferred killing method in extermination camps. Here you see uh, the Auschwitz camp again with the saying, Arbeit macht frei, which means uh, work creates freedom. Here uh, a roll call of some of the uh, concentration camp uh, prisoners. The barracks of, of uh, you know, their sleeping quarters shown uh, below there. And uh, the type of uh, stationary uh, gas chambers that were used that were pumped full of truck engine exhaust. And toward the later part of World War II, Zyklon B gas. Then uh, crematoria uh, were created. And uh, you see them up at the top there. And at the bottom, this is simply a reenactment of how they would load people into the crematoria. Most of them were uh, dumped in mass graves and not cremated. Uh, this is the uh, total just of executions in prisoner camps. In Auschwitz, one million were executed via the method of Zyklon B gas. At Treblinka, almost one million, about 950,000 via engine exhaust in a stationary gas chamber. At Belchek, 595,000 stationary gas chamber via engine exhaust. At Sobibor, 235,000 stationary gas chamber engine exhaust. Kelno, 150,000 uh, via gas vans, again, the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing units. And at Dachau, 32,000 via disease, starvation, and malnutrition. That totals uh, close to 2 million, I believe, or no, I'm sorry, 3 million. Okay, then you take the pogroms that were done throughout Europe uh, and other methods of, of execution and starvation and disease, and you know, you get multiple millions of people, and then add war, and you know, the number goes up from there. At Auschwitz, around 25% of the camp population was separated out for forced labor for the Nazi war effort. In addition to gas chambers, extermination camp victims were also killed through starvation, mass shooting, and torture, and used as test subjects in deadly forced medical experimentation at Auschwitz, led by Edward Wirths and Joseph Mengele. Mengele, I, I didn't put the quote in here, but Mengele actually said to uh, Jewish prisoners, the more we do to you, the less you believe we are doing it. He actually said that because so many of them were so completely in shock by the horrors that they were experiencing that they could not believe it was happening psychologically. And that is what he said to them. The more we do to you, the less you believe we are doing it. The majority of Holocaust victims died in 1942, but the killing continued right up to the end of World War II in May of 1945. Not all Holocaust victims were Jews. Millions of non-Jews were also killed for their ethnic and ideological associations. The word Holocaust is etymologically derived from the Greek adjective holos, meaning whole, and the Greek adjective kaustos, meaning burned. Thus, it means literally burned entirely or immolated. And it has become the most common word, Holocaust, to describe the Nazi extermination of Jews and other undesirables, such as Slavs, Poles, Romani, and others during the Third Reich. The Nazis themselves used the phrase final solution to describe their genocidal actions. 
an estimated 250,000 Germans, about a quarter of a million, were directly involved in killing Jews during the Holocaust. An additional quarter of a million were involved in the organization and planning of these exterminations. Genocide required the active and tacit consent of millions of Germans and non-German collaborators alike. The German SS, the German police, and the regular army units rarely had any trouble finding enough men to follow their orders to shoot Jewish civilians, even though punishment for refusal to do so was either very light or altogether absent. They were glad to do it. They considered a badge of honor. They wanted to follow the orders. You know, you think about that level of immorality and ask yourself, is America any damn different now? And if, if you think it is, I have news for you. You need to do a lot more examination and investigation of the people all around us. Because it's no different today. Not a bit. And this is the human future. Take a good look at it, because this is what's coming for humanity. This is what we're going to experience probably within our lifetimes if we don't shape up and le really learn what's going on and really understand objective morality and natural law and start teaching it to other people. That's what's coming. Let's talk about Nazi occult technology for a moment and then talk about the inner order within the inner order that really called the shots in Nazi Germany. This is one of the most unknown Nazis and one of the highest ranking Nazis in the entire Nazi party, okay? Hardly anybody knows about Hans Kammler, and there's a reason for that. He was their high-level technologist on the most top-secret technology projects that existed within the Third Reich. So they really wanted to keep his existence secret, and no one knows what happened to him after World War II. Hans Kammler, well, and his death date is not known, okay, was an SS Obergruppenfuhrer, the highest of SS leaders. He was right there under Himmler, okay, was responsible for Nazi civil engineering projects, and he was the chief technologist for top secret Nazi weapons programs. Kammler joined the Nazi party in 1931 and the SS on May 20th, 1933. In Kammler's ideology, modern technology and ideologies of German supremacy were tightly interwoven. He wanted to see a technocratic ruling class, and that's what he helped to, to try to bring about. In <coughs> Kammler was described as having technological competence and extreme Nazi fanaticism coexisting in the same man. Hitler's chief architect, Albert Speer, described Kammler as, quote, Himmler's most brutal and most ruthless henchman. Don't you think we would hear about someone like that historically? You would think so, right? He's being described as this is the guy who Himmler himself views as the model Nazi, and yet his name is completely lost to history. <clears throat> Kammler oversaw the construction of various Nazi concentration camps, including Auschwitz. He was one of the chief architects of Auschwitz, at which he was later called back to advise on modalities for boosting the daily output of its gas chambers, because they couldn't kill people fast enough. He was also responsible for the demolition of the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1945, Kammler was appointed to the Third Reich's plenipotentiary for all top secret weapons research, responsible directly to the Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler and to the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler himself, and only them. By the end of World War II, Hitler had concentrated more power in Hans Kammler's hands than he had ever entrusted to any single person, and yet, his name is erased from history. In the final weeks of the war, Kammler's movements became sketchy and unpredictable. It is rumored that he attempted to relocate or destroy some of the most advanced weapons projects he had worked to create before they were able to be captured by the Allied powers. Kammler disappeared in May 1945, 
during the final days of the war and was never found. Many researchers have speculated that Nazi technologists were working on classified and advanced weapons projects, including atomic weapons, missiles capable of reaching the United States, scalar weaponry, and above all, time travel and anti-gravity devices. The most famous of these speculated programs was the Glock, the Bell, which was described as a piece of glowing, rotating machinery that possibly had some kind of anti-gravitational effect. Speculation continues today that the Bell may have been some sort of prototype for an anti-gravitational craft, which would act as a wonder weapon to allow Hitler and the Nazis to turn the tide late in World War II. This is a depiction of what the bell may have looked like. And it's based on some reports of what people who saw its prototype operation, how, how it worked. This is the henge, as it is known, uh, where the bell allegedly either uh, sat in the middle or perhaps was underneath of this henge. Now, notice that the henge has 12 pillars and lintels. And that's going to come in very significant in the, the next section, OK? The, it had 12 sections. That's not accidental or arbitrary. And again, uh, this is a speculative part of the presentation, but much has been written and speculated on it by historians and uh, scholars on this topic. And now we come to the inner order of the inner order of the Nazi regime the order of the black sun, something that most people will never really understand or know anything about. It was so well hidden as an occult order. Inside Heinrich Himmler's Schutzstaffel, the SS, which he himself described as a mystical inner order of the Nazi party, was embedded another occult order and secret society, the Schwarzsun, the black sun. The black sun was quote, an inner order within an inner order, the occult brotherhood that truly directed the Third Reich. Himmler most likely based the Black Sun order upon the beliefs of the man known as his personal Rasputin and his private Magus, his mentor and counselor on matters of the occult, Karl Maria Villegut. Villegut believe, believed that a burnt out star or black sun called Santur was once the center of our solar system and was a source of mystical power to the ancient Aryan people. Now, whether that's true or not, they believed it, especially Villegut. In his occult beliefs, there was a black sun that eventually burnt out. It became maybe a brown dwarf star, what he called the black sun. And he considered that that was the main source of the power of the ancient German pagan people. Other esoteric groups within Nazi Germany referred to this ancient force as the Vril. This is the black sun similar, a symbol on the left that was used by Himmler and the SS. And other uh, secret societies and occult organizations also believed in the black sun and had their variation of the black sun symbol. On the right, there you see with some of the Armanen ruins around it and in the center of the black sun, uh, the variation of the black sun used by the Tool Society. The black sun symbol was formed by 12 Armanen Sieg ruins, the same ruin that was chosen to represent the SS, arrayed in a circular pattern to represent the 12 houses of the zodiac surrounding a central disk representing the black sun at its center. Again, remember the, the uh, 12 pillars and lintels of the henge of de Glock, the bell. Okay, And when you see the room that this is actually uh, put into, you're going to realize there's more symbolism of 12 there. Okay. So um, the black sun symbol is a stylized sonnenrad, or sun wheel. Again, this was one of the decorations used in, in the Nazi Christmas tradition, the sun wheel. Uh, and the black sun was a variation of it. Again, the 12 houses of the zodiac surrounded by the central black sun. 
Villegut designed this variation of the black sun disk that you see here, and Himmler ordered it to be built into the marble floor of the Obergruppenfuhrer's Hall, the Hall of the Highest SS Leaders of Wevelsberg Castle. The Open Group Obergruppenfuhrer's Hall is a circular room inside the castle's north tower with 12 columns and 12 windows. Again, the number 12 repeated. This is the Open Obergruppenfuhrer's Hall, the hall of the highest SS leaders depicted here. And there are actually 12 pillars and 12 windows in the room. In the room. room. In the middle of the room's light gray marble floor, there is a dark green marble inlay of the black sun symbol, with each of its 12 spokes pointing to each of the 12 columns in the hall. Originally, there was a golden disc at the center of the ornament, most likely representing the black sun's power source, the vril, that has since been removed. The number 12, in addition to representing the houses of the zodiac, may also here be a reference to the Order of Teutonic Knights, after whom the SS was patterned by Himmler, which also had a mystical inner order comprised of 12 elite knights. And if you think that's all accidental, wonderful. <laughs> a room called Die Gruft, the tomb or the crypt, is located directly below the Obergruppenfuhrer's Hall. Its shape resembles a Mycenaean dome grave. The Gruft, depicted there, uh, it's a photo of it there on the upper uh, right, was probably used as an SS occult ritual chamber. At its center was the incomplete construction of the housing of an eternal flame, which would have represented the Nazis' so-called Thousand Year Reich. In 1935, Heinrich Himmler formed the SS Schulhaus Wevelsberg, the SS School of the House of Wevelsberg, which would <clears throat> offer ideological training courses for SS leaders. And he, this would be called the Reichsfuhrer School, School for the SS. SS leaders would gather at Wevelsberg three to four times a year for planning meetings and SS initiation ceremonies arranged by Himmler. Toward the end of World War II, Himmler ordered that Wevelsberg should become the Reich House of the SS Gruppenfuhrer, the Reich House of the highest SS leaders. If you don't think that's an occult secret society that he was developing there, I mean, again, I don't know what to tell you. All of that symbolism, going back to, to, to Villegut and the Black Sun, how they arrange the room, you know, and, you know, obviously that the symbol over there is a, uh, a variation on the swastika, a more elaborate version of it that was actually uh, encrusted into the ceiling of Wevelsberg, into the, the domed uh, uh, room uh, called de Gruft, which sits directly below the... Uh, uh, the uh, Ober Group in Führer's Hall that is directly above it that has the black sun on the floor. Wevelsberg was planned by Himmler and Villegut to become the future center of the world and the capital of the Nazis' new order and to become a planning space and ritual center, ritual center for the order of the black sun, the occult elite within the Nazi SS. That's Wevelsberg Castle. <clears throat> and there's another variation of the Black Sun, the Schwartz Sun symbol. That concludes the section on the occult origins of Nazism. Let's move on to the dark occult origins of <laughs> communism. And we're going to get really deep into this here. And again, I guarantee it will be the same thing where most people will not know any of these people or groups, save perhaps one. So let's start with Karl Marx, which is where most people think that communism starts with. And I'm going to show you it does not start with him. It goes back hundreds of years before Marx, certainly at least an entire century before his birth. Okay, Karl Marx 
was a German-born ideologue, political theorist, and revolutionary socialist. His best-known works are the 1940, I'm sorry, 1848 pamphlet, The Communist Manifesto, co-authored with Frederick Engels, and the three-volume Das Kapital, or Capital, an analysis of capitalism which espouses Marx's theory of historical materialism. Once again, one of the underlying ideologies of the occult, one of the underlying ideologies of cults and Satanism. Marx's ideas and theories and their subsequent development, collectively known as Marxism, have exerted enormous influence on modern intellectual, economic, and political history, perhaps more than any other figure in human history, sadly. Marx was significantly influenced by the philosophy of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who we've already talked about uh, via the Hegelian dialectic, what is what I call polarization uh, techniques, polarization dialectics, to uh, steer society into a certain direction by giving them a series of false choices that all take them to the same place. <clears throat> and he embraced Hegelianism in his youth. While in Paris in 1844, Marx met Frederick Engels, a lifelong friend and collaborator. After moving to Brussels in 1845, Marx and Engels were both active in the international political party known as the Communist League. A lot more on that a little bit later. In, 19, in 1848, they wrote the Communist Manifesto, a political pamphlet which expressed their political and economic ideas and ended with a call for a workers' revolution. Marx's critical theories about society, economics, and politics hold that human societies develop through class conflict. In the capitalist mode of production, this manifests itself in the conflict between the ruling classes, or bourgeoisie, that control the means of production, and the working classes, called the proletariat, that enable these means by selling their labor power in return for wages. Employing a critical approach known as historical materialism, Marx predicted that the tensions produced by capitalism would lead to its self-destruction and replacement by a new system known as the socialist mode of production. And this is what people in the socialist community refer to as common or shared ownership, of which there is no such thing in nature. To own something means someone maintains the exclusive right over it. That's why people are not property, because no one can have an exclusive right over another human being. And uh, there's no such thing as shared ownership, truly, not in nature. So he's inventing a construct that doesn't exist and trying to try to apply it to all of humanity. This socialist mode of production would lead to a worker's conquest of political power and eventually the establishment of a classless communist society. Marx argued that the working class should carry out organized revolutionary action to topple capitalism and bring about his envisaged socioeconomic emancipation. <clears throat> Marxism has exerted major influence on socialist thought and political movements, and during the 20th century, revolutionary governments, and during the 20th century, revolutionary governments identifying as Marxist took power in many countries and established socialist states, including the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. More on later. A number of <clears throat> theoretical variants, such as Leninism, Trotskyism, and Maoism, have also been developed. Marx was expelled from Paris, Belgium, and Germany over the course of his life for his revolutionary ideas. He finally settled in London in 1849. You're going to see this historical pattern over and over, especially with communism. Moving out of other countries of Europe and into London, a power center for social engineering, and you'll see why. Marx was expelled, uh, he was expelled and finally settled in London in 1849, where he wrote Das Kapital. In 1864, Marx helped found the International Working Men's Association, also called First International, through which he sought to spread the communist ideology and to fight the influence of so-called anarchists of his time, led by Mikhail Bakunin. Marx died in March of 1883. <clears throat> 
while not publicly known as an occultist himself, the dark side of Marx has been well documented. He was known amongst his contemporaries for his hatred of humanity as a species, and he often espoused a desire to promote human destruction. Marx expressed hatred for entire cultures and was very racist. He hated Jews, Germans, the English, and more. He was a virulent racist and frequently made hateful remarks about blacks and other minorities in his writings. While Marxists have, claim, have claimed that Marx was an atheist, it is well known by those who have studied his mindset and his writings that he both acknowledged and despised the existence of God, and in his own words, expressed the desire to, quote, chase God from heaven. Marx once stated, quote, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. While he never personally described his ideology as Satanism, and no true occultist, dark occultist would, Marx's personal belief system was a perfect example of what I, in my work, refer to as de facto Satanism. A great book on the topic of Marx's ideology when it came to uh, the hatred of human beings, the human species, and, and of God is the book Marx and Satan by Richard Wormbrand, highly recommended. Here you see Marx doing the symbol of the hidden hand, the gesture of the hidden hand as it is known. He's basically telling you the forces that, that I move with and that move me are hidden, are occulted. The hand that guides the chess pieces is hidden inside his coat jacket. A lot of dark occultists did this gesture. It was very popular in Freemasonry. It was very popular in, as we're going to talk about a little bit later today, the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati as well. But while Marx's ideology was what I call a de facto Satanist, I would go far beyond that term in what I would describe him as. And what I would truly describe Marx as is this. Karl Marx was an antichrist. Now, I want this fully understood connotatively in my definition of the term. This is not a religious term, okay? What Christian religionists view as the Antichrist is not what I am talking about here. So let me paint the definition uh, of how I'm using the term, okay? <clears throat> my personal concept of an Antichrist is a being who is responsible for the spread of false and harmful if acted upon, information across a significant portion of the human population and the subsequent ubiquitous spread of that deceptive information throughout the majority of humanity. So it's spreading completely false, illusory, and completely harmful ide ideologies throughout the population. The resultant behavior conducted by the population upon taking in this false information leads human society into chaos and degradation and away from the collective evolution of humanity through the attainment of higher consciousness, which should be our goal. That attainment of higher consciousness is often referred to as Christ consciousness. Deceivers of this kind, what I am calling a being that represents the Antichrist ideology. Do not even necessarily do this with conscious intention, though many do. Some Antichrists are simply useful dupes, tasked with the charge of being the messenger or penman, as I believe Marx was, so that the true architects of evil in our world remain hidden or occulted. So hopefully you've recognized many of these, what I call antichrists. And I consider Marx chief among them. Frederick Engels was a German ideologue, political theorist, and revolutionary socialist. He was a businessman and the closest friend and collaborator of Karl Marx. 
Engels met Marx in 1884, and they jointly authored a number of works, including the Communist Manifesto in 1848, and worked as political organizers and activists in the Communist League and First International. Engels' writings on materialism, idealism, and dialectics, all of which we've really talked about, supplied Marxism with its ontological and metaphysical foundation. Engels also helped Marx financially, allowing him to continue his writing after moving to London in 1849. After Marx's death in 1883, Engels compiled volumes one and two of Das Kapital, helped found the socialist organization Second International, and became the leading authority on Marxist political and economic theories. Now, he was his you know, henchman and joint collaborator. Let's talk about the Communist Manifesto and what it really espouses and contains. The Communist Manifesto, or originally the Manifesto of the Communist Party, is a political pamphlet written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, and I would say they were the pen man, the pen men, but appointed by higher level occultists to uh, put this ideology out into the world and disseminate it. It was commissioned by the Communist League so realize that this document was commissioned by uh, an organization whose sole purpose it was to spread communism throughout all of Europe, particularly in England. Okay, that's where the Communist League was founded and operated out of, out of London. The, the Communist Manifesto originally was published in London in, 19, in 1848. The text is first and most systematic, the first and most systematic attempt by Marx and Engels to codify for widespread consumption the core historical materialist idea that, as stated in the text opening words, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Again, being what they called themselves as atheists and uh, materialists. They framed everything about money and resources only. True philosophy and spirituality were left on the back burner. They were left at the door, never really discussed. This was all about money and resources only. Okay, and they want everybody else to believe those are the only motivating factors of all of human society. In which class, uh, social classes are defined by the relationship of people to the means of production. Marx and Engels combine materialism with the Hegelian dialectical method to analyze the development of European society through its modes of production, as we already talked about. Marx and Engels assert that capitalism is marked by the exploitation of the working class wage laborers, the proletariat, by the ruling class, the bourgeoisie. The Communist Manifesto asserts that capitalism does not offer humanity the possibility of self-realization and ensures that human beings remain perpetually stunted and alienated. And I wouldn't necessarily even completely disagree with that. You know, money does that. It has that effect on people, right? But the answer is not to institute uh, complete removal of private property from all human beings into a uh, collectivized form of so-called property that doesn't really exist. The Communist Manifesto theorizes that capitalism will bring about its own destruction and predicts that a revolution will lead to the emergence of a classless communist society. Yeah, they're going to give all the power to the state over all the means of production and distribution of goods and services. The state's going to have that power and then they're going to, they're going to meet out all of those goods and services in a beneficent way and then they're going to dissolve themselves. That's what giving all that power to the state would naturally do, don't you know? Okay? The text ends with a decisive and famous call for solidarity amongst the proletariat, popularized as the slogan, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. The Communist Manifesto remains one of the world's most influential political documents, sadly. These are the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. There are ten general tenets. It's ten general tenets. And the implementations of each of these planks in the United States today, and they're all implemented. We are basically living in a communist country already. It's not coming. It's already here. And we've been living in one. 
the abolition of private property in land, the application of all rents of land to public purpose. This is the property tax and eminent domain. Okay, if you have to pay a tax on so-called property, I have news for you. You don't own the property. Someone else owns it as a feudal lord, and they are renting you the usage of the land through the property tax. And if you don't believe that, you're incorrect. That's the truth of the matter. That's what we have. We have a system of neo-feudalism in America and throughout the world. Number two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Boy, do we have that. You know, that's the income tax and internal revenue service, the IRS. The abolition of all rights of inheritance. This is known in the United States as the estate tax or the death tax. Inheritance has basically been wiped out. I've just been a victim of this. You know, my former partner who passed, verbally and in writing, said, my property is to pass to you. And because that was not done correctly with the state, the state comes in, says we're swooping in and claiming ownership of her estate and giving it to whoever we deem fit. Forget what she wanted. You know, that's what we have. Confiscation, number four, uh, uh, plank of the Communist Manifesto. Confiscation of all of property of all immigrants and rebels. And this is government seizures of property, IRS property confiscation, and the 1997 crime bill. Number five, the centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a central bank with an exclusive monopoly. That is the Federal Reserve System, which all of our money operates according to. So all implemented forms of the communist planks of the Communist Manifesto. Number six, centralization of the means of communication and transportation in the hands of the state. These manifest through the Department of Transportation, the FAA, and the FCC. Number seven, the extension of state-owned industrial production and central planning in agriculture. This is Executive Order 13575, which allows greater government power over food and energy. And many more bills have come down the pike since this one was passed, which tightened that control even further. Number eight, the enforcement of universal obligation of all to work. Okay, as we're going to talk about in communist countries, the penalties for not working. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Literally armies of farmers and, and agriculturalists. And this is implemented in the United States by taxes. Uh, the, the fact that taxes and inflation have forced dual income families. And in many instances, both partners must work multiple jobs. Plus, there is an implementation of uh, the co combination of uh, industry and agriculture. Uh, nine, combination of agriculture and manufacturing industries. It's kind of an adjunct to, to uh, plank eight. Uh, and more equitable distribution of the population over the country. We don't really have that last one, okay? So we have the first part of it. The, the, this is a questionable implementation in the United States, and there may be a revised plan to in, in implement that. But we do have combination of agriculture and manufacturing through robotics, uh, AI, and coming 15-minute cities, which they want to implement as part of uh, Agenda 2030 and the Great Reset. And number 10, the provision of free universal education or public schooling and the abolition of child's factory labor. Uh, obviously, the child's factory labor is actually one of the good uh, uh, planks of the manifesto because we shouldn't be putting forcing children to work in factories. However, the first one, provision of free universal education, leads to the Department of Education, the public school system, and the outcome-based educational model that we're going to talk about that is an indoctrination camp for young people in this country and many others. Every plank of the Communist Manifesto has been implemented in the United States in some form or fashion. We are not heading toward a communist government and society, we're already living in one. Let's look at some of the occultists and secret societies that led to the formation of communism in uh, Europe and elsewhere. The Jacobin Club is the first and probably the most influential. And again, this all goes back to the French Revolution 
and the fomenters of the French Revolution. See, socialism in Europe really has its roots in the French Revolution and also prior to that with the occultist ideologues and secret societies that paved the way to the French Revolution and fomented it. The Society of the Jacobins, commonly known as the Jacobin Club, or simply the Jacobins, was founded in 1789 by anti-royalists from Brittany in northwestern France. The club grew into a nationwide movement with a membership of more than a half a million people, making it the largest and most powerful political organization during the French Revolution. Women were not accepted as members of the Jacobin Club, and their high membership fees confined its membership to well-off men, the rich. The Jacobins claimed to speak on behalf of the people, but were themselves not of the people. Contemporaries saw the Jacobins as a club of the bourgeoisie. So why would they want to implement socialism? And this is what you have to understand by reading information about how these occultists work. I highly recommend the book None Dare Call a Conspiracy by Gary Allen, talking about how throughout time, the very highest level financiers want to give socialism to the public classes, so it basically keeps them in a state of destitution and not owning property and not having resources. They want destitution amongst the average person. This is why the economy is in the shambles that it is in today and the, the rampant destruction of the U.S. economy and the rampant inflation that's taking place. Let's go back to the Jacobin Club. Again, they were seen as bourgeoisie, not of representing the people. And this is a depiction of their meetings. And you see in the balcony section in the back, that, that's where women were confined. They were not allowed to take part in the discussions, but they could observe the proceedings. The Jacobin Club included both French parliamentary factions, the Montan and the Girondins. I hope I'm pronouncing that relatively correct. The Girondin had overthrown King Louis XVI and set up the French First Republic. In May 1793, leaders of the Montan faction led by Maximilien Robespierre succeeded in sidelining the Girondin faction and controlling the government until July 1794. Robespierre, whose political views were rooted in the notion of the social con contract, was viewed as the political force of the Jacobin movement. So he was a Jacobin himself. The Jacobins' time in government featured high levels of political violence, resulting in the execution of 17,000 political opponents nationwide in France. For this reason, the period of the Jacobin government of France is identified as what is called the Reign of Terror. The Jacobins' reign of terror was instituted as a means of combating those who they perceived as enemies within. Kind of like the Night of the Long Knives. In July 1794, the National Convention of France pushed Robespierre and his Jacobin allies out of power and had Robespierre and 21 of his associates executed by guillotine. In November 1794, the Jacobin Club officially disbanded. Jacobin rhetoric would lead to the increasing secularization of Europe throughout the whole 1800s. Again, that's one of their main methodologies and ideologies, secularize, de-spiritualize de the population. You cannot get them focused on philosophy. You cannot get them focused on spirituality. You have to root them in secularism and materialism. The political rhetoric espoused by the Jacobins would lead to the development of the modern leftist movements throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. They all own their origin to the Jacobins. With Jacobinism being the political foundation of almost all leftist schools of thought, including socialism and communism. Georges Valois, uh, founder of the 20th century French fascist party, Fascio, Name, uh, claimed that the roots of fascism also stemmed from the Jacobin movement. Once again, these are not political 
opposites. They are not ideological opposites. They all lead to the same form of state control and human slavery and neo-feudalism. So we have to stop seeing this left and right divide. There is no such thing. The only divide is right versus wrong. That's the only one that we should really concern ourselves with of learning what is true morality. Gropus Babouf, a French proto-communist, revolutionary, and journalist of the French Revolutionary Period. His newspaper, The Tribune of the People, was best known for its advocacy for the poor and calling for a popular revolt against the Directory, the government of France at the time. Babouf was a leading advocate for socialism and the abolition of private property. In spite of the efforts of his Jacobin friends to save him, Babouf was executed for his role in the failed coup d'etat known as the Conspiracy of Equals in May 1796. He's one of the grandfathers of European socialism here. Although the terms communist and socialist did not yet exist in Babouf's life, they have both been used by later scholars to describe his ideology. He has been called the first revolutionary communist. In his book, Manifesto of Equals, Babouf wrote, quote, the French Revolution was nothing but a precursor of another revolution, one that will be bigger, more solemn, and will, which will be the last. Another secret society that really paved the way for socialism and communism throughout Europe was the Carbonari. Most people will have never heard of this one, of course. The Carbonari, also known as the Charcoal Burners, was a revolutionary secret society active in Italy from about 1800 to 1831. The roots of the Carbonari can be traced back to southeastern France around the beginning of the French Revolution. It became a powerful force in the European revolutionary struggles of the early 19th century. The Carbonari was probably derived from the Order of Woodcutters, a fraternal secret society founded by Freemasons in the 1740s in Paris. So we're going to constantly see the influence of tons of occult groups, Freemasonic groups and other occult traditions throughout the, the, the total beginnings and origins of communism and its emergence, uh, of course, uh, through you know, Marx and Engels and then eventually the the, the, the Bolsheviks and Soviets. Members of the Carbonari called one another good cousins and pledged mutual support and protection upon the blade of an axe, a very significant Freemasonic symbol, the axe. And again, also the symbol of the fascists, right? The axe with the surrounding bundle of rods representing centralization of political power and authority. Their lodges were called shops because it was all about wood cutting, wood burning, etc. Which had a system of two degrees. We're going to see all of these secret societies had different degree systems and they patterned these degrees on other uh, secret orders, um, many of which were patterned upon Freemasonry. Uh, the Carbonari only had two, a two degree system, uh, apprentice and master, kind of like you know the Sith. You know, there's an apprentice and there's a master. Members took names drawn from the history of the Middle Ages and had secret signs and passwords to identify themselves to other Carbonari members. Immediately after their initiation, Carbonari members were required to acquire, required to acquire a rifle, 50 rounds of ammunition, and a dagger and be prepared to use them in a revolutionary capacity. This was one of the symbols used by the Carbonari, obviously leveraging Christian symbolism, it's the symbolism of the Vatican there with the crossed keys, which is still used by the Vatican today, and an upward and downward pointing cross. And then the symbols of Alpha and Omega representing God and or Christ. But also putting the pentacle in the middle of it, the upright pointing pentacle, which is a symbol of Wicca and witchcraft, the Carbonari had a high degree of success in organizing political pressure and revolutionary violence across Europe. The Carbonari used popular religious symbolism, as I've just said, instead of esoteric symbolism, making it more acceptable in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox countries where it operated. 
It recruited its membership largely from the middle classes, although it also employed a strategy of infiltration by recruiting bureaucrats, policemen, and soldiers. This made it easy for the Carbonari to counter efforts to suppress them, since police and soldiers tasked to hunt them down were, as often as not, Carbonari members themselves. Again, they infiltrated the entire culture. Some of the most famous revolutionaries of the time were members of the Carbonari. Philip Buonarroti, organizer of several, uh, Felipe Buonarroti, organizer of several revolutionary secret societies, had close connections with the Carbonari during his years in Swiss exile and made use of his Carbonari connections in recruiting for his primary secret society, the Sublime Perfect Masters. So uh, we're going to look at uh, Buonarroti and the Sublime Perfect Masters. Before that, let's take a look at the occult society or the secret society known as the Philadelphs. One of the most important political secret societies of the 19th century, the Philadelphs, began in 1797 as a student literary club in eastern France. It utilized rituals modeled on other fraternal secret societies, mainly Freemasonry, as I said before. The Philadelphs took on a more political focus after Napoleon Bonaparte seized power in France in 1799. Two assassination attempts on Napoleon are tied to the Philadelphs. The Philadelphs also made several attempts to prepare for a full-scale rebellion against Napoleon, but none of those attempts went very far. <clears throat> The Philadelphs reached Italy sometime after 1807 when Italian exiles in Paris became members and began planning organized resistance to Napoleon. Known as Philadelphi or Adelphi in Italy, the organization played an active role in the complex politics of the early 19th century. The revolutionary <coughs> Felipe Buonarroti became a member of the Philadelphs while in prison for his involvement in the conspiracy of equals and organized a Philadelph circle in Geneva, Switzerland after his release from prison in 1806. From 1818 to the mid-1820s, Buonarroti's secret society, the Sublime Perfect Masters, infiltrated the Philadelph leadership in Italy and took control of the organization. So you're also going to see throughout, uh, if you study occultism, absorption by certain secret societies, by other larger secret societies. They, they absorb and condense their membership. Along with the Carbonari, the Philadelphs helped coordinate preparations for the widespread revolutions of 1820 and 1821. It then dissolved, with many of its members absorbed by other secret societies with familiar aims, among them the Grand Lodge of Philadelphs, a clandestine Masonic Lodge of the Rites of Memphis and Mizraim, which we already looked into in the last section. Felipe Buonarroti, an Italian utopian socialist, Freemason, conspirator, and secret society leader. Buonarroti's ideology proposed a strategy that would revolutionize society in stages, starting from monarchy, then proceeding to liberalism, then to radicalism, and finally to communism, meaning the ab abolition of private property. In 1786, he was initiated into Freemasonry and joined a Masonic Lodge that was under the direct control of the Bavarian Illuminati Occult Order. In 1789, Buonarroti visited Paris and met with Maximilien Robespierre. He was soon brought into the midst of Robespierre's French Revolutionary Government. With the fall of Robespierre's government after the Thermidor Coup d'etat of 1794, Buonarroti lost political support in Paris and was imprisoned in March of 1795. While in prison, he met Gracchus Babouf. Again, all of these people and organizations merge and come together. It's a tightly interwoven network. In order to see that interwoven aspect of occultism, you really have to study all the elements of it and all the groups and, and, and occultists within it. It, it's, a, it's a lifelong study, and it's, it's very 
labyrinthine. Okay, it's not a very simple structure. If you really want to get down to the nitty gritty of the details, it's very labyrinthine. Okay, so you have to be prepared for that. Um, <clears throat> while in prison, he met Gracchus Babuth, Babuth, another ambitious radical. Upon their release in October 1795, they formed a secret society called the Society of the Pantheon. When the society was suppressed by French police in February 1796, its most committed members formed a revolutionary secret society called the Conspiracy of Equals. Following the Conspiracy of Equals failed coup d'etat during the French Revolution, Buonarroti was imprisoned again until 1806. While in prison, he became a member of another secret society, the Philadelphs, which we already talked about. After his release, he moved to Geneva and resumed his revolutionary activities, starting a Philadelphia group in a local Masonic lodge and planning a coup against Napoleon's government. In 1808, he organized the Sublime Perfect Masters. Now keep in mind that name because we want to talk about another organization that had the concept of being perfect in their original name. So he formed the Sublime Perfect Masters in 1808, which became the first international secret society of the 19th century and plotted a continent-wide revolution to establish socialist governments and to abolish private property throughout Europe. Okay, one of the most important foundational occultic revolutionaries of his time and again, paving the way for both the French Revolution and eventually the Bolshevik Revolution. Bonarotti was driven out of Switzerland and went to Brussels, where he relaunched the sublime perfect masters as Le Monde, or the world. Again, this concept of globalism, that we're going to take it all, we're going to take everything. In 1828, he published a book on the French Revolution and the conspiracies that followed it called Conspiracy for Equality, which became the Bible of liberal secret societies throughout the 19th century. The same year, he published History of Babouf's Conspiracy of Equals, which became a quintessential text for revolutionaries, inspiring many socialists, including Louis, Louis Auguste Blanqui and Karl Marx. In 1830, Buonarroti moved to Paris. In 1832, he created a new international secret society called Reformed Carbonarism, which was based on the Carbonari. He expanded this society into the universal democratic Carbonarism in 1833. Bonarotti died in Paris in 1837. Louis-Auguste Blanqui learned many of his insurrectionary skills and tactics from Buonarroti. He also inspired, inspired Mikhail Bakunin, who was heavily influenced by Buonarroti revolutionary practices and Buonarroti's revolutionary practices and praised him as the greatest conspirator of his age, uh, Bakunin said. His organization, the Sublime Perfect Masters, one of the principal secret societies founded by Felipe Buonarroti, the Sublime Perfect Masters, took shape in Geneva in 1809 as an inner circle of the revolutionaries drawn from the Philadelphs. Again, we're seeing the dynamic of esoteric versus esoteric. Exoteric is the outside, the Philadelphs were the exoteric, and then the Sublime Perfect Masters were the esoteric sect within the Philadelphs. Uh, he, uh, it took shape in Geneva as an inner circle of the revolutionaries drawn from the Philadelphs, another secret society of the time, and from liberal Masonic circles. Unlike the Philadelphs, which focused their efforts on the destruction of Napoleon, the sublime perfect masters set their sights on the more ambitious goal of launching revolutions throughout Europe to bring about socialist governments and the abolition of private property. This was the entire agenda at the time, but from all of these groups, they took the ideas of previous uh, De people who desired to abo abolish private property and bring in neo-feudalism, and they built upon those ideologies. Marx is a result of that. 
Okay, they inspired him to think the way he thought. And the, the language was not socialist and communist at the time. It was like, hey, there's, there's an ultra-rich class and they're the propertied class. They own the property and we have to abolish property. You know, not that everybody should have their equal and rightful share of property, okay, uh, or, or have their own private property, I should say, but no, abolish it all. Abolish it as a, as a wrong idea and axiom that you can't own anything. Well, folks, if you can't own anything, you have no rights. You don't own yourself. Chief and principle among all forms of property is the ownership of the self, which is the basis of all spirituality. And if you can't own that as property, you can't own anything else as property. That's why they want to abolish all, all forms of property. The sublime perfect masters followed the older 18th century pattern of secret societies and drew heavily on the symbolism and practices of Freemasonry. Again, please do not just see Freemasonry as evil. They are distorting what Freemasonry is supposed to be teaching and conveying to people. Freemasonry is a... Uh, an allegorical system of morality conveyed in symbols and allegorical stories. There is nothing wrong with the pure form of Freemasonry. It's how it has been distorted and perverted by these occultists. The Sublime Perfect Masters worked through a three-degree system, Apprentice, Sublime Elect, and Areopagus. Keep in mind that last term, Areopagus, or the guiding body. Above these degrees was a central coordinating body, the Grand Firmament. Again, you're get going out of the exoteric layer of even this esoteric society into an even deeper inner circle, okay? The Grand Firmament, whose existence was kept secret from everyone outside the Areopagus level. Areopagus level. Members learned very little about the workings of the society on their admission. And only those of proven loyalty were advanced through the degree system. Such a system displays close alignment to the Bavarian Illuminati order. Buonarroti probably borrowed it from his early experience in an Illuminati-controlled Masonic Lodge. Almost certainly did. The Sublime Perfect Masters served primarily as a coordinating body for liberal secret societies across Europe, and at its height in 1820, it had members in Spain, France, Belgium, Italy, Germany, Denmark, and Switzerland. Along with the Carbonari, it played a significant role in the wave of rebellions that swept through Europe in 1820 and 21. In the aftermath of these risings, informers leaked details of the order's activity to police in several countries, meaning the sublime perfect master's details. As a result, Felipe Buonarroti was exiled from Geneva, Switzerland. The next conspirator and socialist that we have to look at his activity is Louis-Auguste Blanqui. He was a French socialist and political activist notable for his revolutionary theory of Blanquism. Blanqui was a member of the Carbonari secret society since 1824 and took an active part in most political conspiracies of his time. Blanqui's uncompromising radicalism and his determination to enforce it by violence brought him into conflict with every French government during his lifetime, and as a consequence, he spent half of his life in prison. As a socialist, Blanqui favored what he described as a just redistribution of wealth. It's always just, isn't it? However, Blanqui is distinguished in various ways from other socialist currents of the day. Blanqui did not believe in the preponderant role of the working class. This is key to understand regarding Blanqui's version of radicalism and uh, revolution. Uh, nor did he believe in popular movements. He thought, and really focus in on this here, this is really key in this whole section. He thought, Blanqui thought, that revolution should be carried out by a relatively small group of highly organized and secretive conspirators who would establish a, quote, temporary dictatorship by force. 
Having seized political power, the revolutionaries would then use the power of the state to introduce socialism. Folks, if you haven't read None Dare Call Conspiracy, I mean, this is exactly what has happened in the United States. And the author of None Dare Call Conspiracy, Gary Allen, warned everybody about it in the year 1970 and nobody paid any damn attention. You know, he told people about all of this. He knew how it worked. He knew how people were implementing this global conspiracy. He knew what the end goal was and he was almost like a prophet warning the American public and people throughout the world and they just didn't listen. This period of so-called transitional tyranny would permit the implementation of, in Blanqui's words, a new order, a new world order, after which power would then be handed to the people. We're just going to dismantle our apparatus of total control and give it over to the public. Don't you know that's how it always works? Blanquism is considered a particular type of putschism, the view that a political revolution should take the form of a putsch or coup d'etat. Blanquism was more concerned with the revolution itself rather than with the future society that would result from it. For Blanquist, revolution and the overturning of the bourgeois social order are ends sufficient in themselves. Some men just want to watch the world burn, as the saying goes. The League of Outlaws, another very uh, influential revolutionary secret society, uh, a German revolutionary secret society founded in Paris in 1834. And again, you see this constant reinforced idea of it's, it's German founded, but it's operating in other countries. Just like Marx and Engels, just like the Communist League, as we're going to see, and the League of Outlaws was no different. It was founded in Paris in 1834 by a group of German exiles. Its founder, Theodore Schuster, drew most of his ideas from earlier secret societies such as the Carbonari and the Philadelphs, and from the writings of Felipe Buonarroti, one of the most influential revolutionists of his time. The League of Outlaws, and again, uh, so secretive, there is no insignia, there is no logo, there is no banner, etc. Okay, so th this is just a historical depictment here. Uh, the League of Outlaws had a hierarchical structure derived from the Carbonari and was among the first European revolutionary groups to push for a social revolution to abolish class barriers and eliminate worker exploitation. Theodore Schuster argued that the major divides in the Europe of his time were between classes, not nations, and proclaimed a future cooperative republic in which peasant cooperatives and government intervention would keep the influence of wealthy capitalists in check. It works so well. The League of Outlaws thus pioneered the ideologies later claimed by communist secret societies and communist regimes. The League of the Just was a, uh, w which followed the League of Outlaws, was a communist secret society founded in 1836 by branching off from its predecessor, the League of Outlaws, formed in Paris in 1834 by Jacob Venday and Venaday and Theodore Schuster. The League of the Just was originally headquartered in Paris and was largely composed of German emigrants. Again, people leaving Germany or being exiled from Germany for these beliefs and then carrying it into other areas of Europe. Uh, again, um, I don't believe there's any symbolism or insignias of the League of the Just either. Uh, the League of the Just was originally headquartered in Paris and was largely composed of German emigrants. Most members of the League of the Just were primarily tailors and woodworkers whose stated goal was the millennialist idea of the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth or the new Jerusalem described as utopian communists. And again, the word utopia means nowhere. It means it doesn't exist anywhere except in your mind. 
okay? I'm not a utopianist. I don't believe in utopias. I'm a pragmatist. I'm, I'm a real world, you know, analyzer of things and very much focused on real world solutions. No, there is no perfect place. Utopia is a, the word literally in Greek means no place, okay? It doesn't exist. Most members of the League of the Just were followers of the first revolutionary communist, Gracchus Babuf. They predicted and anticipated a social revolution, which one of their leaders, Karl Schapper, very important, described as the great resurrection day of the people. So you see all of this pseudo-religious connotations uh, involved in their rhetoric. The League of the Just eventually adopted a pyramidal structure, the structure we've already looked at, inspired by the Italian Masonic Revolutionary Secret Society, the Carbonari. Their long-term goal was to establish a, quote, social republic in the German states. The most prominent le leader within the League of the Just was Wilhelm Weitling. Weitling, a German radical political activist and one of the first theorists of communism, proclaimed himself a, quote, social Luther and denounced private property. And we'll see this over and over again by these occultists and groups. Many members of the League of the Just were involved in the Blanquist revolt of May 12, 1839. This led to the group being expelled by the French government. The League of the Just proceeded to move to London. Over and over again, you're going to see that pattern, okay? Where they continued to grow, reaching a peak membership of over 1,000 members. In June 1847, the League of the Just merged with the Communist Correspondence Committee, an organization led by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels to form the Communist League, and Karl Schapper was very instrumental in that as well. The Communist League tasked, tasked Marx and Engels with writing a political platform. So that is the organization that gave them the job of being the pen men for the Communist League. The resulting document was, of course, the Communist Manifesto. The Communist League, widely regarded as the first Marxist political party, was established on June 1st, 1847 in London, England. This was not operating out of Germany or Russia. It was operating out of London. And we're going to see the real social engineering think tanks and secret societies that were operating out of London that led to all of this. The organization was formed through the merger of the League of the Just, headed by Karl Schapper, and the Communist Correspondence Committee of Brussels, Belgium, in which Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were the dominant personalities. In January 1847, disparate parts of the German communist movement began to congeal into a single organizational entity when the League of the Just suggested the idea of unity with the Communist Correspondence Committee. On January 20th, 1847, Karl Schapper requested that Karl Marx join the League of the Just. So Marx was actually brought into what would become the Communist League and eventually the Communist Party by Karl Schapper, very influential occultist. Both Marx and Engels joined the League of the Just shortly thereafter, followed by other members of the Communist Correspondence Committee. And this is the plain red flag used by many of these organizations. They did not have symbolism, they just bore a, a plain red flag. In June 1847, the first Congress of the League of the Just took place in London. At this conference, the League adopted a new charter and formally, formally changed its name to the Communist League. The Communist League was structured around the reformation of primary party units known as communes, consisting of at least three, but not more than ten members. These were in turn to be combined into larger units known as circles. The agenda of the Communist League called for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie and establishment of the rule of the proletariat and the construction of a new society free of both private property and social classes. In November and December 1847, the Communist League held a Congress in London. 
both Marx and Engels attended, and they were assigned the task of composing a political manifesto for the organization. This became the Communist Manifesto. In 1850, a German spy, Wilhelm Stieber, stole the Communist League's register of members and sent it to France and several German states, bringing about the imprisonment of several of its members. From October 4th to November 12th, 1852, the Prussian government conducted the Cologne Communist trial against 11 members of the Communist League who were suspected of having participated in the 1848 uprisings, a series of protests and rebellions in the states of the German Confederation and Austrian Empire. Seven of the 11 members tried were sentenced to prison terms up to six years. Following the Cologne Communist trial, the Communist League was formally disbanded in November 1852. Let's look at Karl Schapper, one of the main members of the Communist League and instrumental with its creation. Karl Schapper was a German socialist and communist. He was one of the pioneers of communism in Germany and a close associate of Karl Marx. I would say he was one of Marx's closest mentors. In 1832, Schapper participated in a failed insurrection in Frankfurt, Germany, and was imprisoned. He managed to escape after three months and made his way to Switzerland, where he became a follower of the utopian communist Wilhelm Weitling. Schapper subsequently joined Young Germany, a radical socialist think tank of writers, which existed from about 1830 to 1850. Young Germany was modeled on and affiliated with Giuseppe Mazzini's Young Italy, another secret society operating out of Italy. Young Germany, who Schapper was you know, a member, was regarded as dangerous by many politicians due to its progressive viewpoint. And in December 1835, many of its publications were banned in Germany by the Frankfurt Parliament, which claimed that its members were attempting to, quote, attack the Christian religion and, quote, destroy all morality by championing moral relativism through their writings. In 1834, Schapper participated in Giuseppe Mazzini's unsuccessful attempt at an armed invasion of Savoy from Switzerland and was once again imprisoned. This is going to become very clear and significant once we talk about who Giuseppe Mazzini was, if you don't already know that. In 1836, Schapper was deported from Switzerland for his political activities and went to Paris, where he joined the League of the Just. As a member of the League of the Just, Schapper helped forge links between German socialists and radical French communist groups of the 1830s and 40s. In 1839, Schapper became involved in an unsuccessful insurrection in Paris by the revolutionary secret society known as the Society of the Seasons and was again imprisoned. In 1840, Schapper was expelled from France and went to London, where he established the Communist League in 1847. In the Communist League, Schapper helped pave the way from the utopian communism of Weitling to the materialist socialism of Marx and Engels. He was responsible for organizing the publication of Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto in 1848. This was the man responsible for publishing and distributing the Communist Manifesto. In 1864, Schapper was involved in the founding of Karl Marx Communist Organization First International in London and was elected to its first governing body, the General Council, in 1865. Schapper died from tuberculosis in London on April 28, 1870. Now, as I said before, you have to understand uh, Schapper's role in all of this and the fomentation of uh, communism throughout Europe by understanding <laughs> the nature of his relationship with Giuseppe Mazzini. Giuseppe Mazzini was the spearhead of the Italian revolutionary movement. His efforts helped bring about a unified Italy in place of separate states in the 19th century. Mazzini was an Italian nationalist in the historical radical tradition and a proponent <clears throat> excuse me and a proponent of a social democratic state. 
meaning democratic socialism, or as we're going to talk about, incremental socialism. Mazzini helped define the modern European movement for popular democracy. In 1827, Mazzini traveled to Tuscany, where he became a member of the Carbonari, secret society. It all leads back to them in many ways. In 1831, Mazzini was expelled to France and settled in Marseille, where he became a popular figure among Italian exiles. That year, he founded a new political society called Giovini Giovine Italia, Young Italy, a secret society formed to promote Italian unification. Mazzini believed that a popular uprising would create a unified Italy and would touch off a European-wide revolutionary movement. Young Italy sought to unite revolutionary groups who wanted to achieve unification through force. Most of Mazzini's associates in Young Italy were members of the Carbonari and borrowed much of the new organization's structure and technique from Carbonari traditions. From Mazzini's headquarters in Marseille, Young Italy established an extensive network of supporters throughout the in Italian peninsula, distributed propaganda, and infiltrated the armed forces and government bureaucracies. Again, a prominent tactic within socialism and communism. Young Italy had over 60,000 members by 1833, which branch with, with branches in Genoa and other cities. After imprisonment for his revolutionary activities, Mazzini reformed Young Italy in 1834. Mazzini went on to create several organizations aimed at the unification or liberation of other nations in the wake of Young Italy, including Young Germany, Young Poland, and Young Switzerland, all under the support and umbrella of the continent-wide Young Europe. The Young Europe movement inspired a group of young Turkish cadets and students who later named themselves the Young Turks. Mazzini's thought was characterized by a strong religious fervor, and this made him unpopular with some socialists and revolutionaries. He was a believer in divine providence, describing himself as a Christian, emphasized the necessity of a, quote, relationship with God, and vehemently denounced atheism. His motto was God and the people. Simultaneously, Mazzini rejected the concept of the rights of man. I mean, imagine this. You believe in a creator, and you don't believe that rights are instituted by the creator of the universe and are, are birthrights of human beings. So he didn't believe in the concept of the rights of man, arguing instead that individual rights were a, quote, duty to be won through work, sacrifice, and virtue, rather than rights being intrinsic to humanity. His ideology polarized his contemporaries. For some, he was a godlike figure, and he was denounced by others as a traitor. Some praised Mazzini as the savior of Italy, while others called him the evil genius of Italy, and claimed that he was attempting to, quote, impose a new religion on the population of Europe. Karl Marx did not agree with Mazzini's ideological worldview. Marx believed that Mazzini's point of view had become reactionary and the proletariat had nothing to do with it. Again, but most real conspirators, again, adopted more of the the putsch or coup d'etat uh, by a very selective, highly trained conspirator organization, which would infiltrate institutions, take them over from the inside, then institute a socialist revolution. Mazzini was more of that type of uh, revolutionary. Um, Mazzini's socio-political thought had been has been referred to as Mazzini. Mazzinianism, Mazzinianism, a term later used by Benito Mussolini and his fascist regime to describe their political ideology and spiritual conception of life. The 20th century activist Albert Charles Bruce argued that, quote, socialism is found in its entirety in the doctrine of Giuseppe Mazzini, one of the most powerful influences of socialism during this time period. Okay, so here's where it gets very interesting. In 1860, Giuseppe Mazzini had formed a secret society called the Oblonica, derived from the Latin noun obelus or obelisk, 
Within this group, Mazzini established an inner order which eventually evolved into La Cosa Nostra, the Italian Mafia, with many of its members coming to America during the 1890s with the beginning of Italian immigration in America. Mazzini was certainly an occultist and became involved in Freemasonry earlier in his life. In the 1830s, he made efforts to carry on the activities of the infamous occult order, the Bavarian Illuminati, through the Alta Vendita Lodge, the highest Masonic lodge of the Carbonari. In 1834, only a few years after the death of its first Grand Master, Adam Weishaupt, Giuseppe Mazzini was appointed head of the Order of the Illuminati in Bavaria, Germany. So that brings us to the famous Order of the Illuminati. Now, one thing I want to make perfectly clear, I am not talking about a worldwide secret society that is trying to take over the world in the modern day. We are talking about an old secret society operating out of Bavaria, Germany, and then spread to other parts of Europe. I despise and detest the term Illuminati being applied to the psychopaths who run our world today. They are not illuminated or enlightened. They are garbage, psychopathic lunatics and should not be referred to as enlightened. This is the, the hubris of a completely diseased psyche of people like this to call themselves enlightened. So I hate the term Illuminati for, oh, the grand conspiracy trying to take over things. Uh, you know, it is a conspiracy, and it is worldwide, but it's a conspiracy of totally uh, immoral, psychopathic lunatics. Call them that, don't call them the Illuminati. But there was, thank you, there was an order known as the Illuminati that we need to talk about because they very, very, very significantly influenced socialism throughout Europe. So let's take a look at the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati. The Bavarian Order of the Illuminati, also known as the Enlightened Ones, which is what Illuminati means in Latin, was founded by Adam Weishaupt on Beltane, May 1st, 1776, the same year that the American Revolution kicked off in earnest, as the, quote, ancient illuminated seers of Bavaria. So that was its formal name, the ancient illuminated seers of Bavaria. Again, Bavaria, a state in southern Germany. Its name was soon changed to the Order of the Illuminati. And as I'm going to tell you in a moment, it did have another name prior to that. It was secretive, hierarchical, and heavily modeled upon the Jesuit order or the Society of Jesus. Weishaupt, born February 6, 1748 in Ingolstadt, Bavaria, Germany, was educated by the Jesuits who converted him to Catholicism. Although he became a Catholic priest, he purportedly later developed an intense hatred for the Jesuits, and he became an atheist. After his separation from the Jesuits, Weishaupt became a master occultist, studying astrology, Freemasonry, Kabbalah, the Egyptian mystery traditions, or the traditions of Kamut, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, the Eleusinian mysteries, Solomonic magic, the teaching of the Essenes, and perhaps most influential, influentially, Pythagoreanism. One of the fundamental teachings of Pythagoras, a 6th century BC Greek philosopher, was that human beings should combine all their belongings into a form of mutual ownership. Much of that, and if you really want to go back to where communism comes from, you've got to go back to ancient Greece and Pythagoras. Okay? Much later in human history, this Pythagorean doctrine became the underlying ideology behind the inception of communism in the modern day. In 1770, Weishaupt was chosen by the international banker Meyer Amschel Rothschild 
to develop an organization that could be used for political revolution to weaken the status of Great Britain in Europe. And that is what the Illuminati would become. In 1773, Weishaupt began focusing on establishing this revolutionary organization. To confuse his detractors, he based the organizational structure on the one used by the Jesuits. However, his intention was to have a secret coalition of liberalism. Additionally, Weishaupt wanted to use the Illuminati to replace Christianity with what he called a religion of reason to strive for, quote, the perfection of morals, and, quote, make of the human race one good and happy family. It's always under that umbrella. Prior to its official founding on May 1st, Beltane, Valpurgisnacht, 1776, the original name of the order was Bund, de, Bund der Perfectibilisten, or League of Perfectibilists, or League of Perfectionists, okay? And they felt that they would perfect themselves and become, again, as Buonarroti put it, the sublime, perfect masters of the world. Their original symbol was a shield similar to the Jesuit seal shield but they replaced the Jesuit phrase, extension of the kingdom of God, which is one of the Jesuits' mottos, with the words, the perfection of man. Okay, and you can't find that shield anywhere. I looked all over for it, and it has been scrubbed, and there's probably just, it was so secretive that they did not really keep copies of it or, or have it engraved anywhere. It was just very, 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 you know, kept under, under uh, wraps. So, Weishaupt soon changed the name to Illuminatenorden. That means the Order of the Illuminati. So that is the actual German name of the Order of the Illuminati, the Illuminatenorden. The symbol of the order became the primordial archetype and Freemasonic symbol of the sun, a circle with a dot in the center depicted there. And that is a rudimentary representation of the all-seeing eye, which eventually became associated with the order of the Illuminati. Headquartered in Munich, Germany, and beginning with only five members, Adam Weishaupt, Franz Massenhausen, Max Mertz, Agathon Balhoff, who he was so secretive, we, didn't, we don't even know what his real first name was, he called himself Agathon, and Andreas Sutor. The Illuminati became fully operational by the summer of 1778. Other lodges were eventually created in Ingolstadt, Heidelberg, Upper Bavaria, and Frankfurt in Germany. Originally, the Order of the Illuminati had three degrees, novice, Minerva and illuminated Minerva. Select members became members of the Areopagus. We already heard about that in the Sublime Perfect Masters, the Order's ruling council. Some members called insinuants were permitted to recruit for the Illuminati. All members were required to adopt classical code names from history as were members of other revolutionary secret societies that we already talked about. A system of mutual espionage kept Weishaupt informed of the activities of all of his members. Their rituals and ceremonies were similar to that of the Freemasons. Describing the Illuminati, Weishaupt himself wrote this, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. The order wishes to be secret and to work in silence. And that's how darkness always operates. Evil and darkness never do their work in the light of day because some good people would rise up against them to stop them. That's why they always want the cloak of secrecy. Few knew the true direction and agenda of the order. 
Only those within the inner circle, known as the Areopagite, the tribunal or the ruling council, were aware of their true purpose. Vaishap described to all other members that their ultimate objective was the creation of a one world government to, quote, prevent future wars. It's gone so well <laughs> ever since. Weishaupt once described the true purpose of the Illuminati as this, quote, nothing less than to win power and riches, to undermine secular and religious government, and to obtain the mastery of the world, end quote. He wrote, quote, the art of Illuminism lay in enlisting dupes as well as adepts, and by encouraging the dreams of honest visionaries, or the schemes of fanatics, by flattering the vanity of ambitious egotists, top uh, ideology of Satanism, and by working on unbalanced brains, or by playing on such passions as greed and power to make men of totally divergent aims serve the secret purpose of the sect. These people swell our numbers and fill our money box. They must be made to nibble at the bait. But let us beware of telling them our secrets so that our real purpose should remain impenetrable to our inferiors. Yeah. Vaishap taught Illuminati initiates that Jesus Christ was, quote, the first advocator of Illuminism and that Christ's secret mission was to strongly encourage his disciples to despise riches in order to prepare the world for the community of goods that would do away with private property. A repeated theme throughout all socialist ideologies throughout time. Women were also enlisted into the Illuminati. Weishaupt wrote this about that. He, he said, quote, there is no way of influencing men so powerful as by means of women. Women should therefore be our chief study. We should insinuate ourselves into their good opinion, give them hints of emancipation from the tyranny of public opinion and of standing up for themselves. This sex has a large part of the world in their hands, end quote. Female members were divided into two groups, one group of, quote, society women to give the organization an air of respectability, and the other group described by Weishaupt as those, quote, who would help to satisfy those brothers who have a penchant for pleasure, end quote. The Illuminati used monetary and sexual bribery to gain control of men in high places, then blackmailed them with the threat of public exposure and financial ruin. At the Congress of Wilhelmsbad, an understanding was reached between Freemasonry, the Masonic Lodges of Europe at the time, and the Illuminati, the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati of Germany, which would add to the Illuminati the first three degrees of Freemasonry. After the Congress, the Illuminati functioned under a more complex organizational structure that looked like this. Degree one was the nursery. It had four sub-degrees. Preparation, novice, minerval, and illuminated minerval, borrowing on the former structure. Degree number two was the Masonic degrees, and it had two sections, symbolic masonry and Scottish Rite masonry. In symbolic masonry, it had three subdegrees: apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. In Scottish, ma Scottish masonry section, it had two subdegrees: Illuminatus Major or Novice and Illuminatus Dirigens or Knight. Finally, in the top level degree, the Mysteries, broken into two subcategories, the Lesser Mysteries and the Greater Mysteries, just like the knowledge of the occult, the Lesser Arcana and the Greater Arcana. And the Lesser Mysteries were broken into the rites of Presbyter and Regent or Priest, priest and Prince, and the Greater Mysteries Finally, the highest level of the Illuminati, uh, the sub, uh, uh, the sub um, uh, degrees magus or magician, and finally rex or king, again becoming God. 
The Illuminati spread from Bavaria, Germany throughout all of Germany and eventually into Austria and Switzerland. Soon they had members from all walks of life including students, merchants, doctors, lawyers, judges, professors, civil officers, bankers, and ministers. It's really kind of identical to what I have described that I saw in the dark occult order that, that I participated in. They had institutional members in positions of power in, throughout every walk of life and every social institution on the face of the earth. By 1784, their membership reached nearly 3,000. By 1786, they had lodges across Germany, Austria, Hungary, England, Scotland, Poland, France, Belgium, Switzerland, Italy, Holland, Spain, Sweden, Russia, Ireland, Africa, and the Americas, pretty much all over the world. By the Third Masonic Congress of Frankfurt in 1786, the Illuminati virtually controlled all the Masonic lodges of Europe. And the Freemasons of America wrote about this, especially George Washington, who warned of the order of the Illuminati's influence in American Freemasonry, repeatedly. And again, did people listen? No. They want to believe what they want to believe, and they don't want to believe that sinister influence like this is taking place. So, um, uh, and at its meetings, their goals were solidified as this. They would try to institute pantheism for higher degrees and atheism for lower degrees and the general populace. Communal ownership of goods, again, socialism. The abolition of private property, the destruction of all forms of Christianity, and the removal of all existing human governments to make way for a universal republic. This is a worldwide government uh, under their system in which the, quote, utopian ideology of complete separation from moral and religious restraint should reign. This is Satanism. This is moral relativism. This is pure egotism, completely out of control, and wanting to become God. It's the same ideology as Nazism. It's the same ideology as communism. Weishaupt elaborated the Illuminati's plan to infiltrate and redirect societal institutions, writing, quote, I propose academies under the direction of the order. This will secure us the adherence of the literati, meaning the intelligentsia. Science shall here be the lure. We must acquire the direction of education, of church, management of the professional chair, and of the pulpit. So again, it's the act of infiltration of all societal institutions, including religion. Weishaupt proposed training at special schools for future, future societal leaders who would be placed into positions of power behind the scenes as, quote, experts and, quote, advisors to perpetuate Illuminati goals. To ensure that the activities of the Illuminati would remain secret, warnings regarding the consequences for betraying the order were included in their initiation ceremonies a sword would be pointed at the initiate and they would be told, quote, if you are a traitor, learn that all our brothers are called upon to arm themselves against you. Do not hope to escape or find a place of safety. Wherever you are, the rage of our brothers will pursue you and torment you to the innermost recesses of your entrails. In October 1783, Joseph Unschneider, a lawyer who had left the Illuminati in August of that year, presented to Bavarian Duchess Maria Anna a document which detailed the act, all of the activities of the Order of the Illuminati. On June 22, 1784, the Illuminati was outlawed by the edict of the Duke, Karl Theodor Dahlberg, the Elector of Bavaria, after discovering that the goals of the Illuminati were, quote, to, quote, in time rule the world by overthrowing all civil government. On March 2nd, 1785, Dahlberg issued a proclamation identifying the Illuminati as a branch of Freemasonry. I would say it had just infiltrated all of Freemasonry. The government of Bavaria began a war against the Order of the Illuminati and initiated judicial inquiries. 
In an attempt to preserve the secrecy of their motives, the Illuminati's Areopagite, or ruling council, burned many of their documents. However, the Bavarian government was able to seize, seize many of their papers upon the raiding of their lodges. On September 9, 1785, three more ex-members of the Bavarian Illuminati, Cassandi, Cassandi, Grunberger, and Renner, I, don't, I was not able to locate their first names, appeared before a Bavarian court of inquiry where they supplied Illuminati membership lists and revealed their aims and goals to be these six general agendas. Number one, the abolition of the monarchy. Number two, the abolition of private property. Number three, the abolition of inheritance. Does this sound familiar? Number four, the abolition of patriotism. Number five, the abolition of the family through the abolition of marriage, morality, and the institution of communal education for children. I don't know. That sounds like I heard that somewhere else earlier. I just can't put my finger on it. And finally, six, the abolition of all religion. The purpose, purposes of these six points of abolition were to divide humanity politically, socially and economically and to weaken countries to create an international one world government with the centralization of all political power. That is what communism ultimately is, ladies and gentlemen. Weishaupt was preparing to set his plans into motion for the French Revolution, which was planned for 1789. In July of 1785, he instructed Bavarian lawyer and one of the Illuminati's most prominent leaders, Xavier Zwack, to put their plans into book form. Zwack's document contained a, his a history of the Illuminati and many of their ideas for expansion and future endeavors. A copy was sent to carrier Jacob Lance to Illuminati members in Paris and Prussia but after leaving Frankfurt on horseback, Lance was struck by lightning and killed, and authorities found the document and turned it over to the Bavarian government. Zwack's house was searched by the police in October 1785, and his papers were seized. Documents, papers, and correspondences were discovered, including over 200 letters written between Weishaupt and other members of the Areopagite, which dealt with Illuminati matters of the highest secrecy. The following year, more information was seized from the houses of other Illuminati members, which contained their secret codes and symbols, calendar timetables, geographic locations, insignias, ceremonies of initiation, recruiting instructions, statutes, a partial roster of members, and nearly 130 official seals from the government which were used to counterfeit state documents. In 1786, the government of Bavaria gathered all of the confiscated documents and published them in a book called The Original Writings of the Order and Sect of the Illuminati, which was circulated to every government and every crowned head in Europe, including France, to warn them of the impending danger, which was just getting ready to come down on France in the form of the French Revolution. Leaders of the Illuminati were arrested and interrogated. However, these revelations and the pub publication of their documents did little to alert the public because of their unbelievable claims of how deeply they were entrenched in all of European society. On November 15, 1790, Duke Dahlberg issued another edict whereby anyone found to be an active member of the Illuminati was to be put to death. In subsequent years, the group was vilified by conservative and religious critics who claimed that the Illuminati continued to operate in secret and were ultimately responsible for the French Revolution. Weishaupt himself wrote that, quote, the great care of the Illuminati after the publication of their secret writings was to persuade the whole of Germany that the order no longer existed. Describing future plans for the order, Weishaupt wrote, quote, By this plan we shall direct all mankind. Occupations must be allotted and contrived, that we may, in secret, influence all political transactions. 
To hide their subversive activities, the highest members of the Order of the Illuminati began to masquerade as humanitarians and philanthropists. <laughs> the Order eventually moved their headquarters to London, where it began to grow yet again. Weishaupt told Illuminati members to infiltrate the blue lodges of Freemasonry and to form secret circles within them. Only Freemasons who proved themselves as internationalists, what we now refer to as globalists, and those who were also atheists would be initiated into future incarnations of the Order of the Illuminati. By 1787, the Illuminati had secretly spread to France by French revolutionary leader Gabriel Mirabeau. Mirabeau introduced Illuminati principles at the Paris Masonic Lodge of Reunited Friends, which later became the Phila Philoleths, Searchers After Truth, again another name that theosophists have called themselves. Noted members of the French Illuminati lodges included the Marquis of Girondin, the Count of Saint Germain, Count Alessandro Cagliostro, and Johann, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. The Marquis de Luchet wrote in his essay on the sect of the Illuminati in January 1789, quote, listen to this quote, deluded people, you must understand that there exists a conspiracy in favor of despotism and against liberty, of incapacity against talent, of vice against virtue, of ignorance against light. Every species of error which afflicts the earth, every half-baked idea, every invention of the mind serves to fit the doctrines of the Illuminati. Their aim is universal domination." End quote. The Illuminati eventually infiltrated 266 Masonic lodges in France alone by 1789. Many French revolutionary leaders joined their ranks, including Maximilien Robespierre, who was alleged to have been chosen leader of the French Revolution by Adam Weishaupt himself. In April 1789, the Order of the Illuminati had infiltrated French Masonic lodges to such an extent that they had ceased operation and instead rallied under the name the French Revolutionary Club. When they needed a larger meeting place, they used the Hall of the Jacobins Convent, again, the Jacobin Society. They essentially merged with them. This revolutionary group of 1,300 people emerged on July 4th, 14th, 1789 as the Jacobin Club. The Illuminati controlled the Jacobin Club and were directly responsible for fomenting the activities which developed into the French Revolution, so we're full circle. The Illuminati's revolutionary plan in France called for the population to be reduced by one-third to one-half to ensure the stability of the new French Republic. Population reduction. Eugenics. The total death toll of the French Revolution was over one million people. In August 1792, after the overthrow of the government, the tricolored banner was replaced by the red flag of social revolution. After the death of Adam Weishaupt on November 18, 1830, the Italian revolutionary leader Giuseppe Mazzini was eventually appointed head of the Illuminati. Mazzini had established prior to that the revolutionary society called Young Italy a few years earlier in 1831. Young Germany, the radical socialist think tank that paved the way for the Communist League which led to the Communist Manifesto and subsequent communism throughout Europe and, and Russia, etc., and China, was modeled on and affiliated with Mazzini's Young Italy secret society. The day of the Illuminati's creation and the highest occult holiday of the calendar year, May 1st, or Beltane or Valpurgisnacht, was eventually adopted as May Day 
in all communist nations and is still celebrated today as the highest holiday of communism. Let's look at how secret societies and social engineers directly fomented the Bolshevik Revolution and the rise of Bolshevism and the rise of Vladimir Lenin. Bolshevism is a revolutionary socialist current of Soviet Leninist and later Marxist Leninist political thought and a political regime associated with the formation of a rigidly centralized, cohesive, and disciplined party of social revolution focused on overthrowing an existing capitalist state, then seizing power and establishing a, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, or a dictatorship of the working classes. Bolshevism originated at the beginning of the 20th century in Russia and was associated with the activities of the Bolshevist faction within the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, led by Vladimir Lenin. Highly influenced by Marxist ideology, Bolshevism absorbed Marxist elements and continued the practice, practices of the socialist revolutionaries of the second half of the 19th century, which we've been talking about. The most widely known theories of Bolshevism were theorists of Bolshevism were Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. In 1916, Lenin wrote his work, Imperialism as the Highest Stage of Capitalism, which was a major contribution to the development of classical Marxism. This work concluded with the possibility of the victory of socialism, initially in a few countries or in a single country, such as Russia, provided that the head of the revolutionary movement would be a disciplined avant-garde, ready to go all the way to the establishment of the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat. During and before the Bolshevik Revolution, the Bolsheviks and their ideology led up to the formation of the Communist Party. Vladimir Lenin and his ideas for a workers' socialist state heavily dominated the Bolshevik movement. Again, workers' socialist state, workers' socialist party. This was exactly how the Nazi uh, party language was set up, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. It, they just differ in the approach that they're going to get people to totalitarianism. Um, so uh, in October 1917, the Bolshevik Party won a major won a majority in the Soviets, the Revolutionary Workers' Councils of Russia, which had been reformed, which had been formed throughout Russia following the February Revolution, which had ended the Romanov dynasty's rule over Russia. It subsequently organized what is known as the October Revolution, which overthrew the Russian provisional government and replaced it with state power under control of the Soviets, these revolutionary workers' councils, led by the Bolsheviks and with other left-wing socialists. Lenin viewed the subsequent Russian Civil War as, quote, an inevitable continuation, development, and intensification of the class struggle. By the beginning of the February Revolution, the leading figures of the Bolshevik faction were mostly in exile. This is very critical to understand here, okay? Um, the main ideologues of Bolshe Bolshevism had already been exiled out of Russia, and they were in other countries prior to the Bolshevik Revolution, including Lenin, who was exiled to Switzerland. After a highly secretive journey through train and boat through all of Europe, Lenin was eventually smuggled back into Russia after being exiled from it on April 16, 1917. Upon Lenin's return, he immediately formulated a new program of action for the Bolshevik party called the April Thesis, in which he demanded transfer of power to the Soviets, quote, in the interests of the proletariat and peasantry. Of course, it's always in the interests of the lower classes for these types of revolutions to take place. Faced with, because they're not genuine revolutions of freedom, 
They're there to set up a new control system. They're there to take people away from the idea of, oh, well, it's, it's the kings and the czars and the ruling classes and the, 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 the moneyed power. And now we're going to actually maintain control, but it's not going to be them. It's going to be the state that's going to maintain all power over them. It's just a new religion. That's all they're inventing. They're just bring, trotting out one religion after another after another, getting people to believe into them, and their system of control is continue, continuated. Okay, so upon his return, he immediately uh, he formed the April Thesis uh, in the interest of proletariat and peasantry. Faced with resistance, even among other supporters of Bolshevism, Lenin eventually managed to institute his plan with the support of the lower classes. They always fall for it. Lenin rejected, and when I say lower class, we're talking about financially lower classes here. Lenin rejected the critical argument uh, of his po political opponents regarding Russia's unpreparedness for a social revolution and the inevit inevitability of a Russian civil war. In April 1917, the split of the Russian Social Democratic Labor, Labor Party was finalized. Lenin's April thesis received the support of the majority of delegates, and the Bolsheviks took over the Russian government. After an assassination, an assassination attempt upon Lenin, the Bolsheviks in, initiated a campaign of political repression and executions known as the Red Terror, mirroring the uh, the, the reign of terror of the French Revolution, which began in September 1918 and lasted until 1922. The Red Terror was chiefly carried out through the Cheka, the Bolshevik secret police, and was modeled on the reign of terror of the French Revolution. The purpose of the Red Terror was to seek out and eliminate all political dissent, opposition, and any other threats to Bolshevik power. The French Jacobin terror campaign was a blueprint for the Soviet Bolshevik Red Terror. Prominent Bolshevik leader Leon Trotsky had previously compared Vladimir Lenin to Maximilian Rose Robespierre as early as 1904. And here you see the result of the Red Terror. Adopting the Leninist pro slogan, plunder the loot, the Bolsheviks proceeded to carry out complete confiscation of private property, which they considered to be, quote, acquired through the exploitation of the working people. However, the Bolsheviks never truly determined whether the property they confiscated was obtained through exploitation, or if, it in, if in fact, the owners adequately paid for the higher labor, or whether the owners had created the property with their own labor. They never even bothered to check any of that. They just took it. That's it, with violence. In 1918, Social Democrat Alexander Parvu described Bolshevism thusly, quote, the essence of Bolshevism is simple to ignite the revolution everywhere, not choosing the time, regardless of the political situation and other historical realities. Whoever is against the enemy, whoever is against is the enemy, and the conversation with the enemies is short. Whoever is against is the enemy, and they are subject to urgent and unconditional destruction. In March 1918, the Bolshevik Party adopted the name the Russian Communist Party. In December 1925, the party name was again changed to the All-Union Communist Party. And finally, as late as October 1952, it was finally renamed to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In Western political science and journalism, some authorized some authors analyze Bolshevism from the standpoint of the similarities and differences with fascism and Nazism, with some describing it as being synonymous with political extremism, ideological fanaticism, intolerance, and a propensity for violence. In 1925, philosopher and linguist Nikolai Trubetsky, Trubetskoy, described Bolshevism in the Eurasian Times newspaper like this, quote, the positive significance of Bolshevism may be that having removed the mask and showed everyone Satan in his undisguised form, 
it led many through confidence in the reality of Satan to faith in God, which I thought was an appropriate quote for this presentation because it looked at it from a perspective of Satan wearing a mask, which is highly accurate. Much has been historically documented regarding the covert sealed train journey of April 1917 that transported Vladimir Lenin and his Bolshevik revolutionaries safely through the midst of a war-torn Europe into Russia where they began to implement the Bolshevik Revolution. Regarding Lenin's journey, British statesman Winston Churchill remarked this. He said, quote, they transported Lenin in a sealed truck like a plague bacillus from Switzerland into Russia, after which Lenin and Trotsky seized Russia by the hair of its head, end quote. Unfortunately, few ever asked the question, how was the exiled Lenin's journey ever allowed to proceed through all of Europe almost entirely unhindered? So let's look at that because that's exceedingly important as to how the Bolshevik Revolution got started. The Bolshevik Revolution was secretly supported and funded by an occult group of internationalists, what we now call globalists, called the Committee of 300 and its social engineering think tank known, as the, known today as the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations is located in London, UK. It branched from the Tavistock Clinic, a mental health trust founded in London in 1920 and was formally established as a separate entity in September of 1947. While not existing under its current name, the Tavistock Institute, until the 1940s, the origin of the Tavistock Institute goes back to the creation of what is known as Wellington House, Britain's war propaganda bureau during World War I. The absolute best and most scholarly author on the topic of the Tavistock Institute, really there's two of them, Number one, you have to check out the works of John Coleman. All of his work is brilliant, but particularly this book, The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. Now, you can find this book digitally online. Try finding a real copy of it. Try finding a physical copy of it, okay? They don't want people to know what's in this book. Do you know how much a physical copy of this book goes for today? Easily over $1,500, easily. And they know nobody's going to, no, no average person's going to go out and buy a book for that much money, you know? Most people don't want to spend that much money on a car, let alone a book, okay? So you can find this digitally. It is out there digitally. Um, physical copy is going to be a lot harder to come by. Uh, the other person is Daniel Esculin, who I highly recommend his work on Tavistock. Wellington House was originally directed by Alfred Harmsworth, the first Viscount Northcliffe, or Lord Northcliffe, appointed Lord to the British royalty, and his younger brother, Harold Harmsworth, the first Viscount Rothermere, or Lord Rothermere. So there's Lord Northcliffe, and here is Lord Rothermere. Their mandate was to produce an organization capable of manipulating public opinion and directing that manufactured opinion for public support for a declaration of war by Great Britain against Germany during World War I. Funding for Wellington House was provided by the British royal family and later by the Rothschild banking family to whom Lord Northcliffe was related through marriage. Also by the Milner Group of Lord Alfred Milner, more on him later, and Rockefeller Family Trusts. That's where their funding came from. A prominent member of Wellington House was renowned historian Arthur, or, I'm sorry, Arnold Toynbee. Toynbee later worked for another London-based think tank, Chatham House, 
which is also known as the Royal Institute for International Affairs, directly associated with the Crown of England. In his book, America and World Revolution, Toynbee advocated for a world government stating, quote, if we are to avoid mass suicide, meaning the Anglo-American establishment, we must have our world state quickly. And this probably means that we must have it in a non-democratic form to begin with. We will have to start building a world state now on the best design that is practicable at the moment. Toynbee also said that his world dictatorship would have to, quote, supplant the local national states which litter the present political map, end quote. He proposed that this future world state must be brought about on the basis of mass propaganda that would make it acceptable to the vast majority of human beings. And on that note, we will break for dinner, and I will see you in an hour and a half at 7 p.m. Excellent. I hope everybody enjoyed their dinner and is uh, ready for our last session today. So we ended off talking about Arnold Toynbee and um, his role in Wellington House and calling for a world dictatorship, saying that it had to be brought about on the basis of mass propaganda that would make it acceptable to the vast majority of human beings. American journalist Walter Lippmann and psychologist Edward Bernays were also prominent members of Wellington House. Bernays, the nephew of psychologist Sigmund Freud and author of the books Propaganda, Crystallizing Public Opinion and Public Relations, pioneered the use of psychology and other social sciences to shape and form public opinion so that the public thought such manufactured opinions were their own. Bernays wrote, quote, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without them knowing it, unquote. He called this technique engineering consent. Uh, that is basically known as social engineering in the modern world. One of his best known techniques of achieving this goal was the indirect use of what he called third party authorities to shape desired opinions. He stated, quote, if you can influence the leaders, either with or without their conscious cooperation, you automatically influence the group which they sway. And there's Bernays. Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann were appointed on behalf of Wellington House to handle the manipulation of American public opinion in preparation for the United States' entry into World War I. Under the direction of Wellington House, they also became members of a civilian committee which briefed and directed U.S. President Woodrow Wilson during and after the war. Not coincidentally, Woodrow Wilson was the first American president to publicly denounce capitalism and proclaim himself in favor of a socialist one-world government. On October 12, 1913, Woodrow Wilson signed the Revenue Act of 1913, a bill that would lead to NAFTA, GATT, and the World Trade Organization and create the federal income tax, fulfilling plank number two of the Communist Manifesto in the United States. On December 23, 1913, Wilson signed into law the Federal Reserve Act, which created a new central bank system in the United States, the Federal Reserve System, fulfilling plank number five of the Communist Manifesto in the United States. The deceptive language of the Federal Reserve Act was written under the guidance of Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann of Wellington House. Bernays and Lippmann had previously set up the National Citizens League with lawyer and self-identified Zionist Samuel Untermeyer as its chairman to promote the Federal Reserve Bank, the mechanism which would go on to deceptively secure control of America's currency and transfer it to a private monopoly. 
before the Federal Reserve Act was sent to Wilson for his signature. A copy was given to another representative of Wellington House, an advisor to Wilson, Colonel Edward Mandel House, and another copy to banker J.P. Morgan, who, in this endeavor, represented the interests of the Rothschild International Banking Dynasty. Wilson's measures, all influenced by a tide of propaganda emanating from Wellington House, would further the destruction of the American middle class and act as instruments of slavery fastened around their necks without them truly becoming aware of it. In his book, The New Freedom, Wilson wrote, quote, We stand in the presence of a silent revolution. We are upon the threshold of a time when the systematic life of the country will be sustained at every point by government activity. Now we have to determine whether it shall be directed from government itself or whether it shall be through instrumentalities which have already constituted themselves, themselves and which stand ready to supersede government. The Federal Reserve is no better example of that type of a international force and controlling agency within the United States. The modern science of mass manipulation of public opinion was born at Wellington House. From its elementary beginnings at Wellington House, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations eventually developed into a highly sophisticated and top secret social engineering organization whose main purpose was to manipulate worldwide public opinion. Tavistock's social engineers became masters of mind control through the steering of mass human perception. Tavistock's long-term agenda viewed classical and Western civilizations as the only two civilizations that could bring a, quote, modern-day renaissance to the world and saw them as threats to their plans for ushering in a new world order under an internationalist or globalist world government. Lord Alfred Milner, prominent member of Wellington House and a leading Fabian socialist, more on them later, had many contacts among the Bolsheviks in exile in Europe, including Vladimir Lenin. Carrying a letter of introduction from fellow socialist Fritz Platten, Lenin met with Lord Milner and laid down his plans for the overthrow of the Romanov, Romanov czars. Lenin and Milner uh, Lenin asked Milner, Milner to provide the necessary funds required to launch his Bolshevik revolution. Milner agreed on condition that he could send his agent Bruce Lockhart of British MI6 intelligent, intelligence to supervise Lenin's daily affairs and report his progress back to Milner. Lord Walter Rothschild and members of the Rockefeller family demanded that they be allowed to send their representative, Sidney Riley, to Russia to supervise the transfer of Russian natural resources and gold held in the Russian Central Bank to London. This was agreed to by Lenin. To seal the bargain, Lord Milner, on behalf of the Rothschilds, gave Lenin 60 million British pounds, while the Rockefellers contributed 40 million US dollars to Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Fritz Platten was put in charge of the logistics of Lenin's journey and oversaw it until the Bolshevik revolutionaries arrived safely in Petrograd, Russia. Lenin and his compatriots were provided with a private rail car by high-ranking members of the German government, which was always kept locked by agreements with stations along the line. Fritz Platten was in charge of the voyage and laid down the rules for the trip. The rules were, Lenin's carriage was to remain locked for the entire trip. No one could board the carriage without Platten's permission. The train would have extra territor territorial status. None of the car passengers were to be asked for their passports at national borders. All tickets would be bought at regular prices, and no security issues were to be raised by the military or police of any country en route. Countries in complicity with the sealed train affair were Great Britain, Germany, Finland, which was then part of the Russian Empire, Switzerland, and Sweden. The train trip was also authorized and approved by, approved by Gen German General Erich Ludendorff and, em and German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm. 
The Germans hoped that Lenin's presence in Russia would add to the chaos and instability weakening the country at that time. The journey began in Zurich, Switzerland, and proceeded to the German town of Sosnitz at the edge of the Baltic Sea, where the Bolshevik passengers had to detrain. The Swedish government then provided them ferry transport across the Baltic to Trelle Trelleborg, Sweden. They continued the journey by train at Malmo, Sweden to Stockholm, then through Finland, and finally to Petrograd, Russia, where Lenin's revolution would take full form, soon leading Russia into Soviet communism. Understanding the conspiracy that led to Lenin's return to Russia, it is an inescapable conclusion that without the complicity of the members of the think tank that would become the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, the Bolshevik Revolution would have been stillborn. And that leads us to the emergence of communism in its full-fledged form in the Soviet Union. After Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized power in the Bolshevik Revolution and created a one-party state under the Russian Communist Party, Joseph Stalin joined its governing Politburo and served in the subsequent Russian Civil War. Stalin was instrumental in the establishment of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR or the Soviet Union, in 1922. Following Lenin's death in 1924, Stalin assumed leadership over Russia. Stalin was a Soviet revolutionary who led the Soviet Union from 1924 until his death in 1953, initially governing the country as part of a communist collective and eventually consolidating power to become a dictator by the 1930s. Ideologically adhering to the Leninist interpretation of Marxism, Stalin formalized this ideology as Marxism-Leninism, retaining the Marxist belief that the state would, quote, wither away as socialism transformed into pure communism. Stalin believed that the Soviet Union would remain until the final defeat of capitalism. Under Stalin, socialism in one country became a central tenet of the Communist Party's ideology. This clashed with original Bolshev the original Bolshevik view that socialism could only be achieved by the process of worldwide revolution. As a Marxist and an anti-capitalist, Stalin believed in an inev inevitable class war between the world's proletariat and bourgeoisie. He believed that the working classes would prove successful in this struggle and would establish a, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, regarding the Soviet Union as an example of such a state. He also believed that this proletarian state would need to introduce repressive measures against foreign and domestic enemies to ensure the full crushing of the classes that supported private property ownership, and thus the class war would greatly intensify with the advance of socialism. As a propaganda tool, Stalin employed the tactic of the shaming of enemies, which would be used to blame all economic, political, and military failures and all hardships endured by the populace on political opponents of the communists. And this is a common tactic today. Stalin's Soviet state would also utilize a new standardized economic system that was industrialized, collectivized, centrally planned, and technologically advanced. As a result of Stalin's five-year plans, Russia underwent agricultural collectivization and rapid industrialization, creating a centralized command economy. Severe disruptions to food production contributed to widespread famine from 1930 to 33, which killed millions. To eradicate accused enemies of the working class, Stalin instituted a political persecution and killing campaign to remove his actual and perceived opponents, known as the Great Purge. During the Great Purge, over a million political opponents of Stalin's system were imprisoned, largely in the gulag system of prisons and forced labor camps, and at least 700,000 were executed between 1934 and 39. By 1937, Stalin had acquired absolute control over the Communist Party and government. Stalin's communist regime was a textbook example of totalitarianism and was driven by repression, ethnic cleansing, censorship, 
famine, wide-scale deportation, and political executions that killed tens of millions of people. In the aftermath of World War II, the territory occupied by the Soviet Red Army formed various Soviet satellite states throughout Central and Eastern Europe, which became, became known as the Iron Curtain Nations. Both the Soviet Union and the United States emerged from World War II as global superpowers and subsequently entered a period of international tension known as the Cold War. The Soviet Union was a transcontinental country that spanned much of Eurasia from 1922 to 1991. It was the flagship communist state of the world as a union of 15 nations. In practice, both its government and its economy were highly centralized until its final years. It was a one-party state governed by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, with the city of Moscow serving as it, its capital. It was the largest country in the world, covering over 8.6 million square miles and spanning 11 time zones. Accounting for deaths by political executions, gulags, forced resettlement, deportation, starvation, and malnutrition due to famine, at least 20 million people were killed by Stalin's communist regime. All communist states that were established during the 20th century, including the Soviet Union, followed the lead of Karl Marx in rejecting inalienable individual rights in favor of so-called, quote, collective economic and social rights, meaning constructs of man, not inherent rights. Ultimately, Marxism, legitimizes violence without limitation because it embraces moral relativism and rejects moral and ethical principles as, quote, constructs of the dominant class. This is an ideological hallmark of Satanism and the dark occult, moral relativism. No society can ever be free if it embraces moral relativism. Communists on becoming God. Let's look at what they did in comparison to what Nazis did. And of course, we already heard about the ways that they murdered people. But this was their socialist new world order of masters and slaves. The Soviet Union kept complete control over their people. Even the very thoughts of the populace were kept tightly in check. Soviet laws were unimaginably strict. Soviet psychologists literally classified people who were unhappy living under the Soviet regime as insane. Anyone who was expressing desires for freedom or justice were diagnosed as having sluggish schizophrenia. Symptoms listed in Soviet psychology books including, quote, included, quote, reform delusions or, quote, struggling for truth. Thousands of people were sent to mental hospitals, hospitals for suggesting that the Soviet society could be better. And hundreds of psychologists worked on teams dedicated to diagnosing dissidents with schizophrenia. The Soviets created a policy of militant atheism and wanted to systematically stamp out religion wherever it could be found. Atheism was promoted as scientific truth and churches were torn down. In their place, the Soviets literally built museums of atheism. And this is the Vilnius Museum of Atheism shown uh, in the picture there uh, from a former church. Unemployment became a capital crime in the Soviet Union. Anyone who didn't show up to work could be thrown into a gulag. Soviet law labeled anyone who was unemployed as a person leading, quote, a parasitic existence. The day you lost your job, you became a criminal, and you could be thrown into a forced labor camp for the offense. Even 20 minutes of lateness to work brought one into the realm of capital offense. Leaving work early could lead up to four months in prison, and missing a shift could lead to six months of corrective labor. It was a crime to attempt to feed yourself from nature. There were specific laws against collecting wild fruits, nuts, and berries. You could find yourself in a gulag for picking a single cherry off a tree. And here you see Joseph Stalin doing the hidden hand symbol that you previously saw Karl Marx performing. There he is as the god of 
the Soviet Union. It was even incredibly dangerous to be the first to stop applauding during a political speech in the Soviet Union. To cease applause meant to the Soviets that you were a dissident. People clapped for so long at a political speech that sometimes a bell would have to be rung to let them know that they could stop. Consequence for insufficient applause was severe. After a tribute to Stalin was proposed at a political speech in Moscow, the crowd continued to applaud for 11 minutes straight. No one in the audience had the courage to stop applauding, so people clapped until their hands became red. Finally, one man sat down, after which the entire crowd followed suit, and that man, who was the first to sit, was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in a gulag, with the police telling him, don't ever be the first to stop applauding. This is where our society is headed, folks. The uh, communists also employed secret police, just as the Nazis did. The two major ones were the KGB and the Stasi. So let's look at those briefly. The KGB, or Committee for State Security, was the main security agency for the Soviet Union from 1954 to 1991. The KGB was a direct successor of preceding agencies, such as the Cheka and the NKVD. It carried out internal security, foreign intelligence, counterintelligence, and secret police functions for the Soviet Union. It guarded the leadership of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and the Soviet government, and combated nationalist, dissent, a dissident, religious, and anti-Soviet activities. Similar agencies operated in, in each of the nations of the Soviet Union. And they also conducted, obviously, censorship upon the public and the mass media. The Ministry for State Security, the Ministerium for Staatssicherheit, commonly known as the Stasi, was the state security service of East Germany, a Soviet satellite state from 1950 to 1990. Headquartered in East Berlin, the Stasi's function in East Germany resembled that of the KGB in the Soviet Union. It served as a means of maintaining state authority, and it was referred to as the shield and sword of the party. The Stasi maintained surveillance files on millions of East Germans and used a network of civilian informants to acquire information of potential dissidents. The Stasi contributed to the arrest of approximately 250,000 people in East Germany during its existence. As the Nazis did, the Soviets also had youth societies to indoctrinate the young. The All-Union Leninist Young Communist League, usually known as the Komsomol, was a political youth organization in the Soviet Union that existed between 1918 and 1991. It was sometimes described as the youth division of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The Komsomol was the final stage of three youth organizations in the Soviet Union, with members ranging from 14 to 28 years of age. The intermediate group was called the Young Pioneers, an organization for members ages 18 to 15, 8 to 15. The third and youngest group was known as the Little Octoberists, referencing the October Revolution, with members between 7 and 9 years of age. At their peak during the 1970s, these youth societies had up to 25 million members. The Young Pioneers was a compulsory organization for children, tasked with indoctrinating the youth with communist ideology. In, in line with the Soviet doctrine of state atheism, the Young Pioneers tasked their members to, quote, set up an atheist's corner at home with anti-religious pictures, poems, and sayings. And here you see the three uh, badges of the uh, Soviet youth societies there on the right. And here is a depiction of the young pioneers, a picture, actually. The next uh, occult and secretive group that we have to look at in the fomentation of, fomentation of um, communism throughout Europe and the rest of the world, but specifically in, in England and you know, in the UK, is the Fabian Society. Absolutely critical influence, especially in the UK. 
and their implementation of what is known as incremental socialism. The Fabian Society, founded on January 4, 1884 in London, is a British socialist organization whose purpose is to advance socialism via gradualism or incrementalism rather than by revolutionary overthrow. This strategy is known as incremental socialism and this is the, the favored approach for bringing a, a whole civilization into communism today is to do it through incremental means so that the population cannot see the march toward socialism and communism and they just allow it to happen in their ignorance. If you do it all at once, people would suddenly recognize it and ask questions and not go along with it, but if you incrementally introduce it, people don't see the incremental changes. The Fabian Society was historically related to radicalism, a left-wing political tradition. The Fabian Society has had power, powerful influence on British politics, specifically upon the Labour Party of Great Britain, which actually grew out of the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society also founded the London School of Economics in 1895. The, the Fabian Society now functions primarily as a political think tank and is one of 20 socialist societies affiliated with the UK's Labour Party. The Fabian Society was named after, Ro after the Roman general Quintus Fabius Maximus, who was nicknamed the Delayer. His Fabian strategy sought gradual victory against a superior force through persistence, harassment, and wearing the enemy down over time rather than through climactic battles. The logo of the Fabian Society is a tortoise, which represented the group's strategy for a slow, imperceptible transition to socialism. Its coat of arms is a wolf in sheep's clothing, represented its preferred methodology of infiltration for achieving its goals. The wolf in sheep's clothing symbolism was later abandoned by the Fabian Society due to its blatant connotations. <laughs> Noted Fabian Society members included playwright George Bernard Shaw, author H.G. Wells, psychologist Graham Wallace, and logician Bertrand Russell. Annie Besant, noted occultist and leader of the Theosophical Society in the early 1900s, was also a member of the Fabian Society. Besant wrote, quote, a democratic socialism controlled by majority votes can never succeed, but a truly aristocratic socialism is the next step upward in civilization. Basant was the personal mentor of Fabian, of fellow Fabian Society member Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, who subsequently framed the economic policy for the nation of India upon Fabian socialism. Members of the Fabian Society have included noted political leaders of many other countries. Obafemi Owoholo, premier of the western state of Nigeria, was a Fabian Society member in the late 1940s. The founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, was an avid member of the Fabian Society in the early 1930s. Lee Yuan Kuan Yu was the first prime minister of Singapore and stated in his memoirs that his initial political philosophy was strongly influenced by the Fabian Society. Michael Aflach, widely cons Mikhail Aflach, widely considered as the founder of the Arab Ba'athist movement, was a Fabian socialist. And Salama Musa of Egypt, a prominent advocate of Arab socialism, was a member of the Fabian Society since 1909. 20th century members of the Fabian Society included UK Prime Ministers Ramsay MacDonald, Clement Attlee, Harold Wilson, Tony Blair, and Gordon Brown. 229 members of the Fabian Society were elected to the British Parliament in the 1945 general election. The major influence of the Fabian Society on the Labour Party of the UK and on the English-speaking socialist movement worldwide has made, it one, has made it one of the main inspirations of international socialism. And this man is largely responsible for that. Antonio Gramsci. 
Antonio Gramsci was an Italian Marxist, socialist, and social engineer. He was the founding member and one-time leader of the Italian Communist Party. Gramsci was one of the most influential Marxist thinkers of the 20th century and a key thinker in the development of Western Marxism. After an attempt on Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's life in November 1926, the Italian fascist government passed emergency laws after which police arrested and imprisoned Gramsci for his anti-fascist political views. Gramsci died in prison on April 27, 1939 at the age of 46. Classical Marxism had predicted that socialist revolution was inevitable in capitalist societies. By the early 20th century, no such revolution had occurred in the most advanced nations on the earth. As capitalism seemed more entrenched than ever, Gramsci suggested that capitalism maintained control not just through violence and political and economic coercion, but also through ideology. Gramsci argued that the bourgeoisie had developed a hegemonic culture which propagated its own values and norms so that they became the common values of the everyday person. But people in the working class had come to identify their own good with the good of the bourgeoisie and would even help to maintain the status quo rather than revolting against it. Gramsci argued that capitalist power through cultural hegemony needed to be challenged by building a socialist counter hegemony to counter the notion that bourgeoisie values represented natural or normal values for society Gramsci suggested that the working class could not dominate purely through force and coercion but rather it needed to infiltrate existing culture and to develop a socialist counterculture of their own this is what's in full sway in our world right now Gramsci felt that socialists could do this by exerting intellectual leadership and making alliances with a variety of social societal forces, thus creating a nexus of institutions, social relations, and ideas. Gramsci called for a kind of education system that would develop socialist intellectuals whose primary task would be to reform the existing intellectual activity of the masses and make it natively critical of the status quo. This is the basis of modern, quote, critical theory, which you've probably heard much about today. Viewing bourgeois cultural values as being tied to folklore, popular, popular culture, and religion, Gramsci argued that those cultural institutions should be the first and foremost toward which socialists should direct their cultural subversion efforts. Gramsci described this tactic as what he called a war of position and felt that such a war should be waged by revolutionaries through political agitation and the advancement of a socialist culture. This strategy, strategy has come to be called cultural Marxism in the modern day. So he is the grandfather of cultural Marxism. Gramsci's ideas would go on to greatly influence the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School, founded in Frankfurt, Germany in 1923, is a school of social theory and a think tank for critical theory ideology. The Frankfurt School initially comprised intellectuals, academics, and political dissidents dissatisfied with the contemporary socioeconomic systems of the 1930s. The Frankfurt theorists proposed that Current social theory was inadequate for explaining the turbulent reactionary politics occurring in the 20th century. The works of the Frankfurt School are understood in the context of critical theory, which purports that the dominant ideology in bourgeois society misrepresents how human relations occur in the real world and how capitalism justifies and legitimizes human domination. The Frankfurt School perspectives of critical theory, perspective of critical theory, is based on Freudian, Marxist, and Hegelian premises of idealist philosophy. Critical theory draws its investigational resources and methods directly from Marxism. 
In the 20th century, dogmatic proponents of the worldviews of secular materialism and postmodernism within the Frankfurt School declared war on the very ideas of truth and objective reality, repackaging and vilifying them as being, quote, the oppressive tools of capitalism. Imagine that that there is an objective reality and that any truth exists. That very idea is a capitalist notion. That's what the Frankfurt School uh, promulgated through the masses of people. The Frankfurt School made it culturally fashionable within the politics and culture of Western civilization to disregard any verifiable aspects of human reality that did not conform to and promote Marxist causes and ideology. So if it doesn't conform with my existing socialist and communist ideology, it can't be real. It just needs to be thrown out as an idea because it conflicts with what I already believe. All members of the Frankfurt School were atheists. Again, stressing secularism and materialism. The long march through the institutions is a slogan coined by social activist Rudi Dutschk in 1967 to describe a strategy for establishing the conditions for a socialist revolution. The long march is to be implemented via a slow, incremental societal conversion to socialism, which would be accomplished by socialists entering professional institutions and from those institutional positions gradually exerting influence over human culture. This process, this war is well underway. I mean, it is in, it's, it's in its advanced stages, I would say. The Long March includes the concerted effort to build up socialist counter institutions. It has been described as, quote, working against the established institutions while working within them, and by, quote, learning how to use and program computers, how to teach at all levels of education, and how to utilize the mass media. These are things that the socialists are doing and true freedom advocates are not doing. The phrase, the long march, is a reference to the prolonged struggle of Chinese communists, which more about them later, which included long physical marches of their armies through China. The concept of the long march through the institutions is extremely similar to Antonio Gramsci's idea of a war of position, in which he argued for the creation of a socialist counter-hegemony. I would be remiss if I didn't include in this presentation a, a, a short analysis of Sabbatean Frankism because it is so influ influential in the destructive ideologies that we've been talking about. Sabbatean Frankism was a heretical Jewish religious movement of the 18th and 19th centuries centered on the leadership of the Jewish Messiah claimant Jacob Frank. Frank rejected traditional religious norms and taught that his followers were obligated to transgress as many moral boundaries as possible. Sabbatean Frankism has its roots in the Sabbatean sect of Turkey, a religious movement that identified the 17th century Jewish rabbi Sabbatai Zevi as the Jewish Messiah or world savior. Zevi's teachings can ultimately be summarized by this maxim, quote, what is holy is unholy, and what is unholy is holy. Unlike traditional Judaism, which asserts that cumulative acts of righteousness will eventually bring the coming of the Messiah, the Sabbatean interpreta interpretation inverted the traditional Jewish view to support the opposite conclusion, postulating that it would be easier to accelerate the flow of chaos to utterly destroy civilization than to perfect it. And once the world is forced into complete ruin, God would then be forced to start the messianic age to save the world. This is lunacy. Frank advocated for the rejection of all moral, religious, and social norms and asserted, and asserted that the most important obligation of every person was the transgression of every moral boundary. Frank may have developed this distorted religious view from a degraded form of Gnosticism, 
a first century religious belief wherein there was a true God whose existence was hidden by a false God called the Demiurge. The true God could allegedly be revealed only through a total destruction of the social and religious structures that were created by the false God. For Frank, the very distinction between good and evil may have been seen as a product of a world governed by the Gnostic false god or demiurge. This is where religious ideologies that go haywire just create complete devastation in our world. That's why the influence of religion has to really be watched. Sabbatean Frankism has been described by some researchers as the historical roots of cultural Marxism and by others as the paradigm of the modern left. Communism, socialism, fascism, corporatism, and critical theory are all ideologically linked to Sabbatean Frankism in that they all seek the inversion of moral values and to replace them with irrational, destructive impulses and the satanic worldview that, quote, everything is permitted. Some researchers have postulated that Karl Marx himself may have subscribed to Sabbatean Frankist ideology and purposefully built upon their ideas as a mechanism to ideologically subvert and eventually destroy Western civilization. As an ideology of inversion and destruction, which is exactly what Satanism is, Sabbatean Frankism parallels the most famous quote from John Milton's Paradise Lost, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. This is the very essence of the worldview and ideology of all dark occultism. Next, let's take a look at the indoctrination system of the communists, the Prussian educational system and outcome-based education, which was eventually adopted by just about every nation of Europe and eventually the United States. The Prussian educational system was established in Prussia as a result of educational reforms in the late 18th and early 19th century and has had widespread influence since. The Prussian education system was introduced in the late 18th century and was significantly enhanced after Prussia's defeat in the Napoleonic Wars. The Prussian educational reforms inspired similar changes in other countries and variations of it remain in widespread use today under various names. Characteristics of the Prussian education system included compulsory attendance, national testing for all students, a prescribed national curriculum for each grade, and mandatory kindergarten, all hallmarks of the modern U.S. educational system. It soon widely inspired educational models in other German states and a number of other countries, including Japan and, of course, the United States. State-oriented mass education systems were instituted in the 19th century throughout the rest of Europe. The Prussian reforms in education spread quickly throughout Europe, per particularly after the French Revolution. This form of public education was subsequently widely institutionalized throughout the world and developed in parallel with nation building. The basic foundations of the Prussian education system were laid out by Frederick II, King of Prussia, from 1772 to 1778. Frederick II and others who furthered the Prussian system sought to take education out of the hands of family and transfer it to the state. Since independently educated individuals could not always be counted on to submit to government objectives, the Prussian system sought to create obedient soldiers for the Prussian army, obedient workers for Prussian mining, obedient civil servants for the Prussian government, obedient clerks for Prussian industry, and citizens who thought alike about all major political issues. Subsequent nation states that adopted the Prussian model used this so-called education system, which is an indoctrination system, to build a powerful controlling state apparatus. Variations of the Prussian education system were adopted by both Germany and Russia, pre their totalitarian regimes, during and after their totalitarian regimes of Nazism and communism. 
In the 1840s, Horace Mann, the secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, who later became known as the father of American education, traveled to Europe to study the Prussian system. Mann was seeking a way to change what he deemed unruly children into, quote, disciplined citizens, more like obedient citizens. After assessing the Prussian model as an effective methodology to implement state-controlled education, Mann's next step was to sell the Prussian system to the American public in the name of equality. This would be done by convincing each U.S. state to adopt a compulsory government school system to inform a, quote, uniform education, again, part of the Communist Manifesto for the masses. The primary goal of this system was not intellectual development, but rather to condition the students for obedience, subordination, and collectivism. In other words, social engineering. Understanding these origins of mass public education, it becomes exceedingly clear why, quote, free education for all children in public schools was a key plank of the Communist Manifesto. The Prussian education system was the original model for what has come to be called outcome-based education, an educational model that bases education around desired outcomes for the student. By the end of the outcome-based educational experience, each student is to achieve a pre-planned goal set for them by the system. There is no single specified style or of teaching or assessment in outcome-based education. Instead, all aspects of the system are specifically designed to achieve specified student outcomes. Thus, the role of the faculty in this system adapts to instructor, trainer, facilitator, or mentor based on the outcome that is desired. This model should more properly be called a system of indoctrination since its main objective is to instill into students what it wishes for them to learn, rather than teaching students proven methods for truth discovery, such as the trivium method, which was removed from public schooling. It could be correctly described as what to learn instead of how to learn. Outcome-based educational methods have been adopted in education systems around the entire modern world, including the United States, which has had an outcome-based education program in place since 1994, at least. Let's look at Chinese communism and its influence in the modern world. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, is the founding party and sole ruling party of the People's Republic of China. It was founded on July 1st, 1921 by Chen Duxiu and Li Dazhao with the help of the Far Eastern Bureau of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Far Eastern Bureau of Communist International. Both Marxism and the Bolshevik Revolution heavily inspired the Chinese Communist Party. Chen Duxiu and Li Dazhao were among the first Chinese intellectuals to publicly support Leninism and the idea of a socialist world revolution. Both regarded the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia as a groundbreaking event, believing it to herald a, quote, new era. How many times have we heard that today? Uh, for the world. Shen Duxiu served as the first General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party from 1921 to 1928 and was referred to as China's Lenin. And there is Du Xu and Da Sao. Mao Zedong became the chairman and dictator of the CCP in 1945. He described Chinese communism as, quote, Marxist Leninism applied and developed in China. Under the leadership of Mao Zedong, the CCP emerged victorious from the Chinese Civil War in 1949, after which Mao proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Since then, the CCP has governed China, and Mao Zedong continued to be the, its most in influential member of the CCP until his death in 1976. Zedong attempted to purge the party of capitalist and reactionary elements during the Chinese Cultural Revolution of 1966. 
From 1958 to 1962, he instituted a five-year plan known as the Great Leap Forward. Build back better, anyone? With catastrophic results. In an effort to rapidly transform the Chinese economy into a form of centralized socialism, the Chinese Communist Party collectivized farmland, formed people's communes, and diverted labor to factories. The CCP's complete mismanagement of China's food system subsequently led to the Great Chinese Famine. It's a, it's a preferred method of killing people in these systems, is to starve them out, collapse the food chain, collapse the food system, and starve people to death. Um, <clears throat> the Chinese, uh, Great Chinese Famine resulted in an estimated 38 million deaths, making it the largest famine in recorded human history. The death count of Mao Zedong's regime, taking into account starvation due to famine and political executions, totaled at least 50 million people. Since the collapse of the Soviet Eastern Bloc, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Chinese Communist Party has emphasized its relations with the ruling parties of the remaining socialist nations of the world and has established relations with social democratic parties throughout all of Europe, especially in the UK and in the United States. The CCP's current worldview continues to see human society as being organized into two opposing camps, socialist and capitalist, a complete materialist worldview, and insists that socialism on the basis of materialism will eventually triumph over capitalism. The CCP also supports globalization, arguing that globalism is not an intrinsically capitalist ideology. Xi Jinping, the current leader of the Chinese Communist Party, remarked on what he called the inevitability of socialism, stating, quote, Western nations' theory that capitalism is the ultimate force has been shaken, and socialist development has experienced a miracle. Western capitalism has suffered reversals, a financial crisis, a credit crisis, a crisis of confidence, and their self-conviction has wavered. Western countries have begun to reflect and openly or secretively compare themselves against China's politics, economy, and path. As of 2023, the Chinese Communist Party has more than 98 million members, making it the second largest political party in the entire world. Under the current rule of Xi Jinping, China has developed a social credit system, and this is coming to the United States, a national digital registry which enables the Chinese Communist Party to track individuals and businesses and, quote, evaluate them for trustworthiness. The social credit system rewards citizens in China for actions the CCP condones and punishes them for doing anything the CCP deems undesirable. Since 2014, the Chinese Communist Party has embarked on a campaign of genocide against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities, detaining more than one million Uyghurs in internment camps. Under Xi Jinping's modern communist regime, China has been branded by Amnesty International as, quote, the world's worst executioner. China often holds mass rallies to announce people being sentenced to death in medi medieval-style public trials. Chinese prosecutors litigating execution cases have a conviction rate of 99% and doom thousands of political prisoners to execution every year. The CCP kills, kills thousands of people every year using firing squads, lethal injections, and mobile death vans, just like the Nazis. Firing squad executions were said to have been discontinued in 2010, but there are many examples that this practice still continues. Lethal injections have taken over as the main form of execution in modern China due to its cheaper cost and more secretive nature. 
Lethal injections were legalized by the CCP in the 1990s and since 2003 are sometimes administered via the Chinese Communist Party's mobile execution vans. I think I've heard something about this previously. But they're so different which allow the execution of prisoners without having to even transport them to a jail. Enemies of the state are loaded into a van, strapped to a table, and administered lethal injection. Organs are then harvested from executed prisoners without permission for use in medical and scientific experimentation. Contrary to what one may think, members of the public in China aren't even bothered by such forms of education by the Chinese Communist Party, but rather are largely in support of it. The true numbers of those killed by the Chinese Communist Party every year are thought to be staggeringly high, probably into the many tens of thousands per year, but the Chinese Communist regime keeps those numbers closely concealed as state secrets. Communism is still spreading all over the world. It has not been defeated. It is still growing today, as is Nazism. These ideologies have not been stemmed or defeated. We could say we, ideal we militarily defeated the Wehrmacht of the Nazis, and even that is somewhat disputed, as we'll see. We definitely did not defeat Nazi ideology or communist ideology. They are still very much active and at work in the world today. Nazism and communism were never defeated. If you believe that as a historical framework, you are sadly mistaken and do not know what really went on after World War II. What really went on after World War II is the Nazis that were left and the communists shook hands behind the back of America and said, America's got to go. Before any system of totalitarianism can succeed, America has to be taken down from within. And that's what they've been doing ever since, in cooperation. Citizens often focus on the personal histories of the villains of authoritarianism instead of the factors in their respective societies which made their rise possible. Folks, if anybody wants to really know what leads to uh, these regimes that kill tens of millions of people, you need only look in a mirror. People need only to look in a mirror to analyze what they themselves think and believe and how they have allowed themselves to be indoctrinated and led. Okay? It's not the leaders. You know, the fish doesn't stink from the head, as the popular saying goes. It isn't the leaders, it's the body of the people that's the problem because these so-called leaders come from hu human beings. They come from the people. And they're only doing what people ultimately in the very long term truly desire and want them to do. And people can get as offended about that as they want. I tell people all the time, if people didn't want it this way, it wouldn't remain this way. They want it this way. They want it to continue. More people than not who will take action want it to remain the exact way that it is, and most people sit with their hand under their rear end on their couch watching whatever nonsensical entertainment that they're watching and don't get involved. That's the reason these totalitarian ideologies continue to persist in our world. The mindset still remains. While the political regimes of Nazism and Soviet Communism were either militarily dismantled or collapsed from their own failures, it is critically important to recognize that the most important component of these oppressive regimes continues largely unchallenged today, their mindset. The underlying ideologies of both these religious cults, which is what they are, two sides of the same coin of Satanism and dark occultism, include collectivism, 
moral relativism, secularism, materialism, socialism, and authoritarianism. And that those ideologies still dominate the entire political landscape and the psychology of the overwhelming majority of human beings in our world today. This isn't something that happened past tense. This is something that is happening now and is still ongoing. And it rules in the mind of the people of this planet. That's where it has to be defeated. When people want to say, I want change in the external world. Well, do you want to change your own mind? Do you want to change your own behavior? Then you got people sitting down with their hand under their ass. You know? They say they want change, but what do they really want to do to change within themselves, within their own mindset, within their own behaviors? Not a damn thing. And that's inexcusable and unacceptable. The underlying ideologies, collectivism, still totally prominent. Moral relativism. I did a social experiment not that long ago, back in about 2019, 2020. We found over two-thirds of people that we polled, no matter where we asked them, claim to be moral relativists and think that morality is just a construct that people can get to invent and arbitrarily decide right and wrong for themselves. Over two-thirds. We're, we're moving past two-thirds. It was about 68% in our poll. 68% of human beings do not think there is an objective standard of right and wrong. Imagine this. And we think we're going to be free? We're heading straight to hell and we deserve to be there with numbers like that. Materialism. How active is that in the world? Omnipresent. It's everywhere. And authoritarianism. How many people just support government, period, and don't understand that it's based on violence and coercion and is a form of covert slavery? The nerve of people supporting modern-day slavery, you know? As if it wasn't difficult enough to stamp out chattel slavery, now we have a more, even more intrusive form of slavery because it holds sway over the mind and people can't even see it as a destructive religion. It's disgusting. This is especially true in the psychology of young people. All of these ideologies completely dominate the mindset of the youth completely dominate their mind because of what they're taught in what we laughingly call educational institutions that are nothing but government indoctrination centers. And young people, sadly today, lack the proper historical and philosophical education to place the evils of these ideologies into an accurate moral framework. And that's largely also because their parents ain't teaching them anything. Their parents are leaving their so-called laughably called education to the state and government-run schools. This is Nazi Germany's entire surrender instrument right here. Three pages of double-spaced type with one Nazi general signing the document. No members of the Nazi party were present for the instrument of surrender. One general of the German Wehrmacht was present. The three, this is the three pages of the German instrument of surrender which ended World War II in Europe, signed by General Alfred Jodl, Chief of Staff of the German Armed Forces High Command. There's his signature. He scribbled his last name, didn't even, didn't even sign his full name. And people want us to believe that means that all of the Nazis surrendered and gave up their religious cult ideology. One scribbled signature of one German general. Yeah, sure it does. Mm -hmm. But they didn't plunder all of the riches of Europe, which is a considerable fountain of wealth. Throughout the, the second half of the 20th century, the beginning of the second half of the 20th century, and just completely parlayed that wealth wherever they went and escaped throughout the world to escape war crimes tribunals and just brought all of that wealth everywhere that they went and kept promulgating their ideology. No, that never happened. They just said, you know what? You got us. You beat our military. We give up our religion. We renounce our, our satanic religion. It was, it was our bad. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. I mean, how dumb are people to believe this? You know? 
I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, making this present, I'll just as an aside real quick tell you, making this presentation so sickened me that I cried several times. I broke down in tears several times while making this presentation. Not even because of the horrors that I was researching, but because of the realization over and over and over again while I'm laying all this content out that human beings have largely learned nothing as a result of all of this historical horror. And we are absolutely in line to repeat every bit of it. And that sickened me to the core of my being many times while making this presentation. Operation Paperclip. Following their military defeat in World War II, many Nazis fled to parts of Europe, Africa, and South America. What is lesser historically known is that many of them were deliberately brought into the United States by a top secret US government program. Operation Paperclip was a secret United States intelligence program in which thousands of German scientists, engineers, technicians, medical professionals, and so-called educators were taken from Nazi Germany to the United States between 1945 and 1959 for government employment in their respective fields. Operation Paperclip Paperclip was overseen by the Joint Intelligent Objectives Agency, JIOA, and largely carried out by special agents of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps. This also was in, op in joint operation with the Office of Strategic Services, which eventually became the United States CIA. Many of the personnel brought into the U.S were members of the Nazi party, and some were even Nazi party leaders, Reich leaders. Modern day neo-Nazism, and it is more prevalent than anybody would be comfortable believing. And you know what, where it's very prevalent still? Even in the modern so-called freedom movement. Because you have so many people buying this absolute crap psyop that the Nazis weren't as bad as they're historically made out to be. It's completely disgusting and the people that fall, fall for that psyop are as dumb as a bag of crap and should be completely ashamed of themselves. They should know better because there's such ubiquitous, ample historical documentation from a wide eclectic variety of sources to support what really went on during Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia and other communist nations, that anybody that can't grasp that historical framework is an idiot. And I don't care who that offends. Get as offended as you want about it, okay? Because this, is, this whole program of excusing the Nazis for what they did, specifically them, is outrageous in the so-called truth movement. Just because some idiot makes a documentary about uh, you know, how bad the, uh, the bombing of Dresden was, and oh, the, the Allies were then the bad guys suddenly. You know, People have no historical framework and no understanding of how actual military and warfare operations work. You know, The Dresden bombing is an example of still completely controlled military operation. It's not even what is called total war. You know? When that gets underway, it'll make Dresden look like you're sitting down having a little piece of cake and tea. You know? And that's what people have no historical framework or understanding of from certainly a combat or military perspective. And I didn't see combat like that in my life, but I've studied it so much that I could probably be a general on a battlefield with what I know about military tactics. Neo-Nazism is a modern social and political movement that seeks to revive and reinstate the ideology of Nazism in the world today. Most adherents of neo-Nazism, neo-Nazi ideology promote racism, ultra-nationalism, Aryan racial supremacy, anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, which is gigantic in the so-called truth movement, it's disgusting, eugenics, and the creation of fascist nation states in the modern world in order to constitute a, quote, Fourth Reich. These are brain-dead 
cultists is what they are. And so are modern communists. There's no difference between them. They're all cut from the same immoral cloth. Neo-Nazism is a global phenomenon with organizations operating through international networks around the world. The religious zealots of this modern day cult regularly display Nazi symbols and openly express admiration for Adolf Hitler and other Nazi leaders. Ongoing psychological operations, or PSYOPs, waged against the public to discredit the modern freedom movement include the effort to, to portray Hitler and the Nazis as the quote-unquote good guys of World War II. This effort is so omnipresent that you can barely escape it and escape hearing about it constantly in the modern truth movement. It's sick. Sick. Let's look at the Ukrainian Azov Battalion of the modern Ukraine. The Azov Battalion, or Azov Assault Brigade, is a formation of the National Guard of Ukraine, founded in May 2014 as a volunteer paramilitary militia. The Azov Battalion has drawn attention in, the, in recent years time for its association with neo-Nazi ideology and its use of symbols that are incontrovertibly linked to Nazism. The Azov Battalion has also been widely accused of participating in many actions of human rights violations over the last decade. Ukraine, as part of the Eastern Front Theater of War during World War II, was geographically and ideologically divided in the war's aftermath. The, the literal name of the country of Ukraine simply means borderland, literally. Nazi troops who had made significant incursions into the western half of Ukraine during the war largely decided to stay there and resettle there after the Nazi military surrender, primarily to avoid having to go back to Germany and face war crimes tribunals at Nuremberg. This puts into perspective the Azov Battalion's neo-Nazi ideology and its continued use of prominent Nazi symbols. The Azov Battalion's main brigade patch, shown there in yellow, this yellow and purple, displays the symbols of the wolf's angle, the wolf's anchor, uh, displays the symbol of the wolf's angle, the wolf's anchor. The wolf's angle was, one, was the Gibor ruin, the final ruin of the Armanen Fatark ruin system of Nazi ideological precursor Guido von List. The Gibor ruin, or the wolf's angle, represented the Norse wolf god of destruction, Fenris, Hence, it's called the wolf's anchor. Fenris, uh, it represented the wolf god of destruction, Fenris, and the Ragnarok, the concept of the Ragnarok, or the Norse conceptualization of the end of the world. It was the main symbol, the Volsangel, was the main symbol used by the Nazis' Waffen-SS 2nd Panzer Division which took part in several major battles on the Eastern Front during World War II. So ladies and gentlemen, these aren't neo-Nazis. They are the progeny of Nazis who fought in World War II and remained in the Ukraine in the war's aftermath not to face war crimes tribunals. Even more blatantly, the Azov Battalion has openly displayed both the Nazi swastika and the symbol of the Black Sun, the inner occult order of the Schutzstaffel, on both its military regalia and its propaganda publication. So here you see the Azov Battalion's brigade patch with the symbol of the Wolfsangel compared to the Waffen SS 2nd Panzer Division insignia with the, uh, a slightly different variation of the Wolfsangel or Gibor ruin of the Armanen Fatark. Here you see members of the Azov Battalion giving the Hitler salute, the Nazi salute, while flying a flag of the Wehrmacht. This is the Wehrmacht flag that I displayed earlier in the presentation, except it has the Ukrainian 
national colors instead of the Nazi colors. And there you see the regiment displaying the banner of the Volsangel, the Gibor ruin. And Gibor represented destruction, annihilation, the end of the world. That's what it represented. It was, it was the symbol of Fenris, the wolf god. And here you see a publication, a magazine uh, that supports the Azov Battalion, uh, or Ukrainian magazine, and there blatantly displayed in the middle at the top is the Black Sun symbol. It is prominent on the Azov Battalion's main battle regalia insignia, shown there. Both the Nazi Black Sun in the background and the Volksangel in the foreground. It can't get any more blatant than that, folks. Okay? And yet people continue to make excuses for this neo-Nazi uh, force that is still active today. Let's look at fascism in modern Satanism. And I know a lot about this because I was very actively involved in the Church of Satan while this type of propaganda was being put forth. Highly active at this point. This, is, this magazine is like right around the time that I became appointed priest in the Church of Satan itself. Okay, they had an organization, I'm sorry, they had a publication called The Black Flame. And again, there you have references to the Black Sun. Okay, uh, this is Black Flame, volume four, number three and four, the International Forum or International Magazine of the Church of Satan. Okay, and these are advertisements that were run by satanic organizations in the late 1990s in the Black Flame magazine. So here you see organizations which uh, ran ads in the Black Flame, and they promoted fascism. Look right here. Fierce fascism. Eternal, nature's eternal fascism, it says on the right there. And in the middle one, fierce fascism for these satanic groups. And depicting well-known fascist symbolism from very early on in the presentation today, we saw the symbol of the fascists. And there they are right there on either side of the Armanen Inguz ruin, another ruin of the Armanen Futark of Guido von Liszt. And of course, the Wolfsangel. This organization right here is actually uh, the Abraxas Foundation that was run by Nicholas Schreck the grandson of the high priest of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey. He married his daughter, Zena LaVey, and was, I mean, th the Satanists hated this guy because he was one of the biggest blabbermouths about the Satanic agenda in public media. He just wanted to come out and just say exactly what they were doing. He didn't care at all. Okay, just let the unwashed masses that are going to be our eternal slaves hear what our plan is for them. And I guarantee you, the higher ranking Satanists are like, this, this, he needs to shut up. You know, <laughs> they hated this dude for it. Okay, he eventually did leave the Church of Satan and, believe it or not, came out of his satanic ideology. Uh, you know, as did I, but he didn't go all the way to an understanding of natural law. He basically converted to uh, become a Mahayana Buddhist. And I think it's sincere. A lot of people say, oh, is that a front? Is he just, you know, trying to work through Buddhism to, to uh, you know, implement Satanism? No, I don't think so. I think he eventually tired of the ideology and saw its ultimate destruct destructiveness and uh, just went toward a religious institution instead of toward natural law. But there he was a big fan of the Wolfsangel symbol, displayed it all the time on patches, on, on rings that he wore. Um, it was, it was a, a very prominent symbol used by Satanism during this time period, and we just saw it used by the Azov Battalion. So there's tons of fascist movements within this, the modern satanic movement today, blatantly, in your face, proud of it. See, these people aren't even hiding it anymore. They're coming right out in your face and saying, we're fascists, we're socialists, we're communists, we're Nazis. They don't care and they're blatant about it and proud of their ideologies. They're proud of being having satanic ideologies and wanting to bring all of these horrors back to the modern world. And they're going to succeed. They're going to succeed. Because if, if, the, if the engagement of the modern truth movement and so-called freedom movement, which is a laughable, pitiable effort, is, is all we can muster, 
they're going to win, and they deserve to win. And i got to say it and just be honest about it just like that because there is not enough effort on our part. There just isn't. I'm busting my ass doing what I can, but I cannot do it alone. And I've been begging people for help for years and years and years. And the, the, the people who have uh, you know, come to that call is laughably small. And that's all I'll say about it. I won't keep berating with it. Communism did not fall with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Once again, if you think that, you, you lack a historic, uh, an accurate historic framework. Communism is still very much alive and well throughout the entire world, driven largely by Marxist socialism and materialism. There is an internationalist, an international network of communist organizations with tens of millions of members operating throughout the world today. Conservative estimate, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions. It's certainly in the tens of millions. Communists, socialists, and those who support the ideologies which have led to the extermination of tens of millions of people in the 20th century alone are everywhere among us and still cling to this destructive cult with absolute religious fervor all around us. All you need to do is go right into Philadelphia on your way back to wherever your travels are going to lead you and go around just asking people and they'll be all too happy to tell you that they're communists. There's so many socialist and communist organizations in Philadelphia alone you can't even count them. They have meetup groups all over the place. All over the place. Every day meeting to continue to conspire and plan for their socialist revolution of destruction of all forms of property. You know? They want to give all the resources over to the state, to the government to manage. Yeah, we see how well communist Russia handled all of that and how well communist China handled all of it. You know, they only murdered about 90 million people. It was a resounding success how they managed human society. These people are intellectual infants and spiritual infants on top of it. They're about as dumb as a, a sack of bricks. I'm serious. And it's all young people, all young idiots that still believe this nonsense from Marx and that came out of the Bavarian Illuminati and other secret societies of the 17, 18, and 1900s. And they can't see it because they have no historical framework because they're uneducated fools. They're un uneducated fools that are illiterate. Yes. They're ill-read. Yes. They don't read books. They don't read the right books. They're dumb. Yes. And I'll just say it just like that because that's the fact of the matter, truth of it. And the problem is we're failing as parents. By the, the whole generation that is around our age of people are raising these young idiots. We're not doing what we need to do to morally and historically educate them. And that's why this is continuing rampantly in the modern world. And it's disgusting and it's going to lead to tens of millions, if not billions of deaths, if we don't stop it. Their ultimate objective and ideology is neo-feudalism. And I'm talking about Nazism and communism here. Both Nazism and communism, and I titled, the, the subtitle of this is called The Old Religion is the New Religion. Nothing has changed. It's just been euphemized a little bit and given a different uh, euphemistic name. But it's the same old world order system of control, of authoritarianism. Both Nazism and communism as arms of the same root religious cult of Satanism and the dark occult operate through globalism, the centralization of political power in the world. And they both seek to create a world based upon neo-feudalism. You heard this over and over and over from, from von Liszt saying openly he wanted neo-feudalism to communists saying we want the eradication of all private property, property and an institution of something that would resemble a feudal system. Neo-feudalism is a worldwide governmental system of slavery 
which ultimately deprives all human beings of property ownership. And the Nazis may have claimed that they were going to uphold property ownership, but did they do that in practice? No, because it was a system of socialism as well. It was just national socialism within one nation and then expanding militarily to adjacent nations. Communists did it internationally through a campaign of cultural uh, infiltration and subversion called cultural Marxism. The fact that people just can't see this is so mind bogger it's, it's mind staggering. It's staggering to the mind. I, I can't even believe that people cannot see these patterns and recognize that they are at work in our world today. Under neo-feudalism, all property is ultimately owned and controlled by the supreme authority or governmental system. A satanic ruling class based upon the belief in human authority, whose whims are to become godlike and not to be challenged by the slaves over which they rule. That's the new world order system they're trying to create. The old system of authority was kingship or royalty. And I ask people, this concept of authority vested in one being and then commanding everybody else, what was called the old world order, and by the way, there's nothing orderly about it. Okay? It is old, it's ancient as a matter of fact. It goes back to the dawn of human antiquity. There's nothing orderly about it. When you see the word order in any of their publications, writings, or concepts, you should substitute the word order for the word control with the word control. This is the old world control system, the old world slavery. Substitute order with slavery, because that's their version of order. The satanic version of order is human slavery. Okay, so this is old world slavery. And I ask people, was kingship ever more? No matter how beneficent a king claimed to be, is the rulership of one person over tens of thousands or millions of other people, can that ever be moral? Monarchy and kingship and royalty can never be moral. It's one person's claim that they own everybody else and they can dictate their lives. That's slavery. Slavery in every form that has, has ever existed in humanity is morally wrong. It's based in violence. It's based in duress. It's based in coercion. It's immoral. It's wrong. It should be abolished. Yeah. Yeah. Kingship is just a euphemism for slavery. When people tired of the old world system of slavery, what did the rulers do? They feigned social change. They faked it and said, we're bringing in a new system whereby the people are the rulers. They control the, the authority, the authoritative body. And what's that called? That's called government. Let's bring government in as the new religion. It's the same as the old religion. It's the same as the old slavery system. The new world order is exactly identical to the old world order. We've just changed the names and we've put a nice euphemistic mask on the face. Just like they, the Satanists did with Nazism and Communism. It's all a sack of junk and crap that needs to be thoroughly and resoundingly ideologically philosophically and spiritually rejected. So government can never be moral. It is entirely based in coercion, duress, and violence. It is the idea of authority just vested in a few. We just went from one ruler to transferring the authority and the violence into a handful of people, an oligarchy, and call them government, euphemistically. It's the same system of slavery that has always existed among humanity. Nothing has changed because the mindset hasn't changed. And until the mindset hasn't changed, expect the same results that we've witnessed throughout human history. Mass death. Mass executions. Total depopulation. And a totally a total iron fist coming down on human beings' face. That's what's coming.
There is perhaps no better modern example of the neo-fascist, neo-communist, and neo-feudalist model for the world of human slavery than the agenda of the World Economic Forum. Led by dark occultists and social engineers and transhumanists, I might add, Klaus Schwab and Yuval Noah Harari, who most people have probably never heard of. This room probably has heard of these sick psychopathic Satanists, but the average person in the world probably does not know who these people are, okay? Led by dark occultists and social engineers Klaus Schwab and Yuval Noah Harari, the World Economic Forum's motto, this is a world think tank trying to bring in a complete totalitarian regime that they call the Great Reset. Their motto, before being removed from their website due to a preponderance of negative criticism when they put it on their website, was literally the neo-feudal dystopian creed, quote, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. You see, folks, I don't wait for things to get taken down. I download them. I don't let them sit on a website and go, that'll be here next week. That's the image from the World Economic Forum's website. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. You'll be a happy slave who's not allowed to own any property that doesn't even own themselves or their own mind. You'll love it. You'll love your bondage. You'll love your chains. This is how sick these Satanists are. Since self-ownership and property rights are the inherent foundation of natural law, the moral law of the universe. If the right to own property is removed from human beings, all rights are removed from human beings as well. All rights are property rights. Our right to life is our property. My life is my property. Your life is your property. Freedom is a property right. Free will is, is property. My things are my property. There's a reason this computer belongs to me. My stuff is on it. I'm taking care of it. I acquire it lawfully without harming others. Okay? There's entire aspects and characteristics of what constitutes property and ownership. And I've gone through them extensively in my podcast and in the Natural Law Seminar, which I'm going to talk about momentarily. But the concept here is these people want no property. That's the basis of both national and international socialism. All socialism advocates for the abolition of private property. If property is removed, all human rights are removed with it. That's not my opinion. That's not an ideological viewpoint. That's the objective reality in nature. I just happen to understand it, whereas most people don't. Defeating dark occult dialectic cults once and for all. These are dialectical cults pushing people with one wing into total extermination and with the other wing coming around from the other side and pushing them into the same extermination camp. It's just a dialectic and it leads to the same place. Don't fall for the dialectic. We have to change our mind. We have to rise above, educationally and morally rise above these ideologies. Here's the worst possible mindset that one can take in the modern world. And you hear this all the time by morons. It can't happen today. Let me, let me get the inflection right. It can't happen today. I think I got that right. I think that exactly sounds like these people, right? Not only can't it not happen today, it can happen today. And not only can it happen today, ladies and gentlemen, it is happening today. It is occurring right now while we sit here. The dark occult sorcerers have manipulated human consciousness into a dialectic by which they choose their death sentence. 
whether they choose it through the right arm or the left arm, is absolutely of no consequence or meaning. They are choosing self-extermination by continuing to even believe in the ideologies that lead to the formation of these cults. Collectivism, materialism, secularism, postmodernism, moral relativism, and on and on. We have to stamp these out in the mind and in the heart and in the soul. They, they can't be eradicated even through violent revolution. We need a transformation of consciousness to take place within. Or these sorcerers are going to rule over us forever. And it isn't really even going to be forever because they'll extinct us eventually. They're going to get a billion people in the next human reset. And that's my, there's my prognostication. That's my prediction for the world. In the next human reset that they implement, and they're going to implement it successfully, they're going to kill off a minimum of one billion souls. You mark my words. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, it has always been this way, and it's no different today. We are not different from the Nazis and the Soviets and the Communists and the Bolsheviks, etc. We are cut from the same moral cloth, or immoral cloth as the case should be. Most people today think in an overly optimistic and quite unrealistic fashion when attempting to compare the modern moral state of human beings to those who conducted and took part in the human atrocities of the Nazi and communist regimes. The truth of the matter is far more sobering. The vast majority of people today are no different at all in their immoral state of consciousness when compared to the totalitarians of the past. We are raising children in that capacity. We are advocating for these immoral systems of behavior. We are not speaking out against evil when we see it blatantly occurring in our world. They are cut from the exact same immoral cloth, and there is an abundance of evidence supporting this very sad and very unfortunate conclusion, and I'm going to present some of that evidence. One of the first things people should really look at to show we're in no better of a moral situation than the Nazis were is the Milgram experiments. The Milgram experiments were a series of social psychology experiments on obedience to authority figures conducted by psychologist Stanley Milgram. They measured the willingness of participants in this psychological study to obey an authority figure who instructed them to perform acts conflicting with their personal conscience. Participants were led to believe that they were assisting in an unrelated experiment in which they had to administer electric shocks to an unseen learner that was behind a curtain or a wall divide. These fake electric shocks gradually increased to levels that would have been fatal had they been administered for real. The experiment found that a very high proportion of subjects would fully obey their given orders with every single participant in the study going up to 300 volts of electricity, which could permanently damage a human being's central nervous system, but not completely kill them. And at least 65%, again, very close to the numbers that I've measured in social experiments regarding moral relativism, about two-thirds, even slightly over two-thirds. In this instance, 65% of participants went all the way up to the deadly shock of 450 volts, which would kill a human being if administered for real. The Milgram experiments began three months, only three months after the start of the trial of German Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann, who was very instrumental in the extermination campaign of the Jews. Milgram devised this psychological study to explain the psychology of genocide and to answer the question, were the accomplices of the Holocaust, quote, just following orders? 
or were they morally culpable for their actions? They were following their orders, and they were still morally culpable, is the truth of that, the answer to that question. The Milgram experiments were repeated many times all around the world since the original experiments back in, I believe it was the 1960s or 70s, probably the 60s. And right up to contemporary times, these experiments have been repeated with statistically identical results today. Nothing has changed. We're no more moral than the Nazis were. We're no more moral than the Soviets were. Humanity hasn't changed a bit. It hasn't graduated from its spiritual infancy. It hasn't understood what true morality is and not to support violence and coercion of governmental systems. We are still cut from the same tragically immoral cloth that the Nazis and communists ever were. Another experiment that proves this was the Stanford Prison Experiment, a psychological experiment conducted in August of 1971 by a research team at Stanford University led by the psychology professor Philip Zimbardo. The experiment was a two-week, or scheduled to be, a two-week simulation of a prison environment that examined the psychological dynamics of such an environment upon its participants' behavior. Participants in the psychological experiment were recruited from the local community to take part in a, quote, psychological study of prison life. Volunteers were then randomly assigned to act as either prisoners or prison guards. The volunteers selected to be guards were given uniforms specifically to de-individuate them and were instructed to do whatever was necessary to maintain control over the prisoners and to pre prevent them from escaping. Over just five days, the guards' abuse of the prisoners, both psychological and physical, became so brutal that the experiment had to be stopped prematurely and could not even be continued into two weeks. This showed that given quote unquote authority over others, most human beings are extremely quick to completely abuse that so-called power and turn brutally violent toward their subordinates. And this experiment has been repeated in different places and times throughout the world with again statistically identical results. The people who ultimately make every single system of slavery and every single totalitarian regime possible are order followers. And I don't care what industry, I don't care what institution we're talking about, the military, the police, medicine, government, education, you name it. If you're following orders, you're not following conscience. If you're following orders, you're not following conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are following orders, you can not be following conscience and doing what is right. Following orders means doing what you are told to do without first judging for yourself whether or not the action you are being ordered to carry out is morally right or wrong. If an individual is following orders, it is a complete impossibility. Let me just state this unequivocally again. If someone is following orders, it is a complete impossibility for that individual to be exercising conscience. Conscience is the knowledge of the difference between right and wrong behavior, and the exercise of conscience is willfully choosing right behavior over wrong behavior. If you are not actively engaged for yourself in that process, you cannot possibly be doing what is right. Following orders, by definition, means that you're just acting upon someone else's command and you're not doing that moral process within. If an individual is following orders, it is a complete impossibility for that individual to be exercising conscience. Since, by definition, exercising conscience means that one is willfully choosing for themselves right action over wrong action. Order followers skip that process. They don't perform that process of weighing the action and whether it is moral or not. 
They just go straight to the behavior, straight to following the, the order and conducting the action. That's the very definition of what it means to follow an order. The old tired line, I was just following orders, is never, ever a valid excuse or justification for immoral criminal behavior. And this lame attempt to abdicate personal responsibility by saying that you're just following orders should never be accepted by anyone as a valid excuse for immoral behavior, regardless of who is performing the behavior, whether it's police, military, government, educators, people in medicine, etc. I was just following orders is never a justification for immoral behavior and should never be accepted as a justification by anyone who considers themselves a truly moral and good human being. The painful yet unwavering truth of the matter is that the order follower, and this is unwaveringly true, and if you don't think so, you're wrong. And you need to think it through in a more logical and calm progression until you get the right answer. Because there is a right answer regarding this. There's a truth regarding this. It's not a matter of opinion or perspective or interpretation. The painful yet unwavering truth of the matter is that the order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver. Let me say that again. The order follower always bears more moral culpability, meaning moral blame of who actually conducted the action and brought the harm into reality and manifestation. The order followers who does that. So they bear more moral culpability than the order giver. That doesn't make the order giver <laughs> off the hook. That doesn't put them off the hook. They have moral culpability too. But without the order follower, the harm doesn't get conducted in the real world, you see. Without the order follower, the order giver is a ravening madman telling people at random, go out and do this for me, go out and do this immoral behavior for me. And what people should go is look at him and go, no, dude, you're nuts. We're not doing that. That's it. Very simple. Say no to evil. Say no to evil. That's the word of all power. That's the lost word of Freemasonry. No. The order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver because the order follower is the one who actually performs the immoral action. And in taking such immoral action, actually brings the resultant harm into physical manifestation in the world. Order following is the pathway to every form of evil and chaos in our world. It should never be seen as a virtue by anyone who considers themselves a moral human being. Obedience is not a virtue, ladies and gentlemen. Obedience is not a virtue. Order followers have ultimately been personally responsible and morally culpable for every form of slavery and every single totalitarian regime that has ever existed upon the face of the earth. That is a true statement, not a matter of opinion. If you don't like it, I couldn't give a damn. Get as offended as you like. This is the result of just following orders. And take a good, hard, cold look at it, because you're going to see it. You're going to see it manifest in this world in your lifetime if we don't rapidly, rapidly change the consciousness of a large portion of human beings on this planet. The only solution to human slavery is a spiritual solution. There is no other solution. We have to change our consciousness from within. To solve the problem of human slavery, which is the result of immoral actions and driven by immoral beliefs, such as Nazism and communism and many other immoral beliefs that we've talked about here today, the human species requires a complete revolution of conscience based upon 
principles. This is what we need a revival of. We need a, a revival of true principles in our lives. The word principle is derived from the Latin noun principia, which means first, chief, most important among things. Principles are the first and most important of all truths. Moral principles must first be learned, then taught to others, and ev eventually made common sense knowledge among the whole human population. And we are failing miserably at that job. Miserably failing at it. Because look at the result of the people and the ideologies all around us. We have blatant Nazism and blatant communism, especially socialism and communism, throughout the entire world. And that's because, as parents, people have not done their moral diligence and duty to raise properly their children in a moral capacity. They haven't raised them. Moral principles must first be learned, then taught to others, and eventually made common sense knowledge among the human population before any true positive change can ever be manifested in human society. Principles have to come first. We have to put those first things first in our lives. Become, here's the real answer here, folks, in one sentence. Become truly enlightened regarding objective morality and natural law first. Then teach those principles to other people publicly. That is the solution. As simple as it can be stated, that is the solution to human slavery. Natural law is the master key. It is the key that unlocks all the doors on all the gates of all the prisons in human life. Natural law is a set of universal, inherent, objective, non-man-made, eternal and immutable conditions which govern the consequences of the behaviors of beings with the capacity for understanding the difference between harmful and non-harmful behavior. In other words, beings with the capacity for holistic intelligence. This law in the universe governs our actions, of the actions that we choose to conduct in the world. We make our decisions based on information that we input into our minds, then we act in the world, our behavior is either moral or immoral, and we receive the consequences through the process of natural law. This is how all laws of attraction of our reality function. The understanding of natural law is centered upon bringing human conscience into alignment with objective morality. So, in other words, we have to bring our knowledge of what is truly right and what is truly wrong into true alignment with natural law, the governing dynamics of morality. Conscience is the definitive knowledge of which behaviors are right because they do not initiate harm to other sentient beings and which behaviors are wrongs because they do initiate harm to other sentient beings. The fundamental nature of the human condition of slavery is that most human beings do not have a full and accurate understanding of objective morality the definitive difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. They don't have that knowledge. See, it sounds strange to even word it in, in just simplistic terms. The reason we're enslaved is because most human beings don't truly know the difference between right and wrong. That's why we're enslaved. We are enslaved as a species because the majority of people on this planet simply don't have the knowledge of which behaviors are rights and which behaviors are wrongs. And a species like that should not only be ashamed of themselves, they deserve everything that's coming toward them. Every single thing is richly deserved. Let me tell you something, folks. The universe is not broken. The universe does not operate upon chaos. It operates upon law. The universe is working perfectly. It's human beings that are fucked up. Make no mistake about it.
This ignorance of natural law then leads human beings to erroneously believe that human be behaviors that are based upon the belief in authority are somehow morally legitimate and, and acceptable when they are absolutely not morally legitimate at all. As a result, many, many behaviors which most human beings conduct and condone are completely out of alignment with natural law, which leads to the continuation and furtherance of human slavery. This dynamic is expressed in the natural law of freedom, which states aggregate morality and aggregate freedom are directly proportional to each other. And I'm going to actually write a scientific paper that I'm going to actually try to have peer reviewed in a scientific journal about the law of freedom. It might be one of my next major projects. This is the law of freedom under natural law. Freedom is governed by a law in creation. The aggregate or collective freedom of human beings is directly proportional to the aggregate morality of their behavior. As morality of a group of people increases, that body of people's freedom increases. As their morality declines and they progressively conduct and condone more and more immoral behavior, they become more and more enslaved. This is a law in nature. It is a law that exists in the natural world, just like gravity, just like electricity, electromagnetism. It's no different than any other physical law. It just operates upon our behavior. And that's harder to see because it operates on our behavior over time in the aggregate sense of humanity as a species. It, see, this is the law of karma, folks. This is how spiritual karma over a whole species operates. Karma doesn't work the way it does in the cartoons. There's no such thing as instant karma. You don't steal from somebody's wallet, you walk outside and a safe drops on your head. It doesn't work like that. Sorry, but that's not how it works. Collective immorality builds up over time within the population, and then collective freedom is slowly degraded and eroded over time. It's, it happens almost imperceptibly. See, there's a very significant time dilation dynamic within natural law. That's what makes it an occult law. That's what makes it difficult to see with the eyes and just the, the, the average human mind. You have to have really large perspective of time to study human history and to study the aggregate states of humanity over long periods of time. You have to have systems level overview. That's why the occultists loved me and wanted me. I'm very good at those dynamics. I gauge them very accurately before I even crunch numbers. I could just see it in my mind, the proportion and how it works. And they want that. That's what they want. If I wanted to, I probably could. I have 154 IQ. I probably easily could have been an actuary and made millions of dollars. Okay? Actuaries are people who do that types of systems analytics for a living, mostly for Fortune 500 companies. They can see big patterns that are extant in society and societal trends. I probably could have done that because I have that type of an, an analysis capability of my mind. And that's why the occultists were grooming me. So anyway, at some point, I want to actually formalize this in a scientific way and actually uh, bring an equation into this dynamic. There, there is an actual mathematical equation of the law of freedom, and this is it. The sum of human aggregate freedom is directly proportional to the sum of moral behavior as it goes from zero to infinity. Very simple uh, you know, summation equation, very similar to uh, you know, the sum of the forces equals the sum of the masses uh, times the acceleration. You know, it's, it's just like a, a physics formula. So I'm going to attempt to formalize this at some point. For more information about natural law, I highly recommend that you go to my website, whatonearthishappening.com, if you're all, not already intimately familiar with it, and certainly watch my feature-length documentary called Mark Passio and the Science of Natural Law, and my uh, eight-and-a-half-hour seminar called Natural Law, the Real Law of Attraction and How to Apply It in Your Life. 
Uh, those can both be found for free on whatonearthishappening.com or purchased in a hard copy form. Enacting the solution, or in other words, doing the one great work of ending human slavery. The one great work of ending human slavery can only be accomplished once enough people learn the knowledge of objective morality and natural law, then teach it to others. A massive effort of moral education must be conducted by widely and freely communicating and publishing that critical knowledge via all forms of modern media for all human beings to learn. This occult knowledge is the birthright of every human being. And it is our moral obligation to see that that knowledge is disseminated widely and freely among the human population because that's the only way we're ever going to win this war for our freedom and our souls. And if we do that, we might, might still, even at this late hour, stand a fighting chance against these sorcerers of consciousness who willed their occult knowledge to create and maintain these cults of political power that are just masks on the same face of worldwide Satanism. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention today.